so I'll just uh, get us underway with a few housekeeping items. I think that might make sense to start with, and then we'll turn to committee introductions. And uh, then I'll turn it over to our co-chairs for any introductory remarks that they'd like to make as we're getting underway. So uh, just to, to get us started, again, a few housekeeping items. Uh, COSA is a standing committee of the National Academies. We're constituted to provide ongoing individual input to BOEM science and assessments program. In other words, the individual members of COSA provide input on their own behalf and not on behalf of the National Academy. Um, As a committee, they produce no written deliverables or I'm going to ask you this again to please mute yourself if you're not speaking. All right. Uh, as mentioned, COSA is primarily focused on providing input to BOEM's science and assessments program. So that's the perspective with which we will address the topic today. Uh, we will be recording the open session of our meeting. Um, Again, I ask folks to please stay muted unless they are called upon to speak. If need be, we will uh, try to mute you from our end if it seems like your um, audio is creating any disruptions or interruptions. But um, again, just as a courtesy, we ask that you um, please try to stay on top of it so that uh, we don't have to um, monitor that. As the moderator, uh, I will invite participation by audience members if and as the time allows, uh, but primarily I will be uh, providing some priority to COSA members, invited guests, and BOEM staff, um, again, calling on other members of the audience um, if and as time allows. Recognizing that this has been a topic of interest uh, you know, we, we want to emphasize the importance of civility and constructive discourse. In order to call on individuals uh, to partake in the conversation, I will be using the raised hand feature. So I think most folks uh, at this day and age are familiar with Zoom enough to know where this is, but if you're not, uh, if your screen is maximized, you should have at the bottom a reactions tab. You can find the raised hand feature there. If your screen is not maximized, you may have uh, three dots with the word more underneath. Uh, if you click on that, you should see a list that includes reactions and you'll find the raise hand feature there. That's how I'll know to call on folks. Again, I will be calling, uh, giving some priority to COSA members, invited guests, and uh, the BOEM staff members, but uh, I will also uh, engage other mo members of our audience if it is time allowed. We do have scheduled breaks, uh, but if you need to take a break at any time, please feel free to do so. We just ask that you turn your camera off and keep yourselves muted so as to not create any uh, distractions. I think those are my housekeeping items. So we'll turn now to our committee introductions. Uh, and I will start with our co-chairs, Scott Cameron and Rod Mather. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Scott Cameron. I'm a geologist. I live on the northwest coast of Washington State. I spent the first 32 years of my career working for Shell Oil, mainly in offshore uh, oil and gas projects, and the last 10 as a consultant. I've been a member of COSA uh, uh, going on now six years. Good day, everybody. My name is Rod Mather. I'm a historian and an archaeologist. I uh, work at the University of Rhode Island, and I co-direct a, a graduate program that sits at the intersection of anthropology and archaeology and history. And um, I have been on COSA about the same length of time as Scott, I think. And before that, I was also part of the FACA Advisory Committee for FABOA, and I'm very much looking forward to today. Thank you. We'll turn next to Jack Barth. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jack Barth. I'm a professor of oceanography at Oregon State University. I'm a coastal physical oceanographer. I've been involved with lots of ocean observing efforts, both on the east and west coasts. And at Oregon State, I direct a program that uh, unites everything marine, natural sciences, social arts and humanities called the Marine Studies Initiative. 
Thank you, Jack. I don't see Rona on the line. Um, is Jeremy Firestone on with us? Don't see him either. Okay, we'll keep moving to uh, Dr. James Flynn. Hi, my name is James Flynn. I'm a uh, atmospheric scientist with the University of Houston. I've been doing atmospheric uh, research for about 25 years now, and I'm a new member on this committee. Katrine? Hi, I'm Katrine Eichen. I'm a professor of marine biology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And um, my main research takes place in the Arctic, but also the Gulf of Alaska. And I've been on COSA for, I think, all of a week. Thank you. And I'm skipping a few folks that I don't see on the line, um, but we'll come back to them if they do join. Uh, Susan? Hi, I'm Susan Parks. I'm a professor of biology at Syracuse University. My research focuses on marine mammal biology and acoustic communication and the impacts of noise on marine mammals. Thank you, Susan. Carrie? Good morning, everyone. Carrie Pomeroy, a research social scientist with the Institute of Marine Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. My work focuses on the human dimensions of fisheries and broader coastal marine policy, including space use coordination in the ocean. Nice to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin? Hello, everyone. I'm Kevin Stokesbury. I'm a, a professor at the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, the School for Marine Science and Technology. I'm a marine ecologist and fisheries oceanographer. Thank you. Lori? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Lori Suma. I am a geologist also. I spent the first 30 years of my career at ExxonMobil and uh, the last six years uh, adjunct at Rice University and UT Austin and uh, permanently make my home in northern New Hampshire now. And I am also a new member of COSA. Thank you, Laurie. Mary Louise. Hi, everyone. I'm Mary Louise Terimans. I am a professor at Yale University. I'm a physical oceanographer with a research focus in the Arctic Ocean. Excellent. Thank you. And if any of our other members join, we'll be sure to have them introduce themselves as well. Um, I just wanted, uh, oh, it sounds like Les Kaufman. Les, have you joined? Yeah, hi. Excellent. Go ahead and introduce yourself. We skipped over yet. Oh, Les Kaufman, uh, Department of Biology, Boston University, uh, COSA member for the last year. Thank you. And I'll just, um, for those that are on the line that are not uh, COSA members or BOEM staff, uh, I just wanted to uh, point out you've, you've heard a lot of very diverse expertise. I think this is reflective of COSA's broader objectives. Um, to be informative to COSA, excuse me, to BOEM science and assessments programs, um, and just reiterate the breadth of um, portfolios that BOEM um, manages. So uh, lots of broad expertise coming to the table. Today's meeting is, has a, more of a topical focus um, than many of ours. So um, I'm sure you'll hear some, some critical outside the box questions coming from this group. Uh, with that, I want to briefly turn it over to our co-chairs, Scott and Rod, um, for any introductory uh, thoughts or remarks that you may have as well, and then we'll get underway on the agenda. Rod, do you want to go first? Yes, happy to. Um, welcome, everybody. I want to um, uh, uh, thank you all for joining us. It's going to be a uh, an interesting day. Um, thank you to the COSA members, ones that have been here for a few years and the ones that have been here for a few hours. Um, we know that you volunteer your time and it's very much appreciated. I also want to thank um, the staff at the National Academies and also at BOEM for helping put in all this together and particularly for our out outside experts that are joining us today. Um, and we're we're very much uh, looking forward to your input. This is an opportunity for us to think about um, the important topics of uh, uh, of 
um, of marine uh, whale strandings and uh, the science and assessment that goes into thinking about uh, the, the, those issues. Um, COSA is, of course, constituted to think about and to help um, with science and assessment. So we'll be focusing on science and assessment. Um, and um, it's also perhaps an opportunity for us to think about um, uh, the way that the science program is working in action. Um, the way in which BOEM ha has been able to provide uh, the kind of science that is necessary for understanding these important issues and uh, think about what kind of science and assessment need to be conducted in the future. So I'm very much looking forward to, to today. And with that, I'll pass it over to Scott. So I think Rod captured captured both our, our thoughts brilliantly. Thank you so much, Rod. And uh, I just, I just, the only thing I would add is, in addition to the the excellent agenda we have for today, and and kudos to all the folks who put it together, um, we will get a visit uh, uh, for those who stick around uh, partway through the program from the uh, new director, and we're looking forward to hearing her comments. Uh, she's new on the job, so uh, just like a lot of our COSA members, and we're we're looking forward to greeting her. Uh, and and then tomorrow, for those who uh, choose to stick around for a second day. Uh, we, we we will be uh, widening our, our attention beyond uh, uh, just the wind energy projects to look more broadly at some of BOEM's programs. Uh, and one of the things we're going to talk about tomorrow is a recently completed study by the National Academy uh, on, on helping BOEM become a, a first-in-class uh, science and assessment organization in, 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 in the environmental field. And and I welcome uh, anybody who wants to sit in and hear, hear some of that in the open session tomorrow. So back to you, Stacey. Thank you. Um, I will just note that as we get underway, we will be asking our speakers to please introduce yourselves before um, providing your presentations. Um, we have a tremendous number of folks on the line um, and unfortunately we can't do introductions for everybody, but certainly um, as we march through this agenda, I wanna make sure that our speakers um, do take the opportunity to introduce themselves uh, before their presentation. So our first um, presentations are, are scheduled to start um, and to focus on the offshore wind site characterization activities and analyze impacts from agency reviews. Uh, that will be brought to us by uh, Brian Hooker and Erica Satterman. And I'm going to, again, um, turn it over to them and ask them to each introduce themselves uh, prior to their presentation. So I think Brian's on the line. Um, and Brian, I believe you should be able um, to share your screen. So I don't know if you have any uh, presentations you'd like to pull up, but you're welcome to do so at this time. Otherwise, I will... Um, oh, I see Erica is actually sharing her screen. Erica, will you be going first? Uh, she's she's going to drive. Uh, she, she has more. Oh, uh, but uh, I, I, I think my slides are, will be the first so I can um, introduce myself first. Actually, we could probably introduce both of us as we start on this on this title slide. Um, I don't know if that's better. But um, so my name is is Brian Hooker. Um, I am the biology team lead. Uh, within uh, BOEM's Office of Renewable Energy Programs. So our office is the one responsible for um, um, reviewing, uh, well, issuing leases, uh, conducting assessments of activities that may occur on those leaseholds, and, um, and, and ultimately uh, approving construction and operations plans with, with terms and conditions of, of approval. Um, Erica, did you want to introduce yourself now, or do you want to wait until your your slides begin? Oh wait, you go ahead. All right, we'll go. We'll we'll jump into the the next slide then, uh, Erica. And um, <clears throat> it sounds like there are a lot of uh, newer members of of COSA, so maybe this isn't uh, repetitive. Um, but this is the rainbow diagram that um, I'm sure some of you at least are are perhaps very familiar with. Um, for today's purposes, I think we're going to focus uh, perhaps more on the left-hand side of this uh, of this slide, because I think a lot of uh, there's a lot of concerns around pre-construction, so activities that occur prior to BOEM actually receiving 
uh, construction and operations plan, which is um, in the orange and red to the, to the right of the diagram. So as a reminder, um, the first step in, in any of BOEM's activities is what we term the planning and analysis phase. So that's when we have our, you know, our task force, interstate ta governmental uh, task force meetings, identifying uh, you know, potential wind energy areas, and then ultimately um, determining you know, what areas within those wind energy areas we might actually uh, lease. And again, the lease is just the opportunity to submit plans. So it's, it, it grants the lessee the right to submit a plan such as a site assessment plan uh, for the installation of, of a MET tower or a meteorological buoy, which is the more common way to assess uh, the wind resource. And then ultimately at the near the end of the process, the ability to submit a construction and operations plan. That's what the exclusive right of that lease does. But prior to us uh, issuing a lease, BOEM looks at through our environmental assessment process um, what the um, reasonably foreseeable outcomes of issuing a lease might be. Uh, that includes uh, uh, pre-construction site characterization activities. So these are the surveys that are done to determine where they might deploy a meteorological buoy and ultimately where they might um, you know, site a cable, where they might um, want to site uh, you know, um, infrastructure on the leasehold, so the, the turbine foundation locations. So Eric, if you hit the next um, uh, click, yeah. So that's what I'm highlighting there is you know, where our first uh, em environmental assessment, our first Endangered Species Act consultation occurs at this very early stage uh, prior to lease issuance. Um, and this is where also uh, through this consultation and through this NEPA assessment is where we apply and uh, the terms and conditions of the lease. So every lease has a, a section, um, it's a addendum C oftentimes, that lists all the um, measures necessary uh, for the protection of, of, of the environment. So there's a lot of measures in there for uh, you know, avoiding impacts to marine mammals and other endangered species from activities that may occur prior to BOEM receiving a plan. And the reason that this is like this is that BOEM does not have a permit authority under the Energy Policy Act of 2005. So the, the way that BOEM um, regulates um, how activities may occur for activities that are not part of a, uh, again, a site assessment plan or a construction operations plan is through those terms and conditions of lease uh, identified in the lease. And again, those are developed through these consultations that we do prior to lease issuance. So then we move on um, from that phase and we actually then you know, award a lease. The lessee may begin at that point to uh, do some surveys to support a uh, site assessment plan. This may be uh, what we call reconnaissance level surveys. So surveys that they're going out, uh, they're just trying to get a sense of, uh, you know, what's out there. They may identify an area where they might want to deploy a buoy or a meteorological tower if, if they want to propose a meteorological tower. And then that data then supports the eventual submission of a site assessment plan. A site assessment plan isn't even necessarily required. It's just the ability to, to go gather that wind speed data that oftentimes is necessary to get financing for a project. So uh, click again, or, uh, uh, Erica. And I wanna highlight here, here's where we actually get into the, uh, much later in the, in the process, we get a construction and operations plan. And at that point, we consult again on all the activities that may be part of the project development. So in this case, there may be, um, you know, uh, site characterization surveys that are done after uh, the construction begins, you know, to show like where the facilities um, um, have been actually laid. So post-construction surveying to look at, you know, where the cables uh, are aligned, make sure that all the cables reached uh, the appropriate burial depth, uh, investigating, uh, you know, scour, found, uh, 
scour protection measures around foundations or cable protection measures uh, along the cable. So we do assess again at the construction operations plan, uh, other survey activities that may occur basically for the life of the project. So I just really wanted to highlight those, those two areas in our review process. Okay, next slide, please. Thanks, Erica. Um, so again, what I really wanted to stress is that, you know, pr again, prior to lease issuance, BOEM assesses the impacts and consults with the services on the reasonably foreseeable uh, activities that may result from lease issuance. Again, site characterization um, and site assessment activity. Uh, BOEM does not have permitting authority for site characterization activity, and thus we uh, look at those through conditions um, where these activities are addressed in the lease. The only permit that is issued for site characterization activities is from uh, the uh, from NIMS, from the uh, requirements under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So we do have we do look at uh, what lessees are proposing, um, and and ensure that they are meeting the uh, other statutory obligations such as the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So so if you actually were to go to you know, the NIMS webpage, they will have a list of all the permits uh, under um, either incidental harassment authorization or letters of authorization that they have issued under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. What BOEM <clears throat> does uh, do and requires as a part of a term and condition of, uh, of site, uh, a term and condition of the lease is that they submit a survey plan to us for our review. The purpose of BOEM's review of that survey plan is to ensure what they are proposing is within that programmatic environmental assessment and ESA consultation that we did at the time of lease issuance. So we, we receive a survey plan, we are reviewing it primarily from that perspective of, is there anything proposed here that wasn't covered in our consultation? And if it is, then, um, then, then there's no objection to the plan. It's simply a, a object or no object type of decision that's done um, at, at that point of review for that, that survey plan on, on, Boehm's, on Boehm's side. Um, <clears throat> and again, later on in the process, prior to approval of a construction operations plan, Boehm then assesses impacts again and consults with the services on the activities proposed in that plan. And again, that one is more specific because it's not, a, not programmatic at that stage. That's, um, you know, really the, 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 the details of what they plan to do uh, for that construction operations plan. Okay, next slide. So we often get questions on, well, what what has BOEM adequately assessed? And we've <laughs> we've been assessing uh, the impacts of of pre-construction activities uh, since the since the beginning of the program. So BOEM first assessed the impacts of offshore geophysical surveys uh, back in 2011. Um, so this was that's the date of NIMS concurrence, letter of concurrence on our assessment at that time. I believe that was in, in the mid-Atlantic. Then again, we initiated consultation. And because the way that we were leasing, we kind of we did this mid-Atlantic regional, and then we did a, a regional um, in the southern New England area. So we did, we consulted in 2011 on the mid-Atlantic, and then 2013 um, in the New England area. And then again in 2013, we had this initiative that we were, and that's the, the image to the right was uh, looking at all geophysical activities across all of BOEM's programs from the uh, sand and gravel, the marine minerals program to the oil and gas program, which there, at that time there was the consideration that there might be some oil and gas exploration, I think primarily in uh, the Southeast US. So again, we took all of BOEM's programs and assessed them in that programmatic um, EIS and uh, biological opinion that was issued in July of 2013. Then again, in you know, we, there were some uh, you know potential hangups with the the July uh, 2013 biological opinion. I think there was potentially some litigation and some other issues. So we were wanted again unify all of the uh, the Northeast um, assessments in, um, in in another consultation. So again, we updated that in September of 2017, and then finally the the current programmatic consultation that we have in place for uh, geophysical surveys that covers all of the, you know, the um, Northeast region from basically uh, Virginia to 
uh, to Massachusetts is in the, uh, in parts of Maine, excuse me, Gulf of Maine is included, is in the um, June 2021 um, uh, programmatic uh, letter of concurrence. And again, that was, uh, ended up being informal. Um, we did have uh, a lot of mitigation measures that we, um, that we have agreed upon since <laughs> beginning this process in 2011. Um, and that we felt comfortable and positive about that we could reach a uh, not likely to adversely affect um, in, in that June 2021 uh, version. And that is available on our website. And again, again, you know, through this experience through the years, all of our assessments have included, you know, vessel strike avoidance measures, uh, high resolution geophysical survey operational measures such as clearance and shutdown zones. And there's a link there that provides, uh, can bring you straight to, uh, you know, those assessment documents that we have done, uh, you know, throughout the, since, since 2011, uh, including the most current programmatic consultation that we have in place and that lessees are following. Okay, um, move on to the next slide then. So this slide is is really, I think, and we've, we've, we've as you might imagine, and as I think was mentioned in the uh, the outset, we've been getting a lot of questions about, well, how long, you know, when did Boehm's surveys start? Or when did the lessee's surveys start? And um, I, I uh, struggle with that question because surveys have been going on, you know, on the Atlantic, you know, for decades. Geophysical surveys have supported safe navigation, you know, both NOAA and the Navy conduct those. And you know, sand resource evaluations uh, that that Boehm or the Army Corps of Engineers have done to look at um, sand and gravel borrow sites along the East Coast. So there is really there's no before and after is what I struggle with in in some of these requests that we have. And matter of fact, the the image on the right I think was just you know to, just to show this is 1939 to 2011. Uh, again, showing just survey work that occurred prior to Boehm ever even issuing the first the first lease. Um, so this is 72 years of, of primarily, I think, federally sponsored surveys that's available on um, from from NOAA's website from NCEI track line of geophysical surveys. Because again, I, 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 I struggle with the question of well, when did when did the lessees first start? Well, there is no again, there there has always been at least some level of survey activity in the Northeast. Uh, for for decades, um, specifically, and, and so, but even if I were to go into, you know, well, how about just surveys that are supporting offshore wind? And again, state and federal agencies have funded surveys prior to lease issuance. And an example is, this is just an example, other states have done this as well, besides New Jersey, but New Jersey funded geophysical surveys in 2009 as part of their ocean wind power ecological baseline study. So they were looking at you know potential lease areas you know as through the state federal task force process and other processes that we had going on, even prior to lease issuance. So there again, just to highlight that there hasn't there's not this you know before before surveys occurred and after surveys occurred. Um, and again, for context here, uh, January 26, 2011 is when the uh, first lease was issued off of Delaware, and that was um, a non-competitive lease. And then again, um, in 2013, in September, the Rhode Island, Massachusetts leases were executed. And March 5th, or excuse me, March 1st, 2015, is when the New Jersey leases were executed. And so again, you know, as I mentioned in that continuum uh, time frame, anytime after lease issuance, you know, we, we may have had you know some um, you know beginnings of site characterization activity. Again, oftentimes reconnaissance level surveys um, at the beginning, looking at you know perhaps where the meteorological buoy was going to be put, so some general idea of what the lay of the, the, the ground was, and then um, leading up to you know much more detailed surveys when they you get closer to the submittal of a construction and operations plan, because you need those detailed surveys to support the submission of a construction and operations plan. So roughly, you know. Surveys to support uh, a SAP or those reconnaissance level surveys began around 2015 in the Northeast air, Northeast region and COP surveys began more around the 2018 uh, time, 
time frame. That's when some of the, the southern New England projects were first beginning to submit survey plans to support their construction and operation plan submittal. Um, and then more specifically, we get asked, you know, how, well, how many you know, permits you know, have been active in, in this past winter? And we had about seven active permits uh, or seven active um, survey plans um, over this over the 22-23 winter period uh, throughout all of the, the Northeast region. And I think that is it from uh, from my slides. Again, just to provide the context on our on our, our process and you know where we are to date. Uh, regarding survey activities to support um, offshore wind leasing activities. I don't know if we, we want to pause here for, for any questions before we go into Erica's slides or we want to wait till the end. Yeah, I'll look for hands for maybe one or two quick clarifying questions before we turn to Erica. I see Doug's got his hand up. Yeah, hey, Brian, thanks for that. Um, quick question is, is Erica going to go into what what all those sources were for all these surveys? Or just in general terms, what what uh, kind of surveys are we talking about? And geophysical can span a, a big range. So I'm just. I will be going into that as best I know, as best I can, Doug, I will. Yeah, super. OK, I figured as much. Thank you. Not a problem, but yeah, no, very good point. There, there's there's geotechnical surveys, which is you know includes like uh, comb penetrometer tests. Uh, there's uh, borings and the geophysical tests. Uh, the geophysical surveys include everything from multi beam side scan, uh, sub bottom profilers. But Erica will be going into all that equipment in more detail in, in hers uh, in her presentation. But that's the the range of uh, uh, types of equipment that are are used. I forgot magnetometers too, but I don't admit it anyways. Thanks, Brian. I see any other hands, but I'll give folks maybe just one more moment um, for any quick clarifying questions. Oh, Rod, go ahead. Hi, Brian. Thanks for that. If you've got data on intensity of surveys, have there been many more surveys in the past decade than there were in the previous two or three decades? No, I, 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 we have not. I mean, I, I can speak to that there's been more geophysical surveys to support offshore wind as we receive more and more construction and operations plans. Um, and thus, there's been surveys to support those. So there, there, there definitely has been an increase in geophysical surveys to support offshore wind since 2011. Um, but how that it is in the context of all the different types of surveys that are occurring on the OCS, um, I do not do not have that information. But in terms of federally uh, regulated activities, has the intensity of survey increased in federally regulated activities in the past decade, past twenty years? Uh, yeah, I, I, unfortunately, again, I can only speak to to offshore wind, um, you know, surveys. I, you know, I know that there have been other initiatives like uh, post Hurricane Sandy, for instance, you know, that was on a, the marine mineral side where there was a lot of surveys funded by, you know, I think different academic institutions to go look at uh, Santa Barbara sites during during that time. There's, there's lots of different initiatives that I know from the federal perspective that have occurred probably over the, the past uh, few decades. Um, but I can really only speak to the, uh, the Boehm's Renewable Energy Program, which Again, I will say that yeah, since 2011, there have been uh, an, an increased number of surveys to support construction operations plan, but I don't have that full context to give you in relation to you know, other federal agencies, whether it's NOAA, uh, the Department of Defense, or, or, or what have you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take Scott and then Les, and then we'll move on to Erica's presentation and take additional questions as time allows when she wraps up. So Scott? Brian, that was a very helpful overview. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just wondering in, in, where in the um, process of, uh, of, of uh, renewable en energy uh, permitting and assessment would uh, 
uh, assessment of seafloor hazards and, sur and geophysical surveys to assess seafloor hazards uh, uh, come into the into the uh, into your uh, program? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. Generally, that occurs, I think, as part of the um, surveys that are done uh, to support uh, the COP submission. So, um, although I, I think some of the methodologies uh, used in some of those early reconnaissance level surveys uh, can identify, um, you know, those hazards, that is a, a requirement in, in, in BOEM regulations that that information be acquired. Um, so, I, I, I believe, though, that we get more of that type of level of detail uh, in some of those later, you know, surveys to support a construction operations plan submittal uh, yeah. process. The, the reason I ask is that, of course, uh, early during the leasing phase, uh, if you identify potential hazards that could be potentially showstoppers for development offshore, it would be ideal to figure that out up front before Lots of money is paid for bonuses. Lots of uh, investment is made in in surveys and and you know power commitments are, are entered into. Uh, and and so I I just uh, I hope that comes onto your radar screen. I also recognize that there is a new um, act passed by Congress, the Disaster uh, Planning Resiliency Act, uh, that it might have some implications for for particularly for seafloor hazards in your program. And I. Uh, I hope that gets onto the radar screen. Thanks, Chris. Thank uh, well, I will point out that you know, a very good point. I remember, you know, from the very beginnings of the of the program, you know, there's a there's the option of like, well, should the federal government be funding the the surveys, right? You know, at you know early right. on, should that be right. a federal government obligation to to survey prior to leasing? And it was uh, determined that it was you know, something that we didn't want to the, all the taxpayers have to pay for that have the, right. the, the lessees, uh, you know, incur that cost as part of the developing the site. So again, it was just a, you know, there's just a decision that could be made. I think other agencies throughout the globe, you know, have different approaches to that, but that was, that's the approach that the U.S. has taken is to, you know, shift that responsibility onto the, onto the lessees. Thanks for that clarification. We'll take a quick question from Les, and then we'll move on to Eric's presentation. Uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. Um, I mean, Brian, sorry. <laughs> uh, Brian, I, I started playing around with the viewer, and one thing that's clear is that multi-beam uh, data are coarse. There's a grid, but it's coarse. And multi-beam followed by visual inspection is probably going to be needed for anchoring points on any floating wind installations because of the potential of hitting coral or emergent reefs, even in mud basins. Um, whose responsibility will that be? Will that be on industry? And will we have access to the data generally? That's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, we have done, um, in, in some cases we have done, you know, our own surveys. I know we've worked closely with um, you know, the National Ocean Service to, you know, on some of the deeper sites where there might be some deep water coral and stuff to do some um, reconnaissance level survey on where the, you know, there's a light, higher likelihood of, uh, of deep sea coral or, or, or um, other resources, sensitive bottom resources. So it's not that there's an, an absence of data, um, but we just, the federal government usually isn't doing that that high level, you know, very detailed, like like you're referring to the actual anchor location. It's just saying, okay, this area, if it were to be leased, would would need potentially a higher level of of survey. Boehm then does then um, both on the environmental side and on the engineering side look at that data um, to look at what may be impacted from you know putting a uh, an anchor or or some seafloor disturbing activity at that uh, particular particular site. And that is um, at a high level included in our NEPA assessments and consultations that we do uh, at that at the COP at, at the COP stage. Um, as far as uh, data release, that's a, a, a bigger question that uh, I, we should probably have a whole other topic on when uh, when data might be available, um, especially at a at a very high resolution uh, phase. We do have information in our regulations that, you know, for BOEM received data, we can release it. Um, I'm going to forget the exact number of years after a project has um, begun. 
Um, and, but there's also initiatives I know that to voluntarily have the lessees release that at, a, at an earlier um, stage. Uh, but anyway, those are on, kind of ongoing discussions um, that, that we, we can certainly have and probably bring in our engineering group to, to talk about that. Thank you, Brian and Scott. <laughs> okay. Well, hi everybody. Um, my name is Erica Statterman and I'm in Bohm Center for Marine Acoustics. So what I'm gonna be talking about more is the study of these high resolution geophysical sources, which are used in site characterization. So I'll be approaching this more from our science lens, from our, our CMA, we call it Center for Marine Acoustics. Um, so as many of us on the phone are aware, the issue of underwater noise on marine species has been an issue for Bohm for decades. And there has been quite a bit of research that Bohm has supported over the years. Uh, this topic initially was coming up over issues with um, Navy sonars and marine mammals, and then there was a lot of focus on potential impacts of seismic air guns. And over all this time, these high-resolution HRG sources were used across BOEMS programs. They've been, as Brian said, two other oceanographic mapping efforts, um, but for our oil and gas program and marine minerals, they've been used for quite some time. And they were generally not thought to be a concern, but to be sure, BOEM initiated several studies um, that we did sort of in tandem. So the first one that came out was this report um, we call the Crocker and Fred Antonio report, where they carefully measured sound levels of a number of these sources in a laboratory setting with really carefully calibrated instruments. Um, and that provided some really good information about the source characterization, source characteristics. Um, then they took that work to the field and those were the Heaney and Halverson reports. And then most recently, myself and some co-authors from Bohm and the USGS published a paper um, characterizing these HRG sources, putting it in context of whether we thought that they were likely to exceed the threshold for behavioral harassment in the MMPA. So this was the first time that we still really focused on the physics and the technical nature, but we put it in context of a biological receiver. And here's just a screenshot from our paper. I have the full citation at the end of my talk. So what are the actual sources that are used for site characterization for offshore wind? So Brian mentioned geotechnical, that's where they're actually sampling the sediment and pulling up cores and things like that. But then the geophysical sources that they're using for offshore wind are these HRG high resolution. They're generally described as being non-impulsive. And that's important because impulsive sounds typically are thought to be more damaging to auditory tissues. That's because of the rapid rise in pressure that you see with impulsive sound sources. So most HRG sources are non-impulsive. They're all considered to be intermittent with low duty cycles. That means that they're on for short periods of time with silence in between as you're listening for the return signal on your vessel. And they're directional and have lower source levels than seismic air guns, which are the sources used in the oil and gas program. So I went in preparation for today's talk, I went through some of the recent IHA applications that we've seen from these offshore wind lessees. And these are the type of sources that we are seeing, oops, in use. So two of the sources that are impulsive are boomers and sparkers, but then we're seeing chirp sub-bottom profilers, parametric sub-bottom profilers, and then quite a few systems operated above 180 kilohertz. And you'll see in my subsequent slides why this is important, but it's generally considered that above the hearing range of marine mammals, these sources would not be considered to be impactful. Um, I do wanna note with the multi-beam echo sounders, there are some multi-beams that operate at 12 kilohertz. Those would be within the hearing range of marine mammals, but we are not seeing those for offshore wind applications thus far. Those would be really reserved for deeper water. Um, so here on the shelf, we have not been seeing any 12 kilohertz multi-beams in the applications thus far, but sometimes they'll use really high frequency ones. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is actually show you all a video from that sort of summarizes the results of our paper at a, a high level. And then I'm gonna get into much more of the technical nitty gritty details of the paper in the subsequent slides. So hopefully this synopsis helps keep you all with me for the latter slides. So here we go. People use underwater sound as a tool for exploring the ocean, such as mapping geological features on and beneath the sea floor, measuring the number of fish, and finding appropriate places for the construction of wind turbines. The Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, or BOEM, analyzes these sounds to determine how and where they should be used in order to avoid harassment of marine species. Two U.S. laws, the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act, require specific protocols to avoid or minimize harassment of marine animals. Regulatory agencies provide guidance on acoustic limits. If the sound level is above the threshold when it reaches an animal, 
it may result in behavioral harassment of that individual. If an animal is exposed to a sound below the limit, it would not be considered harassed. We classify these sound sources as de minimis, meaning they have minimal impact on marine species. These thresholds are useful, but they only focus on how loud the sound is and do not include other important characteristics of the sound source. A recent study completed by BOEM and the USGS closely examined high-resolution geophysical sources that are typically used to map the seafloor. The study characterized and classified a suite of sound sources based on their potential to affect marine species. The first characteristic was the frequency, or pitch, of the sound. Some resources transmit sounds that are above the hearing range of most marine mammals and are considered de minimis simply because the animals cannot hear them. The second factor is the amplitude, or how loud the sound is when it reaches an animal. Normally, the amplitude is defined as the source level from the device generating the sound. But sounds lose energy with distance, so by the time they reach an animal, the received level could be below the threshold, meaning the source is not impactful. Also, it's unlikely that a marine mammal will encounter an area where sound levels are high or significantly disturbing. Even in areas with very high densities of marine mammals, calculations show that a single individual would rarely receive high sound levels. This indicates that some louder sounds may be considered de minimis under most conditions. The width of the sound beam is also an important consideration in determining the impact of sound sources. Omnidirectional sources radiate sound energy equally in all directions, but many high-resolution geophysical sources have sound beams that are more narrow and only ensonify a small part of the water column. Therefore, some acoustic sources can be considered de minimis because they only ensonify a small volume of water and thus are unlikely to be encountered by a marine mammal. Finally, it's important to consider the total duration of a sound source as it passes by an animal. Many high-resolution geophysical sources emit very short pulses of sounds. The number of pulses relative to the animal's position and the speed of survey vessels are used to determine the total duration of sound that an animal may encounter. Most animals will receive such a short total duration of sound that it can be considered de minimis especially compared to all of the various sources they hear in a typical day. By evaluating these characteristics of active acoustic sources, most high-resolution geophysical sources, such as those used for surveying areas for renewable energy or sand resources, can be considered de minimis and are unlikely to result in harm to marine mammals. The findings of this research help agencies to determine which sources require regulatory review and mitigation such as protected species observers to operate safely around marine species and which sources do not. This provides us with a more complete understanding so that BOEM can confidently deploy high-resolution geophysical systems in support of the agency's mission to manage development of energy and mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way. To learn more, visit BOEM.gov. Okay, so hopefully you're all with me and will be able to carry with me um, on the next subsequent slides. So like I said, in this uh, peer-reviewed paper that we published last year, we evaluated the following factors when considering the current behavioral harassment threshold for marine mammals, which is 160 dB relative to one micropascal. Um, I do want to note that that threshold is used for all marine mammal species, and that differs from the level A threshold, which we would be considering for auditory injury. That is a weighted threshold that um, considers energy accumulation versus this one, which is just a single exposure. So I'm going to go into each of these in the subsequent slides. Okay, so the first one here is transmission frequency. It's our simplest metric, but I'm going to walk you through this figure because we'll see it a few times here. So on the horizontal axis, we have the transmission frequency, and on the vertical, we have the source level. And you can think about this as how loud a sound is at the source. Um, each of the dots here represents a measurement taken from that Crocker and Fred Antonio report. And the reason that you have multiple dots per source type is because they played around with different settings. So they would test out different transmission frequencies or durations or power levels for these sources because a lot of the sources can be tuned based on the needs when you're out on the water. So they wanted to experiment with the range of settings that you could have. So each of the boxes here, I've just clustered them together based on the source type. So it's easier for viewing. 
Okay, so like I said previously, consistent with current practice, it's considered that sources that are transmitting above 180 kilohertz are not considered to be audible and thus not likely to affect marine mammals. And in those recent IHA applications, they actually haven't even analyzed sources above 180 kilohertz. So by this logic, we can put a line here at 180 kilohertz and sort of gray out everything above it in the de minimis category. So that would mean some of the multi-beam echo sounders, some of the split beam echo sounders, and some side scan sonars could be considered de minimis based on this factor alone. Okay, now what about how loud the sound is? So I'm gonna translate this into what we call the incidental take radius. So conventional practice assumes that animals are not going to approach within about 25 meters of a sound source. And that's usually because they're aware of the vessel and will avoid it, uh, or because there might be a marine mammal observer on board and they could shut down the source when an animal comes within a certain distance. So if you think about how loud could a sound be at the source in order to reach that 160 dB level at 25 meter distance, you can do a simple calculation of propagation loss and get to a source at 188 dB. So this is because sounds lose energy with distance. So just because of the distance alone, you're gonna lose that much energy. So this would mean we could draw a line here at the 188 dB mark and say that, okay, sources that are emitting sound below this level could be considered de minimis. But we actually wanted to ask a question of this. Is this 25 meter distance reasonable? And what does this actually mean when you're out on the water? What are the odds of even encountering an animal based on the densities of animals out there? So what we did is actually calculated an incidental take radius. So we combined the population densities of different marine mammal species with the probability of a single animal being insonified above 160 dB. And we calculated what we call the incidental take radius. So how did we actually do this? We did this using a Monte Carlo approach. So what you do is you start with a distribution of animals, a random distribution based on real world densities. So we took that, we did this in turn for each of the marine mammals found on the Atlantic seaboard. And you can do this simulation, you know, hundreds of thousands of times. So you're getting these random distributions over and over and over again. And you can ask the question, what are the odds that an animal will fall within a given radius of the source? So if you're playing with the size of the radius, you know, how many simulations would you have to do for animals to fall within that radius? And more specifically, we asked, for what size radius would you have a probability that a single animal is inside the circle in 1% of our simulations? And we chose this single animal at 1% because we felt it was a very conservative metric and we wanted to see how that would pan out if we were looking at the densities. So from there, when you get your, your radius, you can then convert that to an adjusted source level like we did with the previous 25 meter case. So what does this actually look like when we're thinking about uh, the densities of animals we see out there? So if you start on the right-hand side with densities of sperm whales, let's say this is a relatively rare species, you see the maximum densities they get are around six individuals per 100 square kilometers, and that's just north of Cape Hatteras. So then you can sort of plug that in over to this figure on the left, and this is showing individuals or density per 100 square kilometers. So, you know, five or six individuals that would land you somewhere around here. And if you go up along the vertical axis showing that take radius, you see you're actually off the chart. And that's because the density is just so low for this species. Um, I should point out that the red line here represents that 1% chance. So the 1% of the simulations, a single animal would be within that radius. So it's a little hard to conceptualize with a really rare species like sperm whale, but if you look at something a lot more common like the Atlantic spotted dolphin, you can see the color bar has changed here and the maximum density is 75 individuals here along the coast. So in that sense around here, if we're 75 individuals, you go up to that 1% line and you're about 80, 85 meter distance. So that would be an acceptable size of a radius. Okay, so you can see that the density of the animals really matters here, um, and you can get different results for each species depending on their density. So I'm going to show you similar data in a slightly different way in this next plot. So on the horizontal axis, we again have um, density of animals, but this time they're labeled. So your more rare species are on the left, and then the more common species on the right. The red line, again, represents 1% of the time one animal will come within that radius. And you could look at something like a North Atlantic right whale, and you can see that based on their real world densities, and this is, by the way, the maximum of any place on the OCS at any month of the year. So we use the maximum worst case across the board to get here. And you can see that you could have a radius 
bigger than 200 meters and still not even insonify a single animal 1% of the time. So like I said before, these radii can get sort of unreasonably large for the really rare species. So in order to be conservative, we capped it at 100 meters. So if you look at the 100 meter contour, you can see for, for many of these species, you're below that 1% chance. All right, so now going back to the previous plot, I just want to reiterate that it's a combination of source level, propagation loss, and real world animal densities that matters. The current practice of using 25 meters is very conservative based on realistic animal densities. By capping it at 100 meters, that corresponds to an adjusted source level of 200 dB. So we can then shade out here and we can see that some additional sources like the lower powered sparkers, boomers, and bubble guns, the toad subbottom profilers, which were de minimis prior to this, but again, and then also the um, communication and tracking devices that actually aren't pictured here, but those are some of the things used uh, for communication between instruments underwater. Okay, so this is our second factor, and you could see, yes, additional sources could be considered de minimis here. Now let's move on to factor three, so beam width. Um, this is important because not all of these sound sources are radiating sound equally. In fact, they're quite different. Sources like sparkers, which are omnidirectional, are going to be radiating sound in all directions and have a higher odds of insonifying an animal. But if you look at a narrow beam source, maybe a split beam echo sounder or a multi beam that produces sound in a really narrow fan, you can imagine just, just the odds of even encountering an animal, the odds that an animal swims right into that sound beam are much lower for the sources that are not omnidirectional. So just based on likelihood, just like in the previous factor, thinking about likelihood of insonification based on the source level and the radius, in this case, it's likelihood of insonification based on beam width. So we know then that animal densities will play a role. So again, we took a Monte Carlo approach with this. This time we simulated the animals in, we distributed them in three dimensions um, because depth was something we wanted to explore. And we varied this by each species that we um, looked at. And you can see that for a given source, your odds of insonification are going to increase with greater water depths. And that's because the diameter of that cone of sound is going to increase with depth. So closer to the source, you have a smaller odds of impact, whereas for deeper water, you have a larger volume insonified and thus a greater potential impact of insonifying a marine mammal. So depth is important, so is animal density, and so is beam width. So bringing that all together into one figure, we're looking at this type of figure again with animal density on the horizontal, beam width on the vertical, and then each of these colors represents a different depth and the different results from the simulations. The blue line here again represents the 1% chance that a single animal is insonified for all of the realizations that we did for this model. And you can see that for the rarer species, like we saw with sperm whales and right whales with less than 10 individuals per 100 square kilometers, you could actually have a pretty large beam width before you would have the odds of insonifying an animal 1% of the time. For maximum, we summed across all the species of marine mammals that are out there, the highest density months, the maximum you could possibly get is around 350 individuals per 100 square kilometers. And in that case, your beam width would be much smaller if you were in that kind of situation. You can also see that with shallower water, you could get away with a larger beam width, but as that water depth increases, you need to be more careful and, and focus on a narrower beam width to reduce potential impacts. So. Pulling it all together, I just want to reiterate that it's a combination of beam width, water depth, and real world animal densities that matter. You can have a large beam width in areas of low density and still not insonify an animal. But in order for that to not become unreasonably large, we again capped that at 35 degrees. And by that logic, anything under 35 degrees would, could be considered de minimis. So that would include the hull mounted sub bottom profilers the ADCPs and split beam echo sounders. Okay, so bear with me, we're, we're three out of five here. <laughs> the next one is um, total radiated power or sound power level. So what does this actually mean? So when we're thinking about the sources in the previous two slides, I was talking about really the odds of encountering an animal and the odds of insonification. But now we need to think about what would happen, what kind of energy would the animal receive if they were insonified, if they did encounter that source. And it's important to keep in mind a couple of characteristics about sources. It's not just about source level, it's about source level and directionality. 
So we're introducing a new metric here that we call sound power level, which incorporates both the source level and directionality of the source. And then you do that by taking the integral of the whole sound field. The reason we are looking at this is because it helps to address the question with a single metric. What is the difference between a loud source with a narrow beam versus a quiet source with a broad beam? So I'm gonna walk you through a couple of examples. So again, with our omnidirectional source radiating sound in all directions, if you look at the radiation pattern, so this is degrees on these two axes, you can see that it's radiating a source level of 205 dB in all directions. But then when you, you do the calculation, you take the integral and turn that into sound power level and it's different units here. So we're looking at Watts instead of, yeah, so it's a completely different unit and not directly translatable, but um, you're gonna see my point when I bring in the next sound source um, that it's a significantly lower number, okay? But then when you look at a directional source like this one with a seven degree cone, in this case, it has a higher source level. It's 227 dB, but that's really only directly under this main beam. So in the other parts of the sound field, there's actually very little sound, okay? So a higher source level, after doing the, the math to get you to sound power level, you end up with the same sound power level. So the point of this slide is to show you that two different sources um, that have different source levels end up with similar sound power levels. And these may seem like subtle nuances between the different sources, but they really are important when we think about how it could impact animals out on the water. So this is why I'm going into all the details of these, these pieces. So to re reiterate the point on total radiated power, by incorporating the source directivity with the source level, you get a more complete sense of the total radiated sound field. You can sort of think of this like the average over the whole sound field. So what did we do with these sources and thinking about whether they'd meet the de minimis criteria? Well, actually nothing with this factor. We didn't think that factor four alone was enough to render a source de minimis, but it was such an informative metric that we wanted to weave that into the next factor, factor five. And we do believe that in the future, potentially a new shift for regulatory practice could be to incorporate this metric because it is very informative for some of these directional sources. Okay. On to the last factor. Hopefully you're all still with me. Um, all right, the last one we call degree of exposure. So thinking about for how long or for how many pings an animal would be exposed to sounds over 160 dB. I think I said at the beginning that a lot of these sources can be tuned in certain ways. So you can play with the power level, you can play with the pulse length, the duty cycle, and these are all typically done based on your, the needs of your survey. So what kind of water depths you're working in, what kind of substrate you're trying to penetrate, all of these things matter, uh, but they can really affect the way that an animal would potentially be insonified and the likelihood of insonification. So we did another little modeling exercise here where we were looking at the number of pings received above this behavioral harassment threshold, looking at source characteristics, characteristics which I described previously, also vessel speed. So we were looking at typical speeds of these survey vessels and also the position of an animal relative to a source. So this is a little sort of schematic diagram showing a vessel moving a 10 kilometer swath across the ocean. Um, it has a source that's shown in red here. And we position an imaginary animal here, either 100 meters or 1,000 meters below that source. And in these assumptions, the animal is directly under that main sound beam. So again, sort of worst case scenario, it's not adjacent or off to the side, it's really hit it getting um, receiving the, the main strongest pings from that directional source. So we didn't have any particular rationale to think about how many pings would be acceptable, but we wanted to see whether there were any potential natural splits in the data when we were looking at these different sources and the number of pings an animal would receive. So this is what the plot, the results look like. Um, so on the horizontal, we have the number of pings above 160 dB. And on the vertical, we have that metric I introduced previously, the sound power level. So remember, it's incorporating both the directionality and the source level. There are two dots for each source. The open dots represent the um, received pings at 100 meters depth, and the closed ones are at 1,000 meters depth. And what you can see here is that there is actually a natural grouping of sources. Many of these lower power directional sources cluster off to the left here, whereas these higher power omnidirectional sources are up and, and sort of off the chart. So by this logic, we consider that these sources could be considered de minimis because you're, there are so few pings that an animal would receive. Typically it's less than hundred pings. I'm gonna show you what this looks like for a couple of specific sources on the next slide. So 
These are the type of results we got that we then brought into the previous plot. Um, so here we're looking at this 10 kilometer distance. So um, the animal sitting at position zero and in the, these three instances, it's at that 100 meter depth. So if a source was to travel directly over an animal, again, the animal's stationary with this assumption, uh, which probably isn't very realistic, but if they were to sit right underneath, for a multi-beam echo sounder, this is one of the ones that is operating at the audible frequency range. And these are very powerful sources in the direct beam, but keep in mind at 100 meters depth, the width of that beam is less than a meter. So the odds of insonification are low, but if the animal's insonified, it would encounter three pings above 160 dB. But then you think about the pulse length of these signals and the total amount of sound time that that sound would be on for is less than five hundredths of a second. So they're incredibly short signals. Um, so even if the animal did encounter the three pings, that's the total sound exposure it would receive. Then you contrast that to something like the hull mounted sub bottom profiler. Um, that's a uh, lower source level, but in this case, the pulse length is longer. So there would be 17 pings above 160 dB for a little bit higher sound exposure, 1.1 seconds. And then a three plate boomer would receive even more pings, but again, because of the extremely short duration of the pulses, it's again receiving about um, 0.05 seconds of total sound above 160 dB. So these factors really do matter, all of these subtle differences. And like I said, a lot of times the user can tweak things. So we do need to think about operational considerations um, and ways that we can minimize potential impact based on just what are the needs of the survey and what are the ways we can use these sources that will uh, lead to the le least impact to marine species. So just recapping the sources that we found to be de minimis based on this factor were the multi-beams, uh, split beam echo sounders, three plate boomers, side scan sonars, hull mounted sub bottom profilers, and several other instruments that are used for um, understanding the sea, the water column typically. Okay, so now I'm gonna just bring it all together and recap our five factors. <clears throat> so first one, factor one was the audible frequency, 180 kilohertz. Factor two, incidental take radius, that 200 dB threshold there. Factor three, beam width rendered the hull mounted sub bottom profilers to minimis. Factor four, we didn't use for any of the sources. And factor five, degree of exposure rendered some additional sources de minimis. So then where does that leave us? What is left? So if we look at everything that's not grayed out, we have the highest powered sparkers, the one and two plate boomers, and some of the bubble guns. And then of course, any sources that we weren't able to evaluate in the paper should still be considered under this framework. So we wouldn't, of course, automatically assume they'd be de minimis, they'd need to go through this analysis. Um, I do wanna mention a couple of points that we didn't even bring into consideration in this paper. So the first is, um, and for context today, the higher powered sources, these highest powered sparkers and bubble guns are not typically what we're seeing used, at least on the shelf with offshore wind. So I did look back at the um, recent IHA applications, like I mentioned before, and um, the highest powered sparkers that we're seeing out there are 600 to 800 joules. And that typically corresponds to a source level right around this 200 dB line. So it's really the 2000 joules and higher sparkers that are, that are up here at the top of this box. Um, so that's just some context to consider. The other thing that we didn't explicitly bring in were other biological factors like auditory recovery time, you know, what's happening to the animal's hearing systems in between those pulses or in between exposures, um, aversion or avoidance behavior on behalf of the animals, and also auditory integration time. So um, it's generally considered that if an animal receives a sound that's significantly shorter than its auditory integration time, that it would perceive the sound as having a lower source level. So we did not explicitly consider that here, but it could be woven in in, in future regulatory practice. We also did not explicitly consider mitigation when we were building out these factors and this framework, but I do wanna talk about mitigation just briefly on this next slide, because in the paper, we did propose a framework for tiering of sources. Um, so this was what we put into the paper. We have um, yet to hear back from our colleagues at National Marine Fisheries Service about how they would incorporate the results of this paper into future practice. Um, but what we proposed here, uh, I haven't mentioned it previously, the paper did include an assessment of air guns and those um, would could be split into tiers one and two based on the volume of the air gun. Those would require a full suite of mitigation um, and IHAs, of course. Um, 
Tier three are the ones that we were not able to deem de minimis. So those would be your higher powered sparkers and some of the boomers. Those would require marine mammal observers and shutdowns if animals come within a certain radius. But we believe that if those mitigations are applied, they would be unlikely to result in incidental take of marine mammals. And then for tier four, based on the results of the paper, we believe that these sources could be considered de minimis without even needing mitigation because they're so low impacts that we wouldn't require that. So these are uh, many of the sources that I showed you today and that are um, being used out there for offshore wind site characterization. So like I said, this was a framework proposed in the paper, um, but I do wanna reiterate that current mitigation used by BOEM in our marine um, renewables program requires mitigation for both of these tiers. So current practice does require mitigation for both, even though we believe based on the results of the paper that we probably do not need mitigation for the tier four sources. All right, so where does that leave us? Um, based on the science available and the information that we have at hand, we believe that we do have adequate information to assess the degree of impacts from these sound sources and that the current mitigations being used should be more than adequate. And what that means for us is we're really putting our areas of focus in other directions that are more potentially more impactful and have bigger um, bang for the buck, if you will. So I know that Jill is going to be getting into some of our future science efforts from the Center for Marine Acoustics and the right whale strategy. So I think I'll actually um, kind of skip over this, but I, I just want to highlight that we are really focusing on some of the, the more impactful sound sources like pile driving, and then some of the other species groups that are really not as well understood, like um, impacts to fishes and invertebrates. So there's a lot um, we could unpack even just in this final bullet point here, but I think I will stop there. Um, just wanted to show this slide with the full citation uh, to our paper, which was published in the Journal of Marine Science and Engineering and is open access. And then uh, this on the right is a screenshot from something we just completed. We have yet to put it up on the BOEM website, but I'm happy to share it upon request. Uh, we call this our sound source list, and really this is just a sort of encyclopedia level description of all of the sound sources that BOEM regulates and actually some additional ones as well, um, like vessel noise. And we put this out there because we wanted people to be able to have a place to go to really understand the sources. So it's definitely not as technical as the paper. It doesn't even mention marine mammals or any other species. It's purely just a physics and sort of operational description of the sources. So that is a really good resource if people want to learn some more. So that is my last slide and I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Erica. I'll take a moment and look for any additional hands for questions for Erica. Again, we will um, prioritize questions from the committee and our invited guests, uh, and then we will uh, take additional questions from the audience if and as time allows. I see uh, Kevin Stokesbury, Michael Moore, and then Susan Parks. Hi, um, thanks very much. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I guess, uh, because I'm not as familiar with the, the, the DBs and stuff, you're you're talking about um erica you, you of course you're using the speed of, of sand and water right not in air yeah yeah for the and and for the sand range is is 180 you're saying that it it, it doesn't it can't hear above 180 or uh that would be the frequency 180 180 kilohertz so, so that's what, the, the pitch of the sound so that's the um you know the tune of the sound rather than the amplitude it's a different metric okay. So the so it's not the dB then because I, I thought a sperm whale's click was about two hundred dBs. Yeah, the the dB would be the amplitude, so how much energy the sound has. Um, that's different, a different metric than frequency. We typically, for a lot of sounds, we typically plot amplitude and frequency. And um, actually, a uh, way to think about that would be like, well, never mind. I was going to do the music analogy, but. Um, Never mind. It's essentially the amplitude is, is how loud the sound is versus the frequency, which is the pitch of the sound. So they're they are different metrics. Okay. So so the dB, the maximum dB you were saying was was what again? Could you just refresh? Well, it depends, it depends on the source, but we're we're finding that based on spherical spreading and the densities of animals, that allow a source could be as loud as 200 dB and be unlikely to result in incidental take. Really? So and, and 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 is there a difference between the dB in the air and the dB in the water uh, yes. for, for that measure? 
Yes, for sure. Yeah. All of those units are different. Well, frequency is not, but all of the amplitude metrics are different because it's different. Uh, it's all uh, compared to a reference pressure and the reference pressure in air and water are different. Right. So I don't off the top so, of my head have an analog for you. I'm sorry of how loud is a source at 200 dB in air. I don't have that off the top of my head. We could we could come up with that, though. OK, thank you. I'd thank you very much. <laughs> sure. Thank you. I'll turn next to, to Michael. Then we've got a, a number of other folks with their hands up. We'll do Susan, Les, Scott, Francine, and then Katrine. And I'll remind folks of this order as we go. But Michael, I'll turn it to you next. Thank you. My name is Michael Moore from Woodsall Oceanographic Institution. I am not an acoustician. I'm a dead whale biologist. However, my question of Erica is whether or not the, uh, she talked about the uh, potentially the longer distance for concern for an endangered species like a right whale. And my premise is that as the rarity of the species increases, one should value the individuals increasingly to the point where they're extremely endangered to infinity. And so ha has, and I haven't read your paper, but has the modeling really taken that issue into consideration? And as much as, uh, is that 1% encounter risk still valid for an animal where, where, where there's only 100 or 300 or whatever it is left to the animals? And so that's, that's really my question. Fair question. Uh, that gets really much more into the regulatory and policy realm. The paper was trying to not get too far into that. So I will say in the paper, no, we really just looked at odds of encountering an animal, um, not based on, well, if you did, you know, how detrimental to the, the population. That would be a, a subsequent paper that's focusing more on the conservation goals and the um, risk to the species. Yeah, it's so, been my sense. It's been my sense that the sort of encounter management, the dynamic management piece, which is what you're using for observers and so on, becomes increasingly irrelevant as the species becomes rarer and rarer, and the sort of provision of mitigation over a broader scale becomes more important. And so that's that's where I was going with that question. Yeah, no, that's fair, and I, I believe uh, Brian could correct me on this, but even as we we showed in the paper. For most of these sources, we probably don't even need mitigation, but for the ones that we are using mitigation, like for sparkers, they have a larger radius for right whales if they're detected than they do for um, other marine mammals. So in that sense, yes, that sort of sense of risk is um, taken into consideration. I'll just say in the paper, we didn't. We treated it all just as an encounter likelihood based on the densities. I hope that made sense. It does. I mean, for the, I think the principle of saying, OK, the value of an individual right whale is approaching infinity is very helpful in terms of thinking about these kind of questions in general. OK, thanks. Michael. I'll turn next to uh, Susan and then Les, Scott, Francine and Katrine. Great, thank you. And thank you, Erica, for going through a presentation, walking through the paper. Um, I did have a chance to read it before the meeting, and I, I just wanted to ask a couple of clarifying questions, um, really focused on the factor two that you used for sort of considering sources to be de minimis. Mm -hmm. um, so for clarification, when you were doing the species density modeling for the probability of exposure, were they randomly scattered or did it take into account the clustering of the behavior of the species, right? Like, for example, the dolphin species you mentioned travel in pods, so you would never find a single dolphin or right whales at high density are clustered in groups foraging in a small area. So did it take into account that clustering or was it just random spacing? I'm pretty sure it was random. It was our colleague, the lead author who did those Monte Carlo simulations. I'm pretty sure it was random, but what I know she did is always took the maximum density of any month at any place on the Atlantic OCS. <clears throat> so for example, when right whales are congregating up in, uh, in New England at their max density, that would have been the number we fed in to then do the random. So it's almost like you had that many right whales ac across any part of the OCS, which also isn't reasonable, but we wanted to always build in that conservatism. So it doesn't quite get at the animal behavior and how they're hanging out in groups, but um, at least it built in that, uh, hopefully a bit of a buffer there. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah, I mean, I think that is a bit of a problem that needs to be addressed, right? Because like if a right whale density is, is you know, 35 right whales per 100 square kilometers, but the, all those right mm -hmm. whales are actually within one kilometer, that's that doesn't make sense, right? Because you're actually diluting them. Um, yep, so I think that that point. needs to be taken into consideration a lot um, in that model. Um, and then the second part for factor two that I wanted to ask is you talked about using a 25 meter range for the spherical spreading, but then you were talking about directional sources, so spherical spreading doesn't make any sense. 
So I was concerned that the, the specific um, source that was considered de minimis is that a directional source or a spherical source that was below, you know, and when you're going below 200 BB? Yeah, the, um, well, the sparkers and are omnidirectional. So those right, are but they, but they, they were above the threshold. There was a one yeah, that some of them, out, um, the that one I, we grayed out, the toad Sumbata profilers, those are directional. Um, they're not like as narrow as some of the other ones, narrow beams, but um, I'm forgetting the beam width off the top of my head. If one of my co-authors is on, they could chime in. Um, but yeah, that's a fair point. I believe we did, we looked at spherical spreading for all of them. I cannot remember if we did a comparison with cylindrical spreading, um, though we certainly could, and that would probably affect the distance. I know that some recent measurements done by the USGS that haven't been published yet were showing that they were actually seeing spherical spreading for a lot of these sources, even in shallow water, which was a little bit surprising, um, but that isn't fully available yet. So um, yeah, that's a fair point. I'm okay. writing that yeah, I just too. wanted to make sure because spherical spreading wouldn't be appropriate for a directional source. So thanks for the clarification. Thanks, Susan. Les, and then Scott, and then Francine. And I think Katrine mentioned in the chat that her uh, questions have been answered from prior questions. So we'll um, go uh, Scott next. Did, did Les drop off? Oh, I'm sorry, Les is still there. He's still there, but when he put his hand down, he went away from me. So go ahead, Les, you're muted though. Les, you're muted. Les, we still cannot hear you. <laughs> yeah, I get a lot of that. Um, Erica, thanks so much for a really great uh, presentation. My, my questions really overlap with uh, Mike and Susan. And uh, I've been I've been concerned about the fact that when we model whales using reasonable assumptions about what they do, they seem to read what we've done and then do something else. And so I'm particularly right whales. So I'm a little concerned about the rate of update of observational data that would be needed to keep our models credible. In fact, it converges on just we need to look all the time. Uh, well, that actually feeds in really well to another objective that BOEM has in terms of monitoring over the next couple decades. Maybe that was a softball uh, that you knew <laughs> you were handing to me, but we are working on um, standing up a large scale regional monitoring program using passive acoustics, but also working with many other partners for other observation methods to have essentially a continuous observations out there of these species. Um, some of them will be transmitting data in real time. Some would be archival, but then hopefully processed in a systematic way that we can make them available more quickly than um, what's typically done. So I know that the team at Duke is working on how to build in real-time observations into their Duke density models, which are, I forgot to mention, that's what we used here. Um, so that is possible. We might be getting more regular frequency of updates of those models. Um, so we're working on that. We're working on building that out. And I think Jill will, will speak about some of those initiatives a little bit later. And did you have a question? That was more of a comment, right? Uh, well, no, What I have a question for you offline because I'd like to incorporate this into the EBM models, but we can Okay, help. sure. Thanks, Les, and, and way, to draw, way to draw the connection to some earlier COSA conversation. Uh, Scott and then Francine. Thanks, Erica, great job. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, you, I think you mentioned that uh, one of your closing slides that uh, uh, a lot of your your work was really focused on on getting better calibration and potential tiering thoughts for shallow water surveys. But as BOEM is moving more towards floating wind, I'm thinking about the West Coast and the Gulf of Maine, which uh, have big wind resources and will require floating wind. What do we need? What other work do we need to do in deeper waters? What other research needs to be done in deeper waters? And what is BOM doing about that? That's question one. And then, and then question two is, uh, if, if we were to take your recommendations about um, saying that certain, certain things that are currently require, certain surveys that are currently requiring uh, mitigations uh, in, under your tiers would not, what, do we have any historical uh, calibration data a look back to see uh, what part of that HRG program uh, would would no longer re require uh, uh, 
uh, mitigate, what would the impact be? Would it be like 50% less, 60% less? Those are my two questions, thanks. Um, okay, the first question, sorry, I'll go with the second question first. Um, I don't know if we, well, we probably could dig that up in terms of how much, you know, what percentage of the previous surveys would no longer have needed that. I can say that for sure our marine minerals program, they're using more of these least powerful directional sources, and they've typically been using mitigation as a precautionary measure, but they probably wouldn't need to moving forward. Um, if the renewables program continues to see these high, well, I said, in previously, they're not seeing high powered sparkers in the shallow water, so they probably don't need the mitigation for that. But with the more powerful sparkers that we may be seeing in deeper water, so getting into your second, your first question, or if they're starting to see other additional more powerful sources in deeper waters, then yes, they should have mitigation there. So I think what's the one of the takeaway messages from the paper is that the operational considerations matter a lot. It's not just you can't say one single source like, oh, a multi beam either is or isn't or oh, a sparker is or isn't. It's really about how is it being used? Which power settings is it set at? You know, what's the frequency? All of these things really are very important. Um, and another thing I forgot to mention in one of my closing remarks is that the current threshold for behavioral harassment at 160 dB, if that threshold were to change, if that came from NIMS, we could rerun the, the analysis in the paper. And yes, we would get different results and that would affect our mitigations. That's, that's how we should do it. Um, but the factors that we introduced in the paper, we think those would stand because those are really the, the analytical approach we use to classify the sources. So yes, thresholds could change, sources could change, new sources could, could emerge that we've never even considered before, and we could run them through this analysis and then get to the, the results. So um, I think that's sort of one of the takeaways is that we've built up this framework that hopefully people will find useful, even though I admit the paper is very technical and challenging to read. <laughs> so hopefully the video helped. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that got to your questions well enough, but um, for Gulf of Maine, just we have to see what sources are actually being proposed and, and see where they shake out, I think. Yeah. Um, and Eric, I did, I did just put it in the chat, you know, we have done, uh, you know, looked at you know, what potential sources might look like in deep water in the Pacific in advance of the Pacific leases. So I just put the, the, that um, biological assessment in there. So we did, we have done some canvassing of the types of material um, equipment that would be used in, in deep water and the, for the purposes of issuing those leases in, off of California. I'll give Francine the last question and then we'll wrap up before taking a break. Thanks, Stacey. And hi, everyone. My name is uh, Francine Kosha. I'm a senior scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, so I'm, I'm speaking on the panel later today. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, Erica, thank you so much for that detailed presentation. I, I found it incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I, I think you just partly answered my question, but I'll, I'll make the point anyway, which was about the behavioral harassment thresholds and um, just noting that, you know, best available science is indicating that marine mammals may be behaviorally responding and potentially being harassed at sound levels, you know, 120 dB, 130, 140. I was wondering if you had explored that at all in this analysis. Um, just to see if those tier three and tier categories changed at all. Um, it sounds like maybe you haven't, but it's set up to be able to do that if, if That's needed. That's exactly right. Yeah, we didn't explicitly consider those other levels in this. We built it all around the 160, but the way that we built it, it could be, that number could be changed and you could still run the analysis. So it is flexible in that sense. And I think we even had a remark like that in our um, conclusions paragraph was, if this were to change in the future, then there you have it. This is how we would suggest people take a hard look at the sources using this framework. Thank you each. So just um, looking at the agenda now, we are scheduled to take a 1230 to one o'clock Eastern break. Um, and I will adjourn us to do so momentarily, but I just wanted to make a, a, a few quick comments and reminders before we um, scatter. The first is when we return, we're going to be departing slightly from this topic. We will be hearing uh, from the new BOEM director, Liz Klein. Uh, this will be COSA's first opportunity to engage with uh, the new BOEM director, and we're very excited about having the opportunity to do so. We had the opportunity in the past um, to meet with the last director and found that um, very insightful in terms of understanding priorities and expectations. So uh, we're looking forward to doing that uh, at one o'clock from one to 1.30. And then we'll return 
uh, to this topic with some additional presentations from NOAA Fisheries and the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission, as well as um, additional presentations by BOEM. And then this afternoon at 3.15, we'll be having the panel discussion and additional questions as well. So we invite folks to stay on the line and to continue the conversation with us this afternoon. Uh, we will be returning back promptly at 1 o'clock for that discussion uh, with the director. And we, uh, again, invite folks to stay on. We will be using this same Zoom link. So if you do log off for lunch, please log back on using the same uh, call-in information that, that you use to join here. Uh, with that, I will thank you each. I'll ask folks to be sure uh, if they're not logging off, to turn off your camera and your audio while we are away. We will pause the recording and resume it once we get back. Thank you each. All right, welcome back. It's one o'clock and I just want us to um, be sensitive to the time. We have with us, uh, I see she's on the line, the new director of um, BOEM, Liz Klein. Um, and I don't want to waste any time. I know this committee is really eager uh, to converse with you um, and to understand your priorities and your current thinking. Um, so with that, um, I will turn it over to you to introduce yourself um, and provide any remarks that you'd like, and then we'll open it up for some discussion. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Stacey. Can everybody hear me? We can yes, hear you I hear, well, thank I you. I hear nods, great, uh, great. Um, so yes, I am uh, Liz Klein, the Director of Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Um, and uh, thank you so much for inviting me to join you today. It really is um, uh, great to be here, um, whether it's morning or afternoon, wherever you are, good morning, good afternoon. Um, and uh, thank you to all of you for your continued uh, contributions to making BOEM's programs stronger. Um, the expertise you provide is really invaluable and uh, uh, I'll just start off by saying we're grateful, so grateful for your service on this committee. Um, I am uh, especially happy to be joining you today. I looked at the calendar and noted that it's my official two month anniversary with BOEM. Uh, um, I could tell you how long it feels. No, it, it's been great. Every day has been great um, uh, in that two months. And so I'm just, it's a really exciting time at BOEM um, and we have a, a truly tremendous team. So I'm, I'm honored. Uh, to be uh, of service in this role right now. Um, while I am new to BOEM, uh, just by way of introduction, I am uh, not new to the Department of the Interior. Uh, I actually was uh, previously serving as senior counselor to Secretary Holland, um, starting at the beginning of the Biden administration. And I also served in the Obama and Clinton administrations uh, previously. So have um, combined a little over 10 years experience uh, at the Interior Department. So. Uh, I'm certainly familiar with it, but know that I uh, learn something new every day, which is part of what makes it exciting. Um, through my experiences uh, at Interior, I've uh, become keenly aware and have a great respect um, around the importance of science-informed decision-making. Um, I have been fortunate to work during administrations and for Interior secretaries that do really value the importance of data and science in informing everything we do. Uh, during the Obama administration, actually, when I was at the in the Deputy Secretary's office, um, we uh, put together a, a new and revised uh, scientific integrity policy, um, which was held up as a, a real example of the um, a, a valuable policy across the federal government. Um, uh, aimed at the core principles of supporting scientific expertise, maintaining high standards and facilitating transparency. So those are all values that continue to be shared deeply by this current administration. Um, so I'm, I'm very appreciative of the independent scientific advice that BOEM has received from COSA since it was established in 2015. Um, the advice on broader policy and the very important advice you provide each year for our study profiles is truly valued. Um, from the beginning, the President and Secretary Holland have been clear in their belief that we can turn the climate crisis we face into an opportunity for the country. Um, I've been reading uh, news reports today about um, the IPCC coming out with its uh, latest sort of synthesis report. I haven't seen it yet, actually, um, but, uh, but it is really, uh, you know, something that we take very seriously and we know that we can um, use this as an opportunity to 
um, certainly at BOEM, uh, take a leading role in transitioning, transitioning the US to a clean energy future, one that confronts climate change, creates good paying jobs, and ensures economic opportunities are accessible to all communities. Um, so a little bit about some of our, um, uh, you mentioned priorities here at BOEM, certainly uh, helping to build a thriving domestic offshore wind industry is a real key component of what we're doing right now and a, and a high priority. We've been working hard to help achieve the administration's goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030 and 15 gigawatts of floating wind capacity by 2035. Um, in just two short years here, we've approved the nation's first two major offshore wind projects on the OCS, that's Vineyard Wind and South Fork. So we're uh, excited about those and, and hopeful for continued progress there. We've initiated the environmental review of 10 additional projects and issued draft reviews for seven of those. Um, and we know that there are more to come. So feeling um, well on our way to meeting the 30 gigawatt goal by 2030. We held uh, three lease sales last year. Um, and I, I would just say lease sales, you know, are, are certainly a, a, a nod to uh, the industry and to the investment community about the strength of this industry in the U.S. So we held three last year at the New York Bite, which was the highest yielding energy sale in history, Carolina Long Bay, and the first ever sale off the West Coast of California. Um, and so we are, uh, you know, there was also issued in 2021, a leasing strategy from Secretary Holland uh, that in addition to those sales uh, identified four more that we're working on in the Gulf of Mexico, Central Atlantic, Oregon, and the Gulf of Maine. Um, all of that work uh, does not come easily. We know that, you know, of the importance of trying to minimize uh, conflicts with existing ocean users, try to minimize environmental impacts. And, uh, and I would just say to all of that, again, just how important uh, the advice and counsel we get from COSA is uh, to all of that work. Um, now, of course, at BOEM, uh, as uh, the agency with primary jurisdiction out over the Outer Continental Shelf, we also continue to oversee conventional energy development on the OCS. And when we do that, we wanna make sure we're doing it in a way that is as protective of the environment as possible and ensures a fair return to the taxpayer. So the Inflation Reduction Act, um, which an important piece of legislation uh, that we are very excited about here in the administration, um, did direct us to hold uh, a couple of oil and gas lease sales this year, including the next one in the Gulf of Mexico on March 29th. Uh, and in issuing the final sale notice for that sale, we uh, included a number of economic terms designed to encourage diligent development and ensure fair tax, fair market value to taxpayers. Um, we also included a number of lease sale terms to mitigate potential adverse effects on protected species and avoid potential conflicts with other ocean users. Uh, another exciting piece of legislation that's occurred during this administration is, of course, the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, and in that law, uh, BOEM and our sister agency, the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, were directed to develop a regulatory approach for sequestering carbon on the OCS. So that is another effort that we are undertaking currently. Um, developing a new regulatory program for an activity like carbon storage is no small matter. Um, so we expect um, you know, a, a quite robust uh, rulemaking to come this year. Um, we're hopeful that we can have a draft rule out on the street in uh, early fall. Um, so our, our bureaus are working uh, very hard on that. And we also are doing that um, with an eye toward creating a program to oversee this activity uh, on the OCS and, and doing that in a way that makes sure that we're uh, maximizing safety and have uh, environmental protection top of mind. Um, and so, you know, all of this uh, really, uh, we, we, we don't do it alone. Um, we, have to, uh, we have to engage with our government partners, tribal nations, industry, stakeholders throughout all of these processes to avoid imp impacts to ocean users and the marine environment as much as possible. Um, uh, I don't see everybody's faces on the screen, but Bill Brown happens to be right below me. So certainly our robust environmental program is essential to ensuring that we have the best available science and 
indigenous knowledge to inform our decisions. And so we, um, again, I will just say uh, the team at BOM is tremendous um, and working hard every day on all of these issues. Our partnership with COSA um, is, is such a valuable piece of all of that. Um, again, your role as BOEM's independent scientific advisory body really provides us with an important independent and objective scientific perspective. Um, we, again, I'm just so appreciative for your expertise and your contributions for, um, you know, undertaking this work and providing, um, you know, really a, a public service for us. And so uh, thank you so much for all that you do. Um, and I am happy to answer questions or hear your questions and feedback. And if I can't answer them, uh, either volunteer Bill Brown to answer them or uh, take them back and, uh, and do some follow-up. So happy to open it up to questions. Thank you so much, Director. And I'll be looking for the raised hands um, for any initial questions to get the discussion underway. Go ahead, Scott. Director Klein, uh, thank you so much for coming to talk with us today. We greatly, greatly appreciate uh, the time you're taking with us and, and also that uh, overview about the program and some updates was, was extremely helpful. Um, you know, COSA really is a, a very diverse uh, group of, of, of science scientists who, and, and, and I encourage you to take full advantage of the uh, the, the talents and experience of this of this group, we, we represent a lot of different uh, different fields of study. Uh, you have a, a huge challenge uh, at BOEM. You uh, not only we've we've focused a lot of our attention recently, of course, on the wind program and trying to help move that along. Uh, that's of course the fo focus for today's activities. Uh, but you also have uh, ongoing programs in oil and gas and marine minerals. And as you mentioned, you're, you're looking to expand into the new area of offshore carbon storage and uh, carbon sequestration storage and possibly something else in critical minerals. Uh, COSA has uh, expertise that can help you in all those areas. I hope you'll take advantage of us. Um, that's, that's what we're here to do. We're here to help. Um, and, and we're also, I think, here to help and the National Academies are uh, in in uh, some some other areas that are on the radar screen for you, I, I know you've uh, ha have some aggressive goals relative to uh, wind uh, energy. That has to include floating wind, as you mentioned. Uh, two of the four areas that you've talked about for le lease sales are, are going to require floating wind. That's pushing into into water depths beyond where it's uh, currently being deployed globally. So that's the, the academies as a whole might be a resource to help us there. Also, some of these areas you're looking at uh, lie within uh, uh, areas identified as major hazard areas by FEMA. I'm thinking about Northern California and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and, and we're here to help you as you have to deal with things like the new Disaster uh, Planning Resilience Act, which will be coming down the pike towards you. So uh, again, we really appreciate uh, your time with us and, and I hope, uh, uh, Sincerely, you'll take take up our offer to help you in whatever way we can. Yes, well, thank you so much for that. I will say um, uh, uh, we do indeed have a lot of challenges before us um, and we know that we can't do it alone. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, none of this is, is going to come easily, um, but it really does speak to the importance of uh, uh, having science uh, being one of our guiding guiding lights as we move forward, um, and we, you know, certainly welcome the opportunities to have others um, uh, weigh in with us and provide their expertise on on the paths that we're outlining. So, thank you very much for that. Thank you, Scott. I'm looking now to see if there's any additional hands for questions for Director Klein. If not, I'll just take a moment um, to sort of reiterate some of the points that Scott has made in terms of the diversity of our committee. I'll, I'll add to that um, just by saying that we've recently implemented annual committee membership rotations um, and, you know, with the hope of being responsive to your needs. Uh, so now the way that the committee operates, um, each year we will be rotating uh, some fraction of our membership off 
and um, adding uh, additional members on. Each membership uh, cohort will serve for a three-year term, and then um, with the possibility that some of those folks may be asked to serve on, you know, on for a second term as well. They can serve up to two terms uh, on committee on the National Academy Standing Committees. Uh, I'll also just point out that uh, tomorrow we will be having a discussion on additional National Academies projects that are getting underway. Um, but certainly we have a longstanding relationship with BOEM and um, both with the COSA Standing Committee as well as ad hoc projects as well. So um, we'll be hearing about another standing committee as well as a consensus study uh, that's getting underway looking at the hydrodynamic impacts of wind turbines. So, um, you know, just really appreciate uh, you all looking to the National Academies uh, to help you address some of these issues. And, and certainly COSA has served as um, sort of a catalyst for some of those projects. And we look forward to being um, helping think through any additional. I see that Doug has raised his hand. I'll give him an opportunity to ask a question as well. Doug is one of our invited guests for today's discussion. Go ahead, Doug. Yeah, thanks very much, Stacey. Thank you, uh, Director Klein. I just just a quick um, quick question and comment. But first, um, I'll just take this opportunity to to commend you and and Bill and and the whole. Uh, crew, I see Rodney and Jill and others. That that Bohm is is really uh, ready to and has tackled some of these very difficult issues and does so in a very um, a very deliberate and uh, very measured way, which is really um, really good in the environment we're in, and we need that information. As you said, the the science part of it is is really important, but. But Bohm's mixture of social scientists and physical scientists, and natural scientists, and so on, um, is really uh, a, a very strong way to move forward on all this. So thank you for that, and and that, and and that, and that agency. My question is um, really about the um, uh, the leasing, and maybe it's too technical for this, but. Um, What's embedded in those lease agreements uh, in terms of two things? One is the ongoing uh, environmental monitor monitoring, and then the other one is uh, their, how should we say, robustness to changes in, um, in, in administrations. Right. So uh, without knowing, I will provide a clarifying point for folks that we have uh, in our process, um, uh, we have a we have a fairly robust process through what are what we refer to as intergovernmental renewable energy task forces to help identify wind energy areas that are then um, set up for leasing, and those leases allow the leaseholders to do um, essentially give them the right to go forward and put together a construction and operation plan. So it doesn't give them a right to build anything or um, it's not it's not actually the right. instrument that's for the construction and operation of the wind farm itself. Right. The right. leases um, have, uh, you know, we have been innovative, uh, Boehm has, I can't take credit, only having been here two months, but boehm has been really innovative in uh, its auction processes uh, in the past couple of years to develop things like bidding credits um, for entities that come forward with, uh, for instance, commitments to domestic supply chain efforts, uh, uh, union jobs. Um, we recently in the uh, California lease sale incorporated um, uh, offered bidding credits for um, those entities that put together uh, tribal communications plans. So there's. And there's lease stipulations that uh, govern how they uh, can move forward in, in their lease areas. Um, and so there's, uh, uh, and then, you know, they, they undertake site assessment work and eventually put forward a construction and operations plan that then uh, hopefully eventually leads to a record of decision. And then there's in that record of decision, there will be, you know, robust mitigation measures uh, and monitoring requirements, um, you know, uh, that sort of spell out how they will need to minimize impacts that have been identified through the environmental review process. Um, and in terms of, um, 
I was afraid robustness against future administrations. <laughs> well, robustness, just, just, in, just in terms yes. of the, the fluctuations, I'm not trying to implicate anybody or any party yes. or anything like that. Just, no, just like, absolutely. Because they, they slow are, down when the administration right. changes, regardless of, of uh, you know, um, right over. The, the lease instrument itself is, uh, you know, spells out um, uh, diligence requirements, for instance, right? The, the, the holders have up to five years to put together a construction and operation plan. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're contracts. And so both the federal government and the leaseholder have certain obligations under them, similar to a, a decision being made on a project. Um, and so, you know, the probably best examples of how this plays out in, in changes in administration, we've had some uh, you know, high profile instances of leases being issued for oil and gas uh, projects, for instance, um, where, you know, the, the, a future administration might be somewhat bound um, by what's, you know, the leaseholder is able to do um, and has certain, you know, pre-existing rights. In the offshore wind context, um, again, they don't have uh, a right necessarily to use that area for offshore wind unless they're able to put forward a construction and operation plan that, um, you know, that passes muster, so to speak, and is approved. Um, so I feel pretty confident about the, the instruments themselves being uh, durable and will allow for um, fluctuations in administrations. And I think one of the things that we're trying very hard to do in this administration is build up a renewable energy program that is strong and will endure uh, and demonstrate through, um, you know, we've, we've I've mentioned we've approved two projects. We have several in the environmental review process. One of the ways to really ensure long-term success is to, um, Show it, show it in practice that this type of development is possible in this country, um, has benefits, uh, and, and can be um, an important source of, of clean energy moving into the future. Um, and not just from a you know, climate change perspective, although you know, many of us feel that's important, but they are um, you know, engines for economic opportunity. Um, certainly they are, uh, there is a tremendous amount of job growth and um, support for communities uh, that need it right now, right? So for you know, port improvements and um, the, the types of economic benefits that are possible from these projects, um, I, we are, you know, remain hopeful that it's something that can endure uh, beyond this administration. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. It was really, it was the durability of the instrument. I, it was, Hard to phrase that in such a way that yes. I just really wanted yes. to know, yeah. you know about yeah. about installing a robust um, renewable energy program. So thank you, thanks so mm -hmm. much. Thank you for the question, Doug. Uh, Rod. Hi, Director Klein. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, my question is about tribal consultations. I know in the last few weeks there's been a couple of national tribal organizations that have called for monitoriums on off offshore wind, and one of the one of their concerns. I think has been to do with the workload, the kind of demands that um, that they are facing based upon um, um, the speed and the and the volume of, of progress with offshore wind. And while a lot of us think that that's uh, important to push with offshore wind, it does seem like there are some questions and concerns about tribal consultation and workload. And I wondered if if Boehm and the administration had any initial thoughts on 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 that on those things yes um yes so we've we've uh, been engaging throughout with tribal communities both on the east coast and now on on the west coast as we move out there um i think you are right that a, a number of concerns have been expressed about capacity um you know tribes uh you know obviously every tribe is different um but there are a number of tribes in the uh, on the east coast in particular that um uh, have expressed concerns about their capacity within their organizations to review these uh, environmental reviews um, to really meaningfully engage. It's one thing to have, um, you know, a draft EIS document land on your desk. It's quite another to feel like you have the in-house capacity 
um, you know, the scientific expertise, the, the you know, all of the people, um, just the people there to, um, uh, to do the work. Um, some of the tribes might have one tribal historic preservation officer, for instance. And so we have been working to try and find ways to support capacity building within uh, a number of those tribes. Um, for instance, we undertook a pilot project with uh, one of the offshore wind projects where we uh, were able to uh, find a contractor who helped the tribes put together, that review the documents, um, helped uh, them put together their comments. And so it's things like that, that we are uh, um, trying to find opportunities to help them build capacity. And I think the, the hope is that we would do that um, not just for individual projects, but really, you know, help build um, the type of capacity that tribes could use for uh, the future, right? So not just an immediate short-term capacity building exercise, but certainly um, long-term as well. We've been talking to uh, the project proponents for in, um, as well about, you know, the importance of uh, direct engagement with tribes and making sure that, um, you know, for instance, some of the benefits of these projects, the job opportunities and the economic development, you know, at, at answering questions like how, how are these projects going to help benefit some of these tribal communities. And so it's something we're thinking a lot about um, and continuing to engage with our tribal partners. I mean, I think um, there are a number of pieces of, uh, you know, the resolutions that were passed that we agree with, we agree that you know economic opportunities should flow back to tribal communities where we can make that happen. It would be great to see more tribal members uh, employed uh, on these projects um, and have the type of uh, pipeline of uh, job growth coming from tribal communities would be really exciting. Um, and so that's something we're continuing to work on. Uh, with them. Uh, broader than that, we're also finding ways to make sure that indigenous knowledge is part of the, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the scope of what we're evaluating, right, and, and how tribes find these places, um, you know, their, their connection to them, why they're important, what their perspectives are, and making sure that that's part of um, our evaluation as we're looking at individual projects, but also is just a, you know, contribution to the, you know, understanding about these places that it's not, you know, the, our oceans are not, um, you know, far off and separate uh, to a lot of folks. They're very much connected uh, to these places in a, in a, a, you know, in some cases, a deeply spiritual and cultural way. So um, those are just some of the things that we're, we're, we're working on now. Um, and uh, you know, remain hopeful that we can can make some improvements moving forward. Thank you very much. Any final thoughts or questions or comments for the director? If not, um, oh, I see Carrie's raised her hand, so I'll I'll give her a chance, and then I may have a, a final comment after Carrie as well. Great, thank you so much. It's really um, terrific to hear from you, Director Klein. And um, I have appreciated the dialogue all this morning and including the dialogue just now. I'm, my focus is on the human dimensions of fisheries in particular in coastal communities, focused primarily in California. I'm, I'm a COSA member incidentally. Um, <laughs> uh, I bring a background in the applied, um, applied sociology and anthropology. Uh, in connection with coastal communities and coastal fisheries, um, California and other places around the US, and a, a keen interest in the connection between those things and marine policy and organization of space use and its implications for coastal communities. And I know there's growing um, appreciation for the importance of things like environmental justice, especially for underserved communities, historically underrepresented, underserved. But one of the things that has come up, and I guess this is more in a way, this is very much a, a local facing uh, consideration, but I think it's actually um, a consideration throughout the US in terms of making this move toward uh, development of the offshore wind energy industry. And that is the um, identity, the social and cultural identity, not just of tribal communities, 
but of our coastal communities more broadly. Um, the interest in economic opportunities, but also an understanding of existing social and cultural and economic fabric of these places. And when introducing a new activity, inevitably there is there's change and change happens, right? Um, but I guess I wanted to bring that up. This is a topic of keen interest to some of the folks on COSA, um, certainly the communities that many of us work in. And um, we've had, we, we were happy to have the opportunity to have some uh, social science discussion. Um, the last COSA meeting that we had actually December and then one day a couple of weeks ago. But I guess I just wanted to bring that up. You're hearing about lots of things from different COSA members. Uh, and uh, I think uh, I'm I'm hopeful, especially with those um, the uh, interagency groups and the connection down to the local level, if you will, that in understanding the science of coastal communities as well as the marine environment and the ecological environment and so on, just um, I guess trying to put that on your radar or hoping that it is on your radar and uh, hopeful that. BOEM's environmental science programs can continue to move forward in advancing better understanding of the implications of these changes for those communities. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you so much for bringing that uh, whole set of issues up. I think it's really important. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, I think the tendency in these processes and with these issues is to bucket things into their neat little buckets and you know surely we can um, mitigate the impacts to this use or that use or that impact um, but uh, the you know coastal communities um, and fishing communities in particular um, there is a, a real sense of identity and um, you know having a uh, developed over, in some cases, uh, decades and even longer around a certain activity and the idea that um, another use comes along um, and could uh, pose a threat to that is um, really an important issue and one that we take very seriously at BOM. Um, and we have a, a lots of um, really uh, fantastic people who um, think about those issues a lot and think about how we can uh, you know, move through this uh, time of uh, energy transition um, and bringing new sources of energy and how we can do that in the most thoughtful way possible um, and really making sure that we are from beginning to end um, looking at uh, you know the impacts to um, other uses of the OCS um, but it, it really is an important piece of the whole operation that shouldn't shouldn't be discounted by any measure. Yeah, and, and thank you. If I if I may follow up just momentarily, um, or just very briefly, um, what you bring to mind, and I'm I'm glad to hear it. Is and it's something we've been talking about on COSA. Are these issues of scale and scope of um, change? Uh, some of it good, some of it not so good, depending on where you sit, and cumulative impacts, not just of one development versus another or one development plus another, but all the other change that's occurring, including climate change and how that is influencing the dynamics of these coastal communities and the way ocean ocean space is used or valued. So anyway, thank you so much. Thank you, Director Klein. Sensitive to your time limitations, um, so we won't take up any more of it, but um, just to briefly reiterate, uh, that COSA has recently been thinking about the social sciences. We, we've had two meetings now um, that have touched on that. We want to make sure that that continues to be an ongoing conversation. Um, and uh, as part of that, we have um, been thinking with our BOEM colleagues about uh, sort of new and novel ways to engage as well, whether that be through smaller group discussions, um, you know, making ourselves available to BOEM staff on a one-on-one, -on -one. Um, you know, or, or larger workshops on the other end of the spectrum, um, potentially spin-off studies as well. So uh, what we, whatever we can do to be helpful for you as you embark in your uh, new position, we're, we're really glad to be a resource. Um, we look forward to continuing these conversations um, and we hope that you'll feel welcome to, to join us for our meetings and to um, update us on any 
changing priorities or new, you know, new developments. Uh, we really appreciate your time with us today, certainly. Yep. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, um, uh, good luck with the rest of your meeting. It really does look uh, like a good one. Um, I'm sorry I can't join for all of it, but um, look forward to hearing uh, uh, summaries from you know the folks, the good folks from Boehm who are attending. So, um, thank you again to everybody. Take care. Take care. Thank you. We'll now continue um, with the remainder of our agenda for um, our look into um, the uh, impacts or potential impacts of wind energy development and um, whales. And so our next discussion is a deeper dive into changing environments for whales. Um, and for that, we have Anna Maria DeAngelis on the line from NOAA Fisheries. Um, and we'll have Peter Thomas on the line as well from the Marine Mammal Commission. And we'll go ahead, we'll do as we did with the earlier presentations. We'll let Anna Maria uh, get heard. We'll take maybe a couple of clarifying questions if there are any, um, and then we'll move on to Peter's, and then we'll open again for questions after his presentation. So Anna Maria, if I could ask you to please remember to introduce yourself. Um, I see you're sharing your screen and it looks great. So I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you very well, thank you. Great, okay. Hi everyone, I'm Anna Maria DeAngelis from the Northeast Fisheries Science Center's Passive Acoustics Research Group. Um, I'm an acoustician there. I focus primarily on um, our, our Adana seed analyses, but I'll be uh, representing our entire group here on the work that we've been doing um, as in terms of collecting baseline data to understand the shifting cetacean distributions through passive acoustics. So to start, as everyone's well aware, passive acoustics is a tool that's been widely used to understand um, the movement patterns of marine mammal species. Um, it's been great in understanding the historical and current trends of these species, as you can revisit the data set and ask different questions at any given point in time once collected. Um, we can understand the timing of different species in different areas, as well as understand just how far um, animals are um, from the shore. And all of these things have a natural variability to them that needs to be taken into account before examining the potential effects of anthropogenic sound sources, such as those used in offshore wind energy development. So for this talk, I'm going to be focusing a lot on collecting baseline data, and I want to just have us focus on um, a couple of questions, um, mainly how long does an area need to be monitored to be able to understand change and the source of the change? So there's a temporal component. Do you need 20 years, 10 years? or so on and so forth. Um, and there's also a spatial um, component to this question, as well as um, species. Each species may change in terms of how they react to a different sound source based on the area and uh, the behaviors that they're um, performing in that area. So for this talk, I'm just gonna um, go through a couple examples of some baseline data collected um, to answer, or to at least look at some of these questions, maybe not fully answer. Um, so First off, we'll start with um, some long-term baleen whale data sets. So this is work done by Genevieve Davis and et al. from 2020 and 2017 papers, in which they looked at the distribution of baleen whales along the entire Western North Atlantic. So you can see here on the map that they've divided that region from um, the North being starting at region number one, being Davis Strait, all the way down to the Caribbean Sea being region 11. And this looked at data collected from 2004 to 2014, and uh, it was uh, the result of 281 passive acoustic devices. And for an effort of the scale, this required um, a village. So there were many contributors to this study uh, that lent their data to um, answer this question and couldn't have been done without uh, uh, this, this collaborative effort. So the baleen whale species that they looked at were the North Atlantic right whale, say, fin, blue, and humpback whales. And based on the distribution of the recorders, they were looking at the presence of these uh, species on the continental shelf and the shelf break. So I'm going to go through a little bit of the results. Um, and in terms of the general seasonality, I have an example here from their paper looking at humpback whale presence across the different regions um, going from north to south. And you'll see on the x-axis, these are the months uh, over a given year and uh, the number of days per week that a given species was present in a particular region. 
I'm going to use um, two terms when describing their seasonality. The first being year round presence, meaning that in a given region, a species was present for the entirety of a year versus cross regional presence, which means that for a particular time period, that species was present over a multitude of uh, regions, if not the entirety of the Western North Atlantic, as shown with the humpback example here. Moving through this table, we'll start with the right whale. Um, they had year round presence from Cape Hatteras north up to the Scotian Shelf, and their cross regional presence occurred from November through April. Humpbacks were from the Gulf of Maine up to Greenland for year round presence, and cross regionally, they were present from November through April as well. Say whales were present year round in southern New England and cross regionally from November through February. Fin whales were present in the mid Atlantic up to the Scotian Shelf and cross regionally from August to April. And blue whales were present year round in Greenland and cross regionally from uh, November through February. And I'd like to note that blue whales in general were, locate, were detected more on recorders that were further offshore rather than inshore recorders. So in 2010, um, it was observed through the visual surveys um, that there was a change in, in species distribution, particularly the North Atlantic right whale. And in 2010 is when the Gulf of Maine experienced um, a significant amount of, of warming, which then changed the distribution of prey species. So Davis et al. subdivided their time period to look at data collected prior to 2010 versus post 2010. And that's what's shown here in this graph. Again, looking at the seasonality from uh, with months on the X axis and the number of days per week of right whale being present on the Y axis and then subdivided left being prior to 2010, right being post 2010. And for example here, I'm just gonna highlight that for the Scotian Shelf and the Gulf of Maine regions, towards the latter half of the year prior to 2010, there were, they were present, whereas after 2010, they were absent in those regions. So this is better summarized um, in this figure here, which is the result of their um, modeling of uh, the adjusted mean daily presence of a particular species over a given region. So I'm showing here um, the blue lines being the time period after 2010 and the uh, red lines being the time period before 2010. And first off, across all species, there were fewer detections on the Scotian shelf which is region number three after 2010. Humpbacks overall show the least amount of change across all regions between the two time periods. Say whales increased in presence um, in all regions after 2010. Fin and blue whales exhibited a variability in their uh, distribution and their presence um, pre and post 2010. The North Atlantic right whale significantly decreased its presence in the North but increased its presence in the mid-Atlantic and south. And I want to highlight here that region seven in the study uh, encompasses uh, the area off of southern New England, which is the area that is slated for the upcoming offshore wind energy development. And in this region for humpback whales, uh, say whales and North Atlantic right whales, there was an increase in presence post 2010. However, that's just up to 2014. So the, the next step for Davis and, and colleagues is to look at uh, the spatial temporal variability for these baleen whale species from 2014 to 2024, which is obviously in progress as we're not at 2024 yet. So you can view in, in the meantime, uh, the results of their analysis on our passive acoustic cetacean map website, where once an analysis and a recorder or deployment has been completed, for analysis, um, they, the data are uploaded and uh, the website's pretty interactive in terms of uh, you can play around with which recorders to view and timeframes and species. So lastly, I'm gonna go into uh, the baselines that we're building um, for the offshore wind energy areas. Uh, so currently our efforts uh, extend from the Northern tip of the Gulf of Maine all the way down to the mid Atlantic. And we have recorders both inshore and further offshore. And we're gonna focus the ne next aspect of this talk on the recorders just south of, the, of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. We've been collecting data here since 2020. Um, so overall, we've got about three years of data at some of our sites. There is a total of uh, 12 sites here and we're gonna be adding another four in the next couple months. And uh, we'll be picking up the next set of recorders uh, next month. 
These are bottom mounted um, recorders uh, that have been recording at five month time periods continuously. So the first effort is to just understand uh, the seasonality of cetaceans in this area. So this is work spearheaded by Sophie Van Paris that leads our group um, and looked at uh, all cetacean species from the lowest frequency blue whales in the area all the way up to the highest frequency harbor porpoises in uh, this area. And here again, we're looking at monthly presence of these species, and the number of days per week these species are present in Massachusetts, Rhode Island. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the North Atlantic right whale presence and the harbor porpoise presence are similar in terms of the fact that they both occur mainly from October through April. Next is the ESA listed sperm whale um, occurred in the study area from May through August and had opposite presence in, with respect to the right whale and harbor porpoise. And that some species exhibited year round presence which would be uh, the various dolphin species, uh, humpbacks, North Atlantic right whales, and say whales. Then looking a little uh, closer, uh, our colleague Amanda Holdman is uh, preparing a manuscript that looks more detailed into the spatial variability of harbor porpoise. So she's looking at um, our recorders in the Gulf of Maine and in Southern New England. And these are using the F pods that are co-located on our moorings. There's two years of data spanning November 2020 to 22. And in general, um, she's found that the Southern New England area has a more predictability of harbor porpoise presence than the Gulf of Maine. So in this figure here, these are the results of um, her modeling of harbor porpoise seasonality. So the blue boxes, the data in the blue boxes are belonging to Southern New England. The data in the yellow boxes are the Gulf of Maine. And uh, off the bat, um, there's, you can see that the trends in the Southern New England are more consistent than those up in the Gulf of Maine. And MDR, Mount Desert Rock, is the site located in red. And uh, that site is more significant in terms of having more uh, harbor porpoise presence than any of the other recorders, as well as having higher foraging rates at that site than most of uh, what is reported in the literature. And in general, um, she found a strong correlation with harbor porpoise presence and sea surface temperature where harbor porpoises were only present in areas in which the waters were 16 degrees or cooler. Next is another study being led by Annabelle Westell that is looking more closely at the sperm whale presence in Southern New England, as I first showed with um, the seasonality plot uh, from Sophie's uh, work. And so this is looking across the three years in Southern New England at the various recorders that we have. Again, month is on the x-axis and the percent of days present out of the total days analyzed is your y-axis. And we have the different sites of the Southern New England as the different bars. Um, times when there are no recordings are shaded uh, light gray. Um, so first off, in, in 2020 and 2021, sperm whales were present in the summer months, mainly between uh, June and August. And there was a secondary peak in uh, late in the fall of around November. However, in 2022, this, uh, this uh, reliability of having a summer peak um, is absent and there's still the fall peak. And so that led to the question of what was different in 2020-21 versus 2022. Looking at the um, illic squid landings data, uh, here there's a figure of the amount of squid caught in Southern New England, uh, the dark blue line be being the data from 2022 versus um, the data in 2021 being the yellow line. And you can see that there are substantially fewer squid caught in 2022 relative to 2021, which suggests that there could possibly be a link here between illic squid presence and sperm whales uh, on the shelf um, in Southern New England. And this is something that we're gonna be looking further into um, in, as part of this work. So to conclude, uh, PAM is a versatile tool that can be used for any time span. And long-term studies can help to distinguish environmental change from anthropogenic, anthropogenic induced change. The key here is to record in an area for long enough to be able to detect a change. For example, the North Atlantic right whale and other baleen whales change their distribution at five years, but we don't have as long of a time series for odonoses. We did see changes after three years for sperm whales and for both uh, baleen whales and odonoses. Again, uh, the question being how 
long do you need to record in a given area to be able to say that change belongs to a particular factor it still remains to be determined. However, advances in technology do allow us to monitor these higher frequency species. So we were able to capture sperm whales with our recorders and um, saw that they occurred seasonally in Southern New England, as well as understanding and capturing the harbor porpoise distribution in the Gulf of Maine and in Southern New England. Um, here's just a list of the various uh, projects and papers that I've discussed as part of this presentation. And it takes a village and we have a really great one. And um, just thankful for all the field teams and uh, vessel crews and the analysts that have helped collect and analyze these data and all of the collaborators that have contributed towards all of these data analyses. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Maria. As I mentioned, I'll take one or two clarifying questions. I'll look for um, raised hands. Uh, and I'll just note quickly, because I didn't mention it when we got underway, um, but the chat feature is a, is a wonderful tool, and I encourage folks to use it for the exchange of information, um, but I do not monitor it typically for the purpose of integrating questions into the Q&A. So I do encourage folks to raise their hand, and I will uh, call on folks as I see them. Any clarifying questions for Anna Maria? Doug, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Stacey, you're probably getting tired of me already, um, but that's nothing new for a lot of people on this call. Um, yeah, just a clarifying, Anna Maria, well, great presentation, and and I a lot of us can appreciate the amount of effort that goes into processing all those acoustic data, so it's no no small feat. Um, Cross-regional, um, I just, I was a little confused when you showed that for the baleen whale species and the harbor porpoises, you sort of lumped right whales into a seasonal category, but then you also put them in to the, um, you know, year round presence category. So just in, in man, maybe I, maybe I missed it and I, I got it wrong, but how many regions does a species need to be in to be cross regional? Just two? So in that slide, that was for the Davis 2017 and 27, yep. 2020 studies. Yep. Um, and for cross regional, it was pretty much um, nine or more regions. So usually um, I couldn't right. say all regions because the furthest north and the furthest south didn't um, qualify. So most meant right. nine or more. Yeah. Thanks. That was totally a clarifying thing. So we had that debate <laughs> among the authors. Okay. Thank you very much. Any other questions? All right. Um, I'll turn now. Oh, Scott, you got got in just under the wire. Yeah. <laughs> so that was a great that was a great talk. Very fascinating. Uh, two, two two relatively quick clarifying questions. I, I the you showed a map of where your uh, array of uh, uh, equipment was to do this measuring. It it looked like it was you were pretty well positioned up in the kind of the New England area, but I didn't it looked like there you could potentially use some more um, measurement. Uh, measurements in the kind of the mid-Atlantic area where a lot of the new wind development is going on is is that a is that a gap and is it some is it an is it a need and then my second question is are there any plans to do something similar on the west coast to build a baseline for instance around the the areas that were uh, have been leased in offshore California to answer the first question um so the map I showed where it's just of Northeast Fishery Science Center recorders. Um, wow. There are other centers and institutions that have recorders out um, in the mid-Atlantic. From what I recall, it's potentially less coverage than, than what's in Southern New England there, but I, I'm, I'm not fully confident in that, but that map was only for our recorders. Um, and then to answer your second question, uh, so we focus on the East Coast, um, so it would be a question more for our West Coast colleagues um, in terms of whether or not this kind of effort is being done on the West Coast. Thank you. Thank you. And I see that Annabelle from uh, Hub SeaWorld has her hand up as well, and she may be able to, I saw her nodding her head, so I'll turn to her for a question if she has one, but also she may be able to weigh in on that point, Scott. Um, I can't weigh in on that point, but I do have a question that may be relevant 
to the West Coast as well. Are you doing any intensive passive monitoring in the vicinity of developed wind sites like Black Island? And if so, how is that different from looking at the regional area? In other words, is it such that you could get at some of the behavioral reactions of the animals? Great question. Um, we have, the closest we have to the Block Island wind farm recorders are our Cox's Ledge sites. Um, however, those sites were put up uh, after the wind farm construction. There do exist some recordings from Cornell um, that had a line of recorders from Rhode Island, um, inshore Rhode Island offshore to further offshore. And those data have been analyzed and were included um, in uh, Davis's study. However, that was only up to 2014. Okay. So there wasn't an intensive effort that I'm aware of, but um, whatever recorders were out there have been analyzed for baleen whales um, in that area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I see additional hands have gone up. Um, Kevin, I'll ask you just to be real brief if you have any additional questions. And um, Jill, is yours in response to Anne's question or um, separate? Yeah, no, it was. We're going to talk a little bit about a, um, in my presentation about a, um, a regional PAM system that would, to some degree, get at the behavioral question. So more to come. Excellent, thank you. So Kevin, if you've got one more quick question, we'll take that now. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I was wondering if the reduction in, in traffic and supply chain due to the uh, COVID uh, outbreak had, had any effect on those distributions you were showing, because that, that would be the biggest difference between those two time periods other than climate change and such. Right, so we, do have a project in the works in which we are looking at um, anthropogenic changes to the environment and how that how how that may um, compare to uh, cetacean distributions. And within uh, Sophie's paper that she will be putting out, um, we've looked at the soundscape and the amount of vessel presence uh, from 2020 up till present. And you do see in the soundscape a reduction in noise. Um, I believe it was in 2021 around the, the time when COVID restrictions were high and then an increase in um, soundscape uh, in 2022. So at this point in time, I can't say yes or no, but I do know that there are the data there and we have been looking at in at least uh, vessel presence and uh, soundscape metrics uh, relative to the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'll turn to Peter Thomas from the uh, U.S. Marine Mammal Commission, and I'll ask him to introduce himself. And I'll just note, I think we also have um, all three of our Marine Mammal Commission commissioners on the line as well. Um, so, Peter, I don't know if you want to just uh, briefly introduce them as well, um, but we, we appreciate them joining us today also. Okay. I'll turn it over to you. Okay, so I'm just making sure, have I shared my screen yet? You have, and we can see it, it looks great. You can see the presentation, okay, thank you. And I appreciate the chance to talk to the Committee on Offshore Science and Assessment today on the subject of the recent whale strandings along the Atlantic coast as related to offshore wind. And at the same time, to talk a little bit about the implications of that for the stranding networks that are responding to these uh, strandings. So let's see, I got to click. I... Okay, so first, and just Stacy, confirm, you hear me and you see it okay. Yeah. We can hear you well and we can see your slides. They look great. Okay, sorry, it looks funny on mine. So, okay. So first of all, to introduce the Marine Mammal Commission, the Marine Mammal Commission is an independent federal agency that was created by the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972. And our real mission is to protect and conserve marine mammals and their environment using the best available science. And we are one of three agencies designated by the Marine Mammal Protection Act, and we're the one that is to provide oversight of domestic and international policies and actions related to marine mammals and their habitat. So you mentioned our structure, and I, I am thrilled to have our three presidentially appointed marine mammal commissioners on the line today, we have Francis Gulland, who is our chair, Sue Moore, 
and Andy Reid, who are two newly appointed commissioners appointed just prior to the end of the last Congress. We're also uh, really pleased to have a committee of scientific advisors, again, uh, described in the Marine Mammal Protection Act to provide uh, the scientific advice to the commissioners on the recommendations that they make to the agencies and other entities. And we're also a really large agency. We have 14 staff. Uh, they're all pictured here. We kind of, when someone comes into the office, we cross off. It's like a little town in the Midwest where we cross off and say population 13 uh, or put it, add it up when we get get everyone in the office. But today I wanted to talk about this uh, humpback whale unusual mortality event, which has actually been going on since 2016 and continues today in 2023. So humpback whales began stranding in unusually high numbers along the Atlantic coast in January, 2016. And the National Marine Fisheries Service declared an unusual mortality event or a UME in April, 2017, which included those stranded whales from 2016. So as part of the unusual mortality event or UME investigation process, NIMPS assembled an independent team of scientists to coordinate with, oh, I'm buzzing my thing. Sorry about that, can you hear me now? We can, yes, thank you. Let me just, I'm not sure how to get, my, I'll start video again. Sorry about that. <clears throat> So this, this um, independent team was pulled together by the Working Group on Marine Mammal Unusual Mortality Events to conduct necropsies and sample stranded whales, review the data, and determine the next steps for the investigation. So you should know these are large whales. Routinely, not all whales are able to be accessed for necropsies. And of those able to be necropsied, determining the cause of death is often really difficult due to the level of decomposition of the animals and accessibility and logistical issues. So partial or full ne necropsies were conducted on approximately half of the whales so far that have stranded as part of the UME. And approximately 40% of those whales examined had evidence of human interaction, either ship strike or entanglement. And I should note that even though whales may show evidence like when you first examine them of ship strike or something else, it really takes deeper analysis, uh, follow-up uh, analysis to really figure out if that is indeed the cause of death. So it's not just like you saw the whale on the beach, you saw something and it's all fine, we know exactly what happens, a really difficult process. Let's see, now I lost my uh, cursor. Okay. So following the consistently high numbers of strandings at the outset of the UME, the number of humpback whales that have stranded has fluctuated during the last seven years. But the strandings have been consistently centered from Massachusetts to North Carolina. And the recent humpback whale stranding occurrence and numbers in New York and New Jersey have been comparable to the previous years of the unusual mortality event. And they've also been, the strandings in those two states have been similar to the number of strandings in other states. And I, you've probably picked up that these strandings have gained a lot of attention in the media, from local citizens and from non-governmental organizations, concerned that there may be a link to offshore wind activities. State officials have expressed concern and assembly hearings have occurred in New Jersey and Maryland. There have been bills introduced in Congress that would require the Comptroller General of the Government Accountability Office to conduct studies to kind of assess the environmental review processes with regard to offshore wind. And there have been sort of specific inquiries from Congress on internal memos within the National Marine Fisheries Service. So let's talk about this a little bit. The, High resolution geophysical surveys or HRG surveys have been occurring off New England and the mid Atlantic coast for some time, but the various HRG devices 
have never been implicated or causatively associated with mystice, that is, baleen whale strandings. Any minor impacts from such HRG surveys would be minimized or negated by the mitigation measures that are already required to be implemented by the protective, protective, sorry, protected species observers on the survey vessels. Greater potential impacts are expected from wind farm construction activities that have not yet begun than from HRG surveys. And although it has been covered or will be covered in some capacity today, the possible impacts from construction activities would be minimized with seasonal restrictions on such things as impact pile driving by effective sound attenuation measures and passive acoustic monitoring measures, and by designating appropriate mitigation zones and vessel strike avoidance measures. The humpback whale strandings that have occurred, at, sorry, these humpback whale strandings have occurred at a time when the whales have been concentrating in nearshore areas in an apparent response to the concentration of their menhaden prey. When foraging in nearshore waters, the whales are in closer proximity to major shipping channels. The New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection recently indicated that changes in ocean temperature and water chemistry due to climate change cause populations of marine species, including menhaden, to move closer to shore, thereby increasing the risk that their predators, the whales, may be susceptible to vessel strike. Now, Anna Marie's talk really talked about some changing distribution, which is detected by passive acoustic monitoring. And I think a general observation of the folks who really know about humpback whales, such as Jip Robbins up at the Center for Coastal Studies, is that they've seen humpback whales in different areas recently. Normally, or in previous years, humpbacks largely re remain to the north between the Gulf of Maine and Norway from spring through summer, and then migrated south to the tropics to calve and mate in the winter. But recently their distribution has been wider. And I think the, the observations suggest that juveniles are more commonly feeding off the mid-Atlantic states in winter, when previously we would have seen most of them migrating to the Caribbean. So as, as distributions change, risks change. So we've talked about the whales moving closer into shipping channels, some of the busiest shipping channels in the world. And also you have to remember that entanglement is another cause of death for large whales in the North Atlantic. And as whales change their distribution, the relative risk of entanglement in fishing gear also changes. So let me talk a little bit about how we know some of this stuff, even though we don't know everything. And first of all, rapid stranding response is important for determining the causes of marine mammal deaths. One limitation is always being able to access animals that have been founded either onshore or offshore. The whale pictured here was found floating off of Del Delaware. And in order to really do a necropsy on such an animal, you have to get in touch with the Coast Guard or other state entities to assist you in towing whales to the beach, in bringing heavy equipment to the beach to help you actually move the whale around and access it for necropsy. Uh, even if a whale stranded onshore, it's not that easy a task. And necropsies are very important in both determining the cause of death and in continuing to assess the risk to large whales. And this, it's really important that this kind of information be reported in a tiny, timely manner. And we've seen some concerns on getting that information out quickly to the public who are very concerned about such, such events. It's also really necessary, again, to minimize risks to large whales. So continuing on in this vein, we can't take the information obtained from stranding for granted. We can't take it for granted we're going to get that information. And the stranding network is part of a strong public-private partnership that routinely deals with extremely difficult circumstances, including extensive coordination and logistics, harsh weather, rough seas, massive animals, 
upon public concern and intense media attention. And so dealing with these circumstances requires incredible skill, both among those who can actually cut up a whale, but those who assist and, and do the communications with regard to stranding response. So, and then after having been called out at late hours or on the holiday or on the weekend, it's almost always on the weekend to respond to a stranding. In a few hours on cold, windy beaches, stranding network responders and their community of volunteer assistance attempt to draw conclusions regarding the cause of death from massive, often heavily decomposed carcasses. Then once they leave the beach, it takes a broader community of labs and pathologists to look beyond the physical evidence uncovered on the beach to determine whether there are any underlying diseases, nutritional deficiencies, whatever, which may have contributed to the death of that particular animal. So I just wanna really applaud the skill and dedication of the stranding network responders up and down the coast, often working as volunteers. Uh, if it weren't for them, we wouldn't be talking about this it, it, with any level of knowledge. So uh, in this regard, I wanted to mention, um, there's the Working Group on Unusual Marine Mammal Mortality Events, and there are also funding sources from, uh, from, I guess, sources established under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, including the Prescott grants, which support stranding efforts, but also the Unusual Mortality Event Contingency Fund which was established in 1992 to compensate persons or entities for responding to marine mammal unusual mortality events. This is dispersed by the National Marine Fisheries Service in consultation with the Fish and Wildlife Service. This, this contingency fund has received appropriated monies only once in the last 18 years, with approximately 800,000 deposited in 2005. Since then, stranding network organizations have provided many services free of charge and have requested reasonable compensation for others. So appropriated funds are needed for the stranding network organizations to have the resources to respond adequately to ongoing and future UMEs and to conduct the necessary investigations to determine the causes of those events and tell us how to mitigate such uh, mortalities. Now, although the appropriation, congressional appropriations are needed to ensure the solvency of the fund, I also should note that donations can be received from the general public, from non-governmental organizations, and from industry. And I checked, and you can actually, you can provide those by debit or credit card. Okay, so just to conclude, I want to really draw your attention to the primary focus of folks on the East Coast with respect to large whale conservation. Similar to humpback whales, an unusual mortality event was also declared for North Atlantic right whales in 2017. Impacts that species from, what well, impacts that species are even more grave. North Atlantic right whales currently number about 340 individuals with fewer than 70 breeding females. North Atlantic right whales occupy the same waters and are equal, equally vulnerable to the threats of vessel strike and entanglement in fishing gear. The National Marine Fisheries Service is currently reviewing comments on proposed vessel speed measures to reduce the threat of vessel strike to North Atlantic right whales. Those measures, which are critical to the protection of this species, will also protect other large whale species on the Atlantic coast once they're finalized, and we hope they will be finalized soon. And now Congress, while Congress has enacted measures to freeze further regulatory actions of the Atlantic large whale take reduction team until 2028, it's critically important that work continue on reducing the other major threat to North Atlantic right whales, entanglement in vertical line fishing gear. Development of buoy lists or pop-up or ropeless gear and, other, and work to foster its adoption, as well as other work with the industry and local communities to, to ameliorate the threats to North Atlantic right whales is critical. Same time we just heard about passive acoustic monitoring, anything we can do 
to advance our methods to detect right whales in near real time is needed to support adaptive risk reduction and to document the co-occurrence of right whales with the threats to the survival of their species. So with that, I'll end my little talk and welcome any questions. Thank you. And I'll try to unstop share. There we go. Thank you, Peter. I'll look for raised hands for any questions. Moment. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, it was very interesting. I was wondering. I, I noticed in your in your histogram on on the on the humpbacks that the um, you know, the really significant, the, the, the higher years seem to be from 2016 to 2020. Do you think that the um, unusual mortality event is continuing and that the reduction in 2021 was, was again, just a result of the COVID and less traffic? Or, or do you think that, the, um, that, that, that it somewhat returned to a normal rate of strandings? That's a great question. I'm gonna to have to leave that to the UM Working Group on Unusual Mortality Events. Um, I think the real the sort of take home for this talk is that the, the larger numbers were earlier in the UME, but it definitely is continuing. Um, and, and I'm also really interested in that vessel traffic mm -hmm. stuff because as we know, we've had a, you know, a constraint on vessels, but we've also had a massive increase in vessels since the since COVID, as people try to resolve the supply chain problems. Mm -hmm. right on. Thank you very much. You bet. Les, go. I'll call. Yeah. On. Yeah. yeah. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Um, I know this is a reach, but in trying to anticipate <laughs> the possible effects, particularly indirect effects between wind fields once they're up and uh, whales, particularly right whales. Should we be looking mainly at potential changes in ship traffic and fishing patterns or are there other things to consider as well? I think that's a great question. I, I mentioned you know, that the construction activities themselves are the ones that have slightly greater potential to impact whales, but those are being addressed through mitigation measures. Um, to reduce that impact, to establish mitigation zones around individual construction sites. At the same time, the, you know, the increase in su support vessels to wind energy projects is you know, the, uh, sort of, uh, uh, almost a more predictable threat to large whales. We need to manage the threat of a uh, vessel strike to whales. Um, as for as for fishing vessels, just one comment. I don't actually know the answer to that question, but fishing vessels, in terms of vessel strike risk, are operating at lower speeds than some of the larger commercial vessels. So, for instance, off of Cape Cod and Stell Wagon Bank, the compliance of fishing vessels with voluntary speed measures is really great because they don't just don't go so fast. And yeah, I was thinking. In terms of commercial vessels, yes, the increase of commercial shipping is going to continue to be a major problem for large whales if we don't manage vessel speed in the habitat of large whales. Yeah, the the other concern I had was just a shift in the distribution of pot fishing if there's a oh. lag in getting ropeless gear into play. Yeah, well, I think that goes back to the environmental changes and do do fishing activities change? both with respect to commercial development offshore and with respect to environmental changes. Yeah. I'll call on, I'm calling on people, so I'll call on Chris, yeah. that works. Yeah, go right ahead, that's, that's fine, I'll take a break. <laughs> go ahead, Scott. Scott, sorry. Great, yeah. well, great talk, Peter, very, very, very helpful. Um, two questions. Um, it, it looked like 2017 was a, a bad year, both for humpbacks and for right whales. Do you see, uh, uh, what, 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 what linkage do you see, or if any, 
you know, of both of them uh, having increased uh, UMEs in, in in that general time frame. That's my first question, and and my second one is. Uh, are there less any lessons learned from our European colleagues uh, about uh, uh, correlations, potential correlations between uh, the activity, offshore wind activities? They're further along, of course, than we are, and they've gotten a lot more activity in the construction phase. Any lessons learned there that you think we need to be uh, giving consideration to? Yeah, <clears throat> I am going to let some of the speakers following me answer both of these questions more effectively than I can, because both John Hare and uh, Jill, I think, can speak to those, both the, the UME and the, the uh, European experience. But on the uh, right whale UME in 2017, the, the movement of right whales up to the Gulf of St. Lawrence and major um, ship strike and entanglement events up there, I think, really fed into that as a unique a unique change in right whale distribution. It, with respect to humpbacks, I'm not sure that there was any sort of corresponding similar, you know, similar almost like state change in where they were. So I I don't know if those are connected. And my simple answer with respect to European colleagues is that the, the distribution of large whales around European wind farm is just very different. I mean, it's, it's been mostly focused on harbor porpoises and smaller cetaceans that are in that in that region with very fewer fewer large whales to be encountered or concerned about. But I, like I said, I'd let Jill or others really answer that effectively. Thank you very much. Any last questions before we let Peter off the hook? Excellent. Well, Peter, thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Uh, we will move on to the next session now. Um, and for that, I believe we've got a little bit of a change in the agenda. Um, I think we will be hearing first from John and then from Jill. They're listed um, in the opposite order on the agenda. Um, but I see John has turned his camera on. Do I have that right, John, that you're planning to go first? Yes, correct, Stacy. Excellent, excellent. Well, I'll turn it over to you. Just a reminder to please introduce yourself and then we'll turn it to Jill um, after uh, your presentation and maybe a few uh, clarifying questions. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm gonna share a presentation with all of you, but my name is John Hare. I work for NOAA Fisheries um, and I work out of the Northeast Fisheries Science Center in Woods Hole. And I'm gonna talk a little bit, just give an overview of you know our responsibilities um, under Endangered Species Act. John, you've muted yourself. There, I, can you hear me now? We can hear you well again. Thank you so much. Okay. And you can see my, my slides? Yep, we can okay. see them. Thank you. Um, so, you know, as we know, the North Atlantic right whale um, is an endangered species, and the species has been in decline since approximately 2010. Um, as of the last official stock assessment report in 2019, that number in the upper right, um, there were approximately 368 right whales left. Um, but this number is caveated, asterisked. Um, by, you know, information from the 2021 stock assessment indicates that there are fewer than um, 350 individuals left and the stock assessment report that official number will be updated, um, you know, some point during the year. Um, and this decline is, you know, both the number of deaths have increased um, and that bar chart on the bottom shows the number of calves born annually. So there's also been a reduction in the number of calves born. So it's a, it's a dire situation for the North Atlantic right whale. Um, thinking about the authorities for NOAA fisheries, um, we, with regards to North Atlantic right whales, we're working under two authorities. One is the Endangered Species Act. Um, and the purpose of this act is to prevent the extinction of endangered species and to conserve the ecosystems upon which they depend. And then relative to uh, wind energy development, there's a section seven jeopardy standard 
um, which is designed to ensure that federal actions, be they fisheries management plans or offshore wind authorizations, do not have significant negative impacts on the survival and recovery of the species or designated critical habitat. And then we also are working under the Marine Mammal Protection Act with North Atlantic right whales. Um, and the purpose of this act is to prevent marine mammals from declining beyond the point where they cease to be a significant functioning element of the ecosystems of which they are part. Um, some elements of this act which are relevant. Um, one is the potential biological removal approach um, whereby the level of human caused mortality of marine mammal population can sustain while still allowing them to recover. Um, for North Atlantic right whales, that population biological removal threshold is less than one individual can be, uh, you know, uh, death can be caused by human caused mortality um, to allow them to recover. In terms of the, the other standard which we have is the Marine Mammal Protection Act incidental take authorization. Um, this authorizes taking, uh, taking here is, you know, defined as a term of art. Um, it allows specific activities that have a negligible impact on all affected marine mammal species and stocks and authorized taking as a small amount relative to the population. There's different levels of take. I mean, what we're really talking here is take defined as uh, behavioral uh, interactions or harassment. So in North Fisheries, we have a, you know, a large number of our activities across the East Coast are related to our North Atlantic right whale. Um, efforts. Our goal is to halt the current population decline and to recover the species. Um, we have activities in the northeast of the Greater Atlantic Regional Fisheries Office and the Northeast Fisheries Science Center, direct, Science Center where I am the director. Um, we have activities in our southeast, Southeast Regional Fisheries Office and Southeast Fisheries Science Center. And then we have activities at three of our headquarters offices, the Office of Protected Resources, the Office of Science and Technology, and the Office of Law Enforcement. So we work across these offices, across the geography of North Atlantic right whales with a goal to halt the current population decline and to recover the species. Um, we have recently put out uh, what we call the road to recovery. Um, which has these sort of six elements to recovering North Atlantic right whales. Uh, I have a link to this in the presentation, which I hope can be shared with you uh, afterwards. But just to kind of walk through each of these six um, areas, one is vessel strikes. Um, Peter mentioned that we are currently, uh, you know, reviewing public comment on a, on a new uh, vessel speed rule to reduce the probability of vessel strikes. Uh, we also have an emphasis on fishing gear entanglements. Um, and earlier in the day, you heard about the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team. Um, that team is tasked with coming up with proposals to reduce entanglements in fishing gear. Um, and you also heard that some of their activities have been put on hold um, for six years um, to well this idea of on-demand uh, sort of fishing technology uh, has time to develop. Um, we also work to identify potential and emerging threats, and we're working in partnership with Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to uh, consider how to have offshore wind energy development while also still recovering and protecting North Atlantic right whales. And you'll hear more about that from Jill after this talk. On the monitoring progress side, um, we have our monitoring population and health. We have a an extensive monitoring network. You heard some of some of that this morning from Anna Marie regarding the passive acoustic monitoring. We also have ship-based monitoring, aircraft monitoring, near real-time mooring and glider monitoring, um, and are working to bring other technologies to the fore as quickly as we can. Uh, we also continue to evaluate the threats to North Atlantic right whales and also work to understand the effectiveness of our conservation activities. And these are done largely through uh, a Northeast implementation team and a Southeast implementation team. And those two teams work to sort of measure how our activities are being effective. In terms of the current strandings, which you've heard about uh, during winter of 2022 and 2023, um, from December 1 to the present uh, today, um, there has been an increase in the frequency of large whale deaths along the East Coast, with a majority of these whale deaths in the Mid-Atlantic. 
Um, thus far, we've had 28 reported mortalities of large whales, three sperm whales, 20 humpback whales, two right whales, one say whale, and three minke whales. Um, and our stranding network partners conducted full necropsies on 16 of these animals and collected basic biological data on six more. And I just want to, you know, you know, Peter talked about the, the, the thanks that goes out to these groups for doing this work. It is hard, um, you know, and sometimes they're doing it, uh, volunteers are doing it. And so just a lot of credit goes to them for, for engaging in this type of work so we understand what happens to these animals. Um, of the 16 that have been necropsied, um, vessel strike was the likely cause of death in at least nine. Um, and we are awaiting the histology reports to confirm um, and perhaps provide insights and in, greater insights into the death of these nine and also insights into the deaths of the others. And this, you know, this finding really working from a place of evidence, this really sort of gives us a reason to put our vessel speed rule into effect because we are seeing vessel strikes um, as, a, as an important cause of death in these strandings. As Peter also mentioned, uh, you know, both the mortalities of humpback whales and the mortalities of North Atlantic right whales are linked as part of these unusual mortality events. Uh, the humpback whale mortality numbers were increasing in 2016, the UME was declared and it continues into 2023. Similarly, the North Atlantic right whale um, stranding numbers were increasing in 2017, an unusual mortality event was declared um, and is still ongoing. And there's more information on both of these um, unusual mortality events on, our, on the web page as noted at the bottom. And this also Peter showed, um, this is from the web page of the humpback uh, UME, um, and you can see that increase in 2016, uh, UMEs declared and it's still continuing. And then that, uh, the, you know, the bar in 2023, um, that stands at 14 strandings thus far. Um, it's a partial year. Um, and just, and also another point is that, you know, the number of actual deaths likely exceeds the number of strandings. Uh, strandings are just the deaths that we observe. So um, this what we are seeing in 2023 is part of this larger um, UME in humpback whales and in right whales. In terms of what we're doing with regards to offshore wind development activities, uh, just to be clear, NOAA Fisheries has not authorized or proposed to authorize mortality or serious injury of whales for any wind related action. Uh, Erica went through the process for um, you know, determining whether activities are gonna impact whales um, and nothing that would cause mortality or serious injury has been authorized. Um, and similarly, offshore wind developers haven't applied for, um, nor has NOAA Fisheries approved the authorization to kill any marine mammals incidental to any offshore wind site characterization survey or construction activities. Um, and we do have a full list of active and in process into incidental take authorizations, including those related to offshore wind available on our website. And the, the link there when the presentation is shared will take you to that list. Um, there are 13 active um, incidental harassment authorizing level B harassment, which is a behavioral harassment only of marine mammals incidental to the offshore wind site characterization surveys in the Atlantic Ocean um, from Southern New England to the Carolinas. Um, and sort of thinking, you know, longer term, uh, we have been working closely with uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management to develop a draft offshore wind North Atlantic right whale strategy. Um, and in this strategy, you know, we lay out the, the vision that both agencies share a common vision to protect and promote the recovery of North Atlantic right whales while responsibly developing offshore wind energy development. Um, and this is where, you know, I'll stop my presentation, happy to take a few questions and then turn it over to Jill um, to go into more details about the strategy. So I, believe, I believe I'm no longer sharing my screen, so. That's right, you've, uh, you've turned it off. I see Doug has raised his hand, so we'll take his question first and I'll give others a moment or so to raise their hands if they have any clarifying uh, questions also. Doug, go right ahead. 
Yeah, super. Thanks. Just one quick one, John, just to be clear, 13 active IHAs, all of which authorize only level B takes. There are no level A takes authorized in any of the IHAs, the current currently active IHAs, or are those under consideration? Correct. That's my understanding. Okay. And those are 13 active IHAs for activities related to offshore wind right. survey activities, correct? Right. Okay. Thanks, John. Yeah, you're welcome. Michael? Yeah, uh, John, and back to Peter too, really. Um, the key of this conversation has largely been the data generated on the beach through uh, various necropsy activities. And it's always struck me that the fisheries observer program for the impact of fisheries on small cetaceans and pinnipeds is fully funded. Whereas the word volunteer keeps on coming up when it comes to these necropsies. And I think as this whole debate evolves, the need for you know professional, fully funded uh, large whale, in particular necropsies, because essentially these large whales events are being providing the same data quality they should at least as the observer program. In fact, more so in some ways. So it's just it's always been a mismatch to me that the, the agency is um, looking to substantial not-for-profit contributions. And, and their volunteers in these diagnostic efforts. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. You know, the, those programs are funded very differently within NOAA Fisheries, um, and that could be a useful recommendation for this committee to make for us to sort of think about how we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, John, for that response. I will just take a quick moment uh, to note um, on the record that this committee does not offer recommendations, John, um, for BOEM or otherwise. Oh, sorry, my mistake. That's okay. I just, I gotta, I gotta make sure I'm clear with, uh, with 122 folks on the line, want to make sure we're clear that this committee, um, the individuals on it provide their individual input and feedback uh, as opposed to any formal consensus input on behalf of the National Academies. Um, however, uh, certainly, the National Academies uh, does convene consensus committees for ad hoc tasks, um, and um, those committees can make formal recommendations to the agencies. So uh, I'd like to rephrase my previous answer saying, <laughs> thank you very much, Michael, for the comment. I will be sure to, to sort of discuss that within NOAA Fisheries. And, and John, don't, don't worry. We're not quiet individually. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's that. right. <laughs> I'll turn to Scott next. Hey, John, great talk. Thanks for sharing that information. Uh, was, uh, was your group or NOAA Fisheries uh, consulted about uh, potential incidental takes uh, with respect to any of the construction projects in state waters? I'm thinking about particularly Block Island wind development, I guess, which is the most mature offshore construction project on the Atlantic. I would need to check for you on that, and I don't want to, to make a supposition. So I will uh, confirm and get back to the committee on that. Thank you. Any additional questions for John before we move on to Jill's presentation? Hey, Michael, is your hand up from the prior comment, or is that a new hand? Perfect. All right. We'll turn then to Jill. And um, Jill, please, I, I think many people on the line know you, but please do introduce yourself um, <laughs> so that the greater audience has an opportunity to know who you are. And then uh, we'll let you get your presentation underway. Okay, that sounds great. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jill Lewandowski. I work for BOEM and um, I direct our division of, of environmental assessment, which looks at how we are assessing impacts or sort of pulling the, the science together with the policy. And I also direct our Center for Marine Acoustics. Um, I also serve in a uh, working group between BOEM and NOAA that is working to develop a North Atlantic right whale and offshore wind strategy. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the intersect of uh, right whales in offshore wind 
go into a bit about what BOEM is specifically doing or doing with its partners, and then go into a greater detail about the right well strategy itself, which again is, is being developed uh, between BOEM and NOAA. Um, before though I get in there, I always want to say, you know, that we're going to, this is all obviously a meeting very focused on science. And um, so yay, that's great. Um, but I also want to recognize that that I know the concern out there in the public about impacts of whales is is strong and genuine and um, understandable. I mean, these are uh, beloved creatures. Uh, they're aesthetically important for for many people. They can be a sign of what is happening in our in our you know ecosystems and in our environment. And I also point out for um, like tribes along with historical connections along the coast, um, they're very, very important to culture history. And in some cases, these are actually um, ancestors um, of some of some of these tribes. So there's an a, a component of this that goes way beyond the science and until the the real impact that this has um, on many people. So um, moving on, if uh, I guess I'm getting a slow, I might have to advance it. Maybe moving on, there we go. I guess it's just the, the roller on my mouse that works. So uh, talking just very briefly here. Uh, so looking at, we, the, here's annualized right well representation. So basically it's all, of course, all the data over the course um, of a period of time um, that's, you know, gives you a sense of where you tend to have more um, high density spots. You can also see here, we have like on the top here uh, along the Gulf of Maine is the call area. Uh, this right, oops, sorry, this right now is a call area. It's not actually um, a lease area. Um, where you're getting a little further down here along Nantucket Shoals, which is in this area, uh, we have leases as well as in the New York Bight area. Um, and you can see over here on the right, there's some protect, uh, leases and pr uh, prospective wind energy areas as you go along the coast. So this is just to give sort of a, a snapshot um, of where activity is looking to be developed. And of course, in the inset there, you can see where the North Atlantic right whale critical habitat areas are. But as we know, the whales do move a bit. We do know there's some year-round presence in some areas. We're, we're finding out a lot more. What we thought we knew through like the year 2010, uh, we're finding from 2010 on that things are shifting and they're shifting faster. But you know, there are times of the year where you're going to see whales in greater numbers, right? Whales in greater numbers in, in some areas um, versus others. It's also a busy environment out there. So this gives you a little idea of some of the least areas here. You can see it looks like, a, you know, one of those saws, um, you know, and this is in the kind of New York bite area. And you can see some other lease areas further offshore. Um, but you can also see the shipping lanes and the traffic lanes. So this is, you know, a 12 month look. So pulling in all of those uh, vessel track lines coming into New York Harbor over a 12 month time period. So obviously it's a very busy area out there as far as ships uh, movement. And, um, you know, this is part of one of the things I know that NOAA's attempting to address with uh, the vessel speed rule. Um, I would go so far to say that it's, you know, when you look at how much activity is out there, um, and if whales are coming more into these areas, then um, it's unfortunate, but um, not surprising, we might be seeing more vessel strikes. Speaking specifically, though, to these offshore wind site characterization surveys, we, we heard this morning from Erica about the acoustic acoustic sort of around that and what the potential for that impact could be. Um, when these site characterization surveys are moving and actually uh, collecting data, they're moving at very, very slow paces. Um, they transit from port to the location at faster speeds. Um, but we do have a reporting requirement. If there is a near miss, certainly a hit, even if you see a dead animal, you have to report it immediately. And we have not had any reports come in um, of any right whales or large whales being um, struck or hit by um, vessels. And of course, that is 
uh, a level of reporting that's done from the protected species observers that are independent observers that are out there. Uh, but certainly, if something were to have happened along that lines and it's found out it wasn't reported, uh, that is a, a tremendous compliance issue with a lot of repercussions. So uh, we are feeling confident that uh, you know, we're not in a situation where the vessels associated with the site characterization surveys are responsible for um, any of these strikes. So speaking now, going into a little bit, um, there's a long history of uh, BOEM and its partners, certainly, working, uh, doing right rail research along the Atlantic coast. Um, back in the 80s, uh, there was interest in potential oil and gas, and that resurfaced uh, a number of years ago, um, although nothing uh, came of that. Um, but, you know, over that 20 year period, there's a lot of different um, projects going on uh, that, that went on that have collected a lot of information that it has fed into uh, larger, you know, meta analyses that, that are being done. And uh, this is a glimpse of some examples of those uh, studies, and you can get to any of their of the reports uh, through our website um, as well. Ongoing right now, we are also leaning in quite a bit to, to doing more uh, to try to understand uh, more about right whale ecology, uh, behavior, distribution, abundance, um, how we might be able to mitigate um, impacts as they uh, potentially may come along, particularly as you get into that construction and operation phase. So it get, ranges anywhere from a really getting um, you know, better approaches out there to look at population level effects, bioenergetic and energetic models, um, looking at these uh, persistency and aggregations of right whales, uh, looking at the gaps in acoustic ecology. So right whales are a little bit more challenging to uh, be able to sort of detect on uh, like passive acoustic monitoring, but if we can understand a little bit more about their cue rates and, and how they use the environment acoustically, we may be able to pull information out of data that we have uh, not necessarily been able to. We are looking at satellite imagery to see if there's a way to do automatic detection of right whales and other species. We are looking at developing auditory weighting functions for low frequency whales. So that's a right whale, like many of the baleen whales, they hear in very, very low frequencies. And uh, it's really difficult to do a hearing test on a whale in order to understand, you know, what are the frequencies that they hear um, the most. Um, we know, like as humans, we hear in certain frequencies where other species, uh, even our dogs, may hear in different frequencies. Um, so getting a better understanding of what that is for whales is really helpful. We also have this expert relativistic risk assessment framework. Um, we have obviously leaned into the potential um, consequences of disturbance modeling that's been going on for a number of years. But of course, that requires you to have a lot of data on a lot of species in order to, to run those models fully. And so we worked on something that could give us just a, a relative risk looking at various um, important factors in get, helping us sort of drive decisions about what may be the best thing um, to drive mitigations. Uh, for example, most recently we did an assessment of two projects in the, the vicinity and we looked at right whales and a few other species and you know what happens with both are constructing but if one is constructing what if one is in operation why one is constructing and we got a lot of good information about there about relative risk across those um, different scenarios and we're going to continue to develop that framework um, bring it up into more uh, chronic looking at cumulative cumulative from a sense of uh, various noise um, produ producing activities and then also we could ideally love to pull that up into a true cumulative risk uh, assessment framework where we could consider other non-noise stressors. We also have a lot going on right now trying to really tune in and improve up upon what are we going to require during construction and operation. Um, we have standard mitigation and monitoring measures. Uh, the right well strategy itself in Appendix B does outline a lot of them. And so we will continue to build those, uh, require those, adjust them as more information becomes available. 
Uh, we do for the COPS, those construction and operation plans, we did uh, develop some modeling guidelines from the Center for Marine Acoustics uh, so that we have consistency in how each of the operators are actually evaluating um, the modeling and the acoustic impacts. Uh, we're coming out now with sound field verification guidelines, which are essentially going to be along the lines of measurements at every pile being driven. Um, there'll be uh, likely changes if it's a if it's a pile that is consistent in um, water depth size uh, compared to something that's already been really fully evaluated, then it's a little lighter form of sound field verification, which is actually measuring in the field. And if it's something that's a little bit newer, it'll be more intense. We are also looking at building a regional monitoring, a uh, PAM monitoring system uh, up in the Northeast. And this, the way we are trying to design this would be at, um, would be aimed at trying to determine does the presence of wind farms change the behavior uh, where the whales are, you know, showing up, moving. We want it to be able to detect that. And it's a huge undertaking that's going to be, have a lot of different partners with it, working closely with like the RWSC and other um, entities. Um, we're right now doing a power analysis to really get a good sense of how many of these sensors we'll need to have out there in order to answer the questions that we're going to be looking at. And we also would I, are working towards how can we pull all that data into one place, make it publicly available, um, and even uh, create some tools where anybody could uh, run reports, you know, kind of those basic reports that, that people are interested in, where we can create it so, so anybody can go into that and be able to get the information that they would like. We want to expand upon real-time tools. So we know passive acoustic monitoring can, can help detect. It's a little, uh, we're not quite there with locating. So how can we lean into that and get better uh, technology that can actually not just detect, but locate where a right whale, right whale call is coming from? We also wanna do more predictive tools. Uh, one example is dimethyl sulfide. So trying to, use as the zooplankton are, are um, you know, chomping on the phytoplankton and there are certain um, things that, you know, certain uh, dimethyl sulfide is released. There's maybe ways through satellite imagery to detect that and use it as a way to predict the likelihood that animals are going to be coming to that area to also feed and satellite imagery, uh, just, you know, separately how that can detect. We're looking at uh, auditory recovery time for impulsive sounds. Obviously, pile driving is one area that we want to um, really focus in on. And uh, one thing that I that I skipped over accidentally was that received sound level limit. We are looking to establish basically um, a limit. Um, we don't want to overly prescribe it. It's sort of performance based. And right now we're looking, and it still needs to be finalized, but we're looking like at a, you know, within a kilometer of each, um, uh, if each of those piles, the sound cannot, past that point, cannot exceed what would be considered level A harassment for any baling whale. And level A means potential injury to hearing. And so by establishing that, um, and setting the bar and letting industry uh, develop the technology for how they're going to get there, um, we can protect what we're we're most concerned about when it comes to to the pile driving. And I would uh, be remiss if I don't it didn't point out that Department of Energy has been a huge partner on that. And then um, there have been a lot of workshops that have gone on already, uh, not just from BOEM, uh, NOAA as well. Uh, many, some of you on the phone have been part of these workshops. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just go ahead and proceed on. But uh, the point is, there's been a lot of work done, but we still do have information gaps um, that we're actively uh, trying to understand and fill. And so that brings us to the strategy. So we released a draft of the strategy back in October of 2022. And the vision of that is to protect and promote the recovery of North Atlantic right whales while responsibly developing offshore wind. And what it is at this point is it's a path forward between BOEM and NOAA. 
on how we're going to do that. Uh, and we would note this will be, it will be finalized, and I'll talk about timing on that shortly, uh, but it's a living document. So as new information becomes available, we can update this, we can adjust if there's a need to reprioritize um, the science needs based off new information, we can do that as well. Um, and this gives you a, a general sense of at least of the draft, how we sort of did the table of contents, you know, describing the issue a bit. Um, I'll go a little bit more into detail on the framework and the three goals, but also talking about partners and potential financial sources, resources. And of course, I mentioned earlier this Appendix B, which has the avoidance and minimization measures. So looking at the first one, the first goal, mitigation and deci decision support. So each of the goals, uh, for the most part, has a couple sub goals. So the first one is just refining our mitigation and monitoring measures so they can be as effective as possible, both at a project level and at a multiple or cumulative level. Um, reviewing and updating measures uh, regularly, making sure they're complementary across statutory reviews. Uh, these measures come up in NEPA, they come up under the Marine Mammal Protection Act, they come up under the Dangerous Species Act, and we need to make sure that they're complementary across those reviews. Uh, tracking mitigation technologies, ways that we can uh, better mitigate, and we do look internationally to see what examples we can gain, and there are some. Uh, but what has existed so far where, where offshore wind has developed, uh, they haven't necessarily had a baleen whale issue. It's been more harbor porpoise issues. Um, so it's a little bit of a different uh, problem that they were seeking to solve. And then supporting research to, to you know, develop uh, those technologies as well as better detection technologies. Um, the second one here is prioritizing uh, quieting, whether it's through the foundations, whether it's these performance standards like I just spoke to for impact pile driving, or whether it's for ways to promote quieting technologies in vessels. We also, under this goal, want to develop uh, and improve upon risk and decision support tools. Uh, we have things like population viability analysis models, cumulative effects modeling. I spoke before about the expert uh, relativistic framework, risk framework, uh, trying to uh, build that out even further. Um, you know, looking along uh, other sort of uh, modeling to look at what measures might be needed uh, for vessel strike beyond. Uh, we know it's in the 2022, we know a proposed vessel speed restriction rule. Um, we're still waiting, though, to find out what's going to be in any final rule. And then do we have a gap there that we still need to fill? Looking at uh, evaluating entanglement risk. So it could be from, from cables or floating wind technology. Uh, but we also want to be sure that the presence of these vessels uh, does not necessarily move excuse me, the presence of these uh, uh, structures, the wind facilities don't necessarily move whales into other areas where they may have higher pressures for entanglement and um, uh, vessel strike um, concerns. So the second one is research and monitoring. Uh, first is we need to develop you know, a plan. Um, we have ideas about what that'll be, but we want to make sure that plan includes things to update the baseline as more information becomes available, regularly reevaluate those priority questions, perform a gap analysis, no question, we're gonna need more money in order to do all of this. And we're gonna do that a lot through partnerships. Um, but you know, there we need to understand where we have a gap between what needs to be done and, and what resources we have available. Um, this next one is essentially trying to look at ecosystem services or ecosystem-based management of areas. So this is a project um, that is in the Gulf of Maine. Um, I, and I know Les is very familiar with that one. He can speak to it um, in, much more, in much more detail. Looking at what is our best available science standards um, as we move forward evaluating. Uh, really disseminating the results uh, to, you know, very adaptive management approach and working with the RWSC and other federal and state partners. Uh, we're not the only ones out there. The federal government collecting data and information, the states are also doing quite a bit and other organizations. So uh, we want to make sure that we're folding that into this process. 
Um, the second goal here under research and monitoring is just to support, you know, have sufficient statistical power to, to detect changes. Um, so that's sort of endemic to a lot of everything that we have. I talked about that long-term PAM network, but we want to make sure that uh, we've got the right network set up that can detect the changes uh, that we would be looking for. Um, and here, too, is the use of other kind of data, uh, unmanned systems, satellite data, emerging technologies, um, safer, longer duration satellite tags, uh, coordinating with our uh, Canadian counterparts, um, again, more habitat models, uh, looking at, you know, health and stress indicators, and even leaning more into how artificial intelligence or automated processes could, could help get us um, a better data analysis and potentially uh, faster and even real time. Uh, one th thing to point out, we are keenly aware of a potential for um, turbines. We know turbines can change the local hydrodynamics um, of an area. What we don't know is if that has any impact to prey fields. And so we have at this point through the National Academies, we have a contract or a task order, I think it's called that's out. Uh, where the National Academies is going to take a closer look at that and provide us with some recommendations, uh, really specifically honing in on the availability of North Atlantic right whale prey um, and seeing if we if there's an issue there that we need to, to uh, be responsive to and protective of. And the third goal is collaboration. Uh, we are going to do an implementation group. We're still trying to figure out exactly what that will look like. Um, you know, I, I'm sure we'll continue our BOEM NOAA one, but we're certainly going to have to expand if we want to see this strategy actually be realized. Develop outreach and communication um, uh, so that we can keep people that are uh, and stakeholders that are interested um, regularly updated, um, such as web pages and other sort of fact sheets. Um, making sure we're also coordinating and integrating this strategy into things like John mentioned, like the road to recovery. And I just point out at the bottom here, the expansion of partnerships is absolutely critical. Um, and through this, we also must ensure that we we do uh, we work with our with the sovereign tribes and have uh, effective and meaningful government to government engagement. So last two slides, uh, the uh, the draft was released in October, 45 day public comment period. We had 550 individual commenters of which 270 were unique comments and about 60 or 70 of them are things that we thought might require changes. Um, besides the comments received, we also did go back into all the projects um, and we pulled out all the tribal input into the various projects that have been commented on um, and pulled out the material in there related to, to right whales and folded it into these comments. So right now we're reviewing the comments. We're aiming for finalization in June of 2023. Um, there's a bit more work for us to, 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 to be done, but that's our goal. And again, it's a living document that will be updated as new information becomes available. And just ending here again with the, the goal here is that we want to promote and protect the recovery of North Atlantic right whales while responsibly developing offshore wind. We recognize there are stressors out there, uh, many of them for these whales, and how can we uh, build a different energy future um, with, you know, while we're still protecting and promoting these animals. It's a, a vision that uh, both NOAA and BOEM are taking extremely seriously. And that is my last slide, so I will stop sharing. I can't hear Stacy. I don't know if anybody else can. <laughs> okay. That's my fault. I'm sorry, Jill. Thank you so much. Um, it is 302, so I just want to be sensitive to the agenda. I do want to provide the opportunity um, for maybe one or two clarifying comments. And I'll just note that um, we're spotted to take a break at 3 o'clock. And when we return at 315, um, we'll have the opportunity for our panelists to um, uh, bring up any sort of response or thoughts that they have initially, and then um, we'll pose a couple of specific questions to each of them as well. Um, but um, after that, there will be more opportunity for discussion. And uh, so I do wanna just see if there's any immediate questions uh, for Jill or for John. Otherwise, 
Um, we'll move quickly towards our break and then return for the panel. Michael, I see your hands up. Go ahead. Yeah, I had a couple of questions for Jill, but I'll just ask the, the one that's burning on me. And that is, she mentioned the need for longer term tracking tags in right whales, I believe. And my question is, uh, what data type are you expecting to get that you cannot get with non-invasive tracking techniques such as PAM and aerial survey and so on? I mean, I understand you can find new habitats, but we're, we're talking about a known habitat here. Yeah, so um, I would probably lean on others in my organization that are not here, but I, I guess what I might say is um, it, 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 it is, but I think having the bigger picture of what these animals are doing, how they're moving, even if it's outside of the areas that we're looking at for wind development are certainly going to be informative. I also think, Pam, we know that you know, right whales are not as vocal, they're not as detected as often as perhaps other whale species. And so are there, are, you know, we're looking at the key rates and looking at other things as well, but will longer term tags also be able to help us sort of correlate some of that data, um, understand better how they are using their environment. So um, I think that would be the short answer, but I know there are others in my organization that, um, could probably give a, a much more detailed answer than I can. I, I agree with all of that, but you need to balance that gain versus the cost of tagging a skinny, scrawny, poorly growing species. 100% agree on that. Yes. Has, has, the, you, been, has there been a decision to proceed? Oh, has there been a decision to do that? No, no. Okay, thank and, you. And, and of course, any of those kinds of things, any of the research, as I think as you probably well know, um, uh, that would include that. It requires uh, authorization under the Endangered Species Act and Marine Mammal Te Protection Act as well. So, I don't know, Jill, I don't, I don't know if we want, I mean, there are existing uh, tagging programs in place. I mean, not, not that BOEM is, is directly funding, but I know we, we do look at stuff that the Navy is doing, you know, as well, um, where, where animals, you know, I, I think we're let, we can leverage other organizations that already have permits to do some of this as well. Um, I think is the point I was trying to get at rather than, you know, perhaps a, a, a concern about a bunch of new effort on an already uh, critically endangered group of uh, species. Yep. <clears throat> Good point though. Doug, I'll give, you, I'll give you a quick question and then um, we'll, uh, go ahead and take a break. We might start our panel discussion a few minutes late just to ensure the um, opportunity of a, a of a sufficient break for folks. But go ahead, Doug. Yeah, well, I was just going to um, follow up on that point and, and see if it warranted more more discussion in the panel. This this issue of of right whale tagging. I don't know. I don't know exactly what's on your on your agenda for it or what your questions are, but it it certainly warrants uh, attention. I think it could certainly relate to some of the questions that we've got for the panel. So um, we'll give folks a, a few minutes to think about that. <laughs> um, but I do want to give everybody a sufficient break. Um, so let's go ahead. It's, it's 3.06 now. Let's return at 3.20. And we'll continue with the, the panel discussion and um, Q&A. And just so our panelists um, are all on the same page, we'll give you each a a few minutes um, to, to share any remarks you might have or any reactions to the um, things you've heard today. And then we'll focus on uh, the three questions that I think I provided everybody based on uh, what are the additional um, data and, and uh, information that can be integrated, additional science questions, and then thoughts about um, communications as it, as it relates to the science. So, uh, give folks um, until 3.20, and we'll see everybody then. And again, what I will do um, for the purposes of moderating this discussion is I will ask, um, I'll call on each of our panelists in order and ask them to introduce themselves um, and then to to provide any sort of initial remarks that they would like to, thoughts um, 
based, you know, from the discussions they've heard today, um, any other reactions, things they think are important to mention. Uh, and then once we've gone through everybody providing their introduction and initial remarks, uh, I'll pose one question at a time and uh, give the panelists each an opportunity to weigh in on those questions if they have any. And, um, and then we will open it for discussion um, and any Q&A that the audience would like to have um, as well. So just to start us off, since it is now 3.20, I'm going to turn first uh, to Ann Bowles from Hub Sea World Research Institute, allow her to introduce herself and, and share any thoughts that she might have at this time. Hey, my name is Ann Bowles. I'm a senior research scientist at Hub Sea World Research Institute. And I've been working on issues related to animal behavior in the presence of human disturbance, mostly noise for way too long. Um, and I wanted first to say how happy I am to see the level of investment in getting the right kinds of details and all of this stuff for the wind, for offshore wind. I have worked in other areas and there isn't anything like this investment, even though the potential effects are a lot higher than anything that you guys are anticipating. So, you know, I'll, kudos for managing this whole discussion very well. The second thing is I'd like to say that a lot of my comments for the rest of this discussion are going to be focused on trying to get information on what the animals are actually doing in the immediate vicinity of wind placements of one kind or another. We're particularly interested in floating wind out here, and there's a lot less information about that um, than there is about the, the harder structures. But even there, we don't know a lot about how animals actually interact with the placement itself. So that seems like an important kind of information to get. Thank you very much, Anne. Appreciate that. We'll turn next to Francine Kershaw. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Francine Kershaw. I'm a senior scientist with the Natural Resources Defense Council, or affectionately known as NRDC. Um, just a little bit of, of background about NRDC and the hat I'm wearing. Um, so we view offshore wind development as, as critical to, to meeting our national climate goals. You know, it promises healthier air, creates thousands of well-paying clean energy jobs. So our organization feels really strongly that we, we need offshore wind and we need to move it forward as, as rapidly as possible. Um, yet like, like any ocean industry, offshore wind poses risks for the environment, you know, as has been discussed today. And because we're also in a biodiversity crisis, it's important to launch this new industry in a smart way that protects our valuable and vulnerable ocean wildlife, including North Atlantic right whales, but of course other species as well. And our organization believes that we can and, but, and we also must achieve both of those goals. Um, so that's, that's the perspective that I'm, I'm coming to this conversation with um, and for my part, I've worked in, on this issue for about the last five years or so, um, focused on developing guidance and standards so that offshore wind can be developed rapidly and also in a responsible way that avoids and minimizes harm to marine life and habitats. Um, and I serve as an appointed member of the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, and um, their environmental technical working group for, for offshore wind. Um, and I guess I, I only have one overarching comment, and I'm, I'm excited to get into the, the weeds of the discussion. But um, I just I've been really encouraged by the conversation today, and um, as someone that works on on this issue on the day to day basis, I, I've really appreciated hearing the the views of and, and questions of the the closer. It's it's really um, helpful for me to be able to you know join you and listen into this discussion and um, get your perspectives. Um, as well, that, that's been very helpful. And it's also clear that, that Bo and Manoa really want to get, get this right and they're actively investing in and advancing robust science and, and um, to support their policy and management work. Um, and just, just as we get into the acoustic part of this, um, it's also clear to our organization that um, science does not support any link between the acoustic activities associated with offshore and survey activities and the recent whale strandings. And, um, I look forward to the discussion of how we can share these facts more broadly um, 
and in a way that is trusted and, and really taken up by the public as part of the discussion, because that's that's something our organization has been, you know, hearing from our members on and we're considering, you know, that challenge on a daily basis. So I'm really interested in hearing, you know, others, others thoughts on that. Thank you, Francine. Next, I'll turn to Michael Moore. Hello. So, Woodsoil Oceanographic Biology Department, veterinary scientists, spent a lot of time pulling dead right whales apart and humpbacks too. Um, appreciate what everybody does these days. I, I've sort of moved back from that now and spend more time looking at live right whales with um, photogrammetry and health assessment in mind. And that really brings me to my comment uh, that um, this discussion has largely focused on the mortality event uh, related to humpbacks and and offshore wind development and prospecting and so on and it's all very important but we also need to look at the sublethal impacts of noise and um, <clears throat> vessel trauma and uh, and especially the whole question of what that joint document looked at with regards to the impact of wind production on the concerns about surface waters, uh, productivity and prey for right whales and, and other species. And I was interested to hear the, the acknowledgement with regards to the hydrographic impacts of the pylons. But what I didn't hear, which is in that joint document, the question of where the extraction of the energy into the grid uh, impacts the surface the air surface seawater interface in terms of productivity you don't get out for now and so you know if you're taking energy out of the ocean what's that doing to the prey base and that's something that i don't think has necessarily become a, a critical question but um i have solar on my house my attic is now cooler and i i worry about that thanks michael and then I'll turn to Doug Noachek as well from Duke. Yeah, thanks, Stacey, and thanks to the National Academies for for the invitation and uh, the opportunity to uh, to participate. So, and 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 certainly for convening COSA, um, you and Boehm, that's a a, um, a great venture together. So, um, for me, by way of background, I'm at Duke University. Uh, in, uh, in the Nicholas School of the Environment, um, specifically at the Duke Marine Lab, and then also I have an appointment in the Engineering School in Electrical and Computer Engineering to, to work on and develop technology for, for marine conservation research. Um, so, and then, and certainly germane to this uh, is, um, I, I'm, the, I'm lucky to be the lead of a, a big um, offshore wind program through the Department of Energy in Boehm, um, Wildlife and Offshore Wind. We're looking at marine mammals as well as birds and bats. Um, so I've personally learned a lot about seabirds and bats, and there are more bats offshore than you might realize. But but nonetheless, um, it's been a we're lucky enough to be in a good position to be working on this issue with um, quite a, uh, a, a wonderful team. Several several of the co-PIs are on this on this call. Um, so hopefully we can become a force multiplier for for this community, which I will also say has been um, refreshing to work in the offshore wind community. There's there's a lot of um, uh, uh, folks are very forthcoming with with thoughts and ideas and, and potential for data sharing. So I think there's a lot of um, goodwill there and a lot of positivity that's that that we can carry forward. Um, as far as uh, overarching issues, I think um, uh, quieting, as as Jill pointed out in several points, and I'm not sure that that everyone would appreciate how you know, just how hard that a lot of us have been pushing on this issue for a long time. Not so much how do you time an activity just so that you you have the least amount of level B takes, but how do you actually make things quieter? Which then, by virtue, has has the you know it's quieter in the ocean. And you also potentially impact fewer animals. So, so the the push from Boehm to actually work on quieting the actual activities, um, I think, is a good is a good step forward, very good step forward. Um, and then uh, on 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 additional questions, I think um, yeah, Michael Michael hit on it. I think we need to understand these oceanographic things and. Uh, um, and I think actually, interestingly, the turbulence around the pilings may be acting in the other direction of from the from the uh, surface wind uh, mixing. So it's going to be a really interesting ride to find out what 
what uh, what we know about that and what we can what more we can learn about it. So I'll leave it there and and say thanks again for the invitation. Yeah, thank you each. So um, as I mentioned, we've drafted a, a few questions. It sounds like some of you have sort of lightly touched on them, but I'll, I'll open them to uh, first to our panelists and then um, also to those on the line. But, you know, again, just reiterating COSA's role is largely to provide informal individual input into the science and assessment programs at BOMA. And that um, really leads us to thinking about what you know, what additional scientific information should the agency be collecting or analyzing and prioritizing? And so I want to first open that question up again to our panelists and, um, and then also to others on the line. The other questions that we had posed, um, you know, in a similar vein, are there additional scientific questions that need, um, that should be asked or need further study? And also, um, how can um, the federal agencies, BOEM in particular, uh, better communicate their science as well. So those are the, the few questions that, um, that we've posed. And I'll, again, I'll open that first one up to our panelists. Is there more scientific information that the agencies uh, could be or should be collecting and analyzing? Again, thank you to those that have already sort of tapped into this, but I'll, I'll provide an opportunity for longer explanations. Um, for brothers to weigh in as well. Anne, go ahead. Uh, the, so to go a little bit more into detail, what I was talking about, I, I looked at the AIS image with the lease area stuck in between two shipping channels. There's been some discussion from the European literature that these wind farms function as a kind of refuge because there's, for example, you're not allowed to do fishing in the area and so on. So you're putting something in that could have either a positive or a negative effect given the particular location and the mix of species. So I really think it's important to start getting an idea of what animals are doing specifically in the field of the wind farm with techniques that allow you to get close range behavioral information. So if that's not part of the technical and research goal, it should be. The other thing that came into my head as they were talking about quieting vessels we have quieter cars around us nowadays. And one of the things that's been necessary is to make at close range, these vehicles more detectable to animals. So this is something that probably, ought, I know it's something that's been looked at in the past, but it's something that probably deserves a second look, not only for ships, but also for the farm structures themselves because you've got this big thing you're sticking in the ocean and you don't really know how animals are figuring out that it's there. Thank you, Anne. Any other thoughts from our panelists on this topic? Michael and Doug, I know you each offered a few areas uh, that could be um, further explored. Doug, you were gonna say something, go ahead. Yeah, uh, well, I, one thing I was gonna say is that after, after the list of Jill's <laughs> projects that are that are done or you know published or you know in, in process it's hard to it's hard to think of something else so um so that's a certainly a nod to to Bohm and their and the thoroughness of of that group so um so I think that they th there are a lot of things that they're hitting on in there um to, to speak to Anne's question we part of part of our project is actually to do some of that close in um close in behavioral uh, observations and, and collection. Um, I, I think that um, um, as far as additional additional things, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that a lot of the, so much of this work is going on. Like Michael mentioned his work with uh, with drones and, and body condition of the, and things of right whales. Um, I, I think that one area that, uh, and this, this actually hits on uh, both one that questions one and three, Stacy, and that's uh, the third one is the communication is really forming some kind of uh, clearinghouse for especially for right whales, you know, and everything that we need to know about right whales. Um, 
the, you know, lo locations would be the, the the ultimate thing, of course, if we knew where every one of them was. And I don't know how many times I've been asked that question. Um, that gets back to that satellite tagging, um, the implantable tag question. I shouldn't say satellite tagging because you could do satellite tags different ways. Uh, but but the implantable tag issue and what it what it really stands to gain us. Uh, and I know there's some attention to that as well. So we don't need to we don't need to figure it out today. Um, but I, I I really do think that other other than this, what I call the refer to as the downwind and downstream effects of having turbines in the water, the turbines causing mixing and the the or I mean the foundations causing mixing and the turbines pulling energy out of the wind. Michael's quite right, um, and uh, that that we stand we we really need to investigate that more. Um, I don't think it's going to be a quick answer. The modeling could be done relatively quickly, and there's there's some work out there. We found thirty some papers just in a quick look at this issue. Um, so so, but I I, I really don't uh, in terms of big significant questions. I think Bowman and Noah are doing a great job on it. And if if I could think of something more broad, I would bring it up. Um, but I think get, gathering all and NYSERDA has done a great is doing a great job of this with specifically with the RWSC as well um, of aggregating that information and pointing to new new work that needs to be done. So so I'll leave it there and but certainly some things to uh, to come back to you. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, so I'll preface my comment by questioning why Doug didn't mention his study where in response to Anne's question in terms of uh, <laughs> alerts to right whales in terms of some kind of noise maker and what he successfully did was put the whales at 15 feet or thereabouts below the surface and put them into harm's way more than anything else so it I mean, it was a great study and and it's it's an impossible um very difficult solution to reach um I, I doubt ships will ever be quiet enough that right whales won't know they're there. Um, so with that, um, I've been thinking recently about the difference between real-time management and habitat curation. Um, can you, well, you're never going to tag all the right whales, for instance. This was a debate we had last week at a workshop, and you're never going to do it because the tags don't last that long. and you're never going to find them all to tag them again. The tag's going to go quiet, and then you've lost them, and it's just not going to work. So, so scale that back to where you are uh, when you've got an operation going on with pile driving or whatever, and you've got a PSO looking and so on. Uh, does that really work? Uh, do we know how efficient PSOs are to clear an area versus PAM and how all of that goes? Um, <clears throat> And that leads into my hobby horse of, of, you know, what do we really know about the reality of sublethal impacts and how to mitigate them? And again, it comes down to curating habitats rather than creating individuals, because you're never going to know where all the individuals are. Right whales can sneak up on you. They can show up in the Cape Cod Canal and nobody knew they were there. And boom, there they are in the middle. Happened two weeks ago. And, you know, that place has got thermal cameras and video and kinds of stuff going on. So I, and I, and I hark back to my initial comment about rarity. Um, these guys are increasingly cryptic because there are fewer and fewer of them. And so to try and think that we can actually manage the individuals when we're not very good at finding them and they're really good at showing up in the wrong place is something that really worries me. And you know, at some, I mean, I think, you know, some of the stakeholders have already written the right whale species off because there aren't enough of them to worry about anymore. And I'm not saying Burns doing that at all, but we can't afford to do that if we do care about conserving the species. So it, it's the whole challenge is huge. And I don't have any answers for it. But I, I do know that we need to think about sublethal trauma because without and this is where I do feel very strongly that, that, for instance, the stakeholder of the entanglement folks, you know, the fishery folks, 
have been misled by by the promise that if you stop killing them, everything's going to be OK. Well, that's not the case. And we've got serious reproductive problems as a result of chronic entanglement trauma, sublethal entanglement trauma. Right whales get entangled between zero and 10 times in their lives as the current current spread. So the, obviously, that's a different thing to wind energy trauma. But it's it's not when it comes to sublethal issues that unless we manage them right, we're never going to get a fit fat population that's that can actually produce. And that understanding is the piece that I, I feel has been uh, strategically and management uh, inadequate, seriously inadequate in terms of how we've looked at it. And I, I strongly disagree that um, this humpback mortality event has been a wind energy issue it's been a vessel issue primarily from the information we have but that doesn't mean that boehm and the wind industry doesn't need to worry very significantly in fact more so about the sublethal than it does about the lethal because i don't see boehm killing whales for sound but i do see them adding to for instance right whale health issues to the point where another cut of a thousand cuts to to the success of the species, not because you're not killing them, but because you're not letting them be who they are and doing their thing. Thank you, Michael. Doug? Yeah, I didn't want to, if Francine has something uh, on that point, certainly go ahead. Oh, Frank. I'm so sorry. Oh, I, um, I, I have a separate point. So Doug, if you have a follow-up to Michael, you can go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks, Francine. Um, I think um, I like Michael's uh, thought on curating habitats. I think that certainly fits into the quieting, um, the quieting part of this. And so one thing that did occur to me to point out is, is the regulatory hurdle that we have to get over in a, in a couple of ways. One is implementing new things, which we all know is, you know, it has a process and the process is important, um, but it does, it does take time. But even if we look at something like um, if vibratory pile driving was a, a possibility, um, which, uh, you know, from what I understand, it has been demonstrated in, in Europe, not terribly successfully, but certainly with some success in the right in the right substrates, is that uh, the message that, well, the issue is that it's then considered a continuous noise signal. And so then the threshold drops to 120. And so, uh, so then you're taking a, um, what is uh, something that's gonna actually put less sound in the water, and you're making and you're removing an incentive to do that and incentivizing things to curate habitats is a really important way, especially when you're dealing with with industry and trying to understand what their needs are and they need to proceed. Um, they also need to know what the playing field is. So I think um, the the. Uh, um, I'm, I'm concerned that you know, the, any of these ideas for curating habitats will run into regulatory issues and everybody's aware of it. I know it's not it's not new news. Um, um, uh, and but I but I think it's um, it's a it's a great sentiment. And I think we can ap apply that to several things, the curating habitats. So and like like suction buckets will, you know, I don't know if you want to get into details, but it's a lot quieter than than pile driving. Um, and, and that kind of thing could be incentivized by BOEM. So, OK, thanks, Francine. Yeah, I just I had a couple of other ideas um, in response to this question and, and bringing it back to um, the site assessment and characterization activities a little bit. I mean, I and, and thinking about that that public trust question, right? So, I, I think one of the trends that we've seen in these survey activities for offshore wind is um, an increase of parallel survey efforts within a single geographic region. Um, for example, the same developer may be using you know multiple vessels within it um, to gather information for a single project within one region um, or in adjacent regions off the east coast where multiple developers you know are, are surveying at the, the same time but in different areas um, and I think you know as you're digging through the IHAs to try and get this information um, and the IHAs are really broad it's just kind of like this is the number of vessels that developer will use over this nine month period and this is the outline of the geographic area that we'll be operating within. And usually those areas can be really, really large from, you know, even from the mid-Atlantic all the way up into Cape Cod. And um, as, as a member of the public and actually as a 
and in this context of like a scientific question, just un, being able to correlate even when and where those activities are happening with some type of event or interaction that may or may not have involved a marine mammal. It, it's really tricky to do that with the data that, that seems to be available, at least at least to the public. Um, and so, you know, I, I think um, some additional, maybe it's not exactly scientific information, but it could inform, you know, scientific um, ex, you know, investigation is um, more specific data on the location of survey vessels and the speeds of those vessels um, at any given time. And I, I think that would help you know, as improve just what's happening offshore, it might help with time testing and, and things like that to be able to the interaction that may have occurred. Um, the other thought that I had was was related also to vessel strikes um, and being able to better understand the spatial and, ter and, and temporal patterns in vessel traffic, again, including speed um, within the proximity of offshore wind areas, but then also, you know, outside of those areas are our uh, wind energy areas any different to you know other areas along the eastern seaboard or other regions um, could be really helpful in passing out risk um, and public perception of risk. Um, and just I had one other thought here. Oh, and the other thing would be trends in, in shipping our vessel traffic. We're seeing some significant shifts in when and where vessels are operating at the time. Um, I think the New York, New Jersey port just overtook. The port of Los Angeles is being the busiest port in in the nation, and that you know could have some implications of vessel strike risk in the in the region. Um, so I, I guess more recommendations of, of data that could inform scientific analysis, but those types of analyses I think would would help us all better understand risk and also help the public understand um, you know where there might be risk levels that we could be concerned about versus ones that we can probably you know not not worry as much about. Francine, Anne? Uh, in the discussion that Doug and Michael had, one of the, and a number of the speakers brought it up as well, one of the issues that strikes me is the numbers that they're using for impulsive and continuous noise are, have been in, have been used for basically my whole career. And they don't, at this point, really get to the details of how these sounds are affecting the animal's ability to function. So I think another area ought to be having a much closer look at what it is exactly the sounds are doing to the animal's capacity to get their job done. And based on those things, coming up with criteria that are more nuanced, because I think that would help a lot of the issues related to noise. Yeah. We've touched on, I think, you know, in, in various um, parts of each of your comments, I think we've touched on all, all three of the questions. Um, I might focus in a little bit, Francine, you touched on some public perception issues. Um, I might ask the other speakers as well to weigh in on, on how um, these very technical issues can be communicated um, perhaps more effectively or more thoroughly. Um, to the public and um, even to others within the scientific discipline, really. Any thoughts on those issues? Michael? And then Doug? Well, I can give you an analogy, not an analogy, but a parallel experience of trying to communicate um, rope trauma in right whales. I've been trying to, to the general public, and I've been trying to do that for 30 years. I wrote a book recently and 1500 people 3000 people I don't know read it maybe and I put on my heart and really I know the choir liked it but we do not have a, a good way of communicating to the public good science in a way that is meaningful in their daily lives and you know we all pay the bills try to educate our kids and these are all things that are coming in through the mailbox or whether it's virtual or real and how to get the offshore abstract into the persona of the minds the concerns the, the costs the benefits of you and me 
uh, if we don't have the particular jobs we have is something that um, I'd love an answer to. Thank you, Doug. I think Michael just uh, is advocating for uh, an offshore wind and right whale Instagram account. Um, I was thinking TikTok, actually. I was thinking <laughs> it may be severely limited in the coming days. Well, who knows? <laughs> and I, if, I would pay a lot of money to see you sing and dance, Michael. If we can, if we could arrange it. I've been rehearsing. <laughs> um, I so it's it's a really it's a very good question, and uh, I'll just give you one anecdote to just encapsulate and i'm sure we've all had these experiences but a, a friend of mine here in beaufort who works at noaa not in anything related but does habitat mapping with acoustics was um out somewhere wearing a noaa um jacket or something like that and and somebody in the community stopped him and said oh are you helping that whale and this was when we had this entangled right whale down here and he said oh no but you know the team from duke is doing a lot and then the folks from georgia and florida and went through the whole thing and then this woman said well, and it's awful what that offshore wind is doing to the whales. You just, you know, that's the it, the connections are are obviously not non-existent. We all know, but but getting that word across is really is important. I thought the video that Erica showed. Um, I know those we're getting better at producing those things, and maybe maybe AI that would be a good use of AI um, is to to produce more of those um relatively quick and and getting them into the circulation as as michael as michael said um as broadly as as possible um i don't I, i'm not a great fan of of playing to the short attention spans that sort of dominate the world these days but at the same time uh if you can get across a concept that uh and stick to one or a few um, especially with things like acoustics, because people just glaze over very quickly. But I, I do think that developing more of those animations can they can be really powerful and infographics too. So and then plug them into Michael's Instagram account. Uh, I'll be a follower. <laughs> um, I just before turning quickly to Francine, I, I thought I'd also um, add my own sort of element to this question, which is thinking um, about conversations COAST has had in the past, um, and, and particularly the two-way engagement, um, you know, mm. that we keep hearing is really important in, in science communication, um, and the listening aspect as well as the speaking. I guess I'm wondering, um, I want to turn to Francine as well, but I, I'm, I'm wondering if you all have any thoughts about how that can be um, done effectively on this topic, especially in light of the attention that this has been getting. Uh, Francine, I'll turn to you next and then ask folks to give some thought to that. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks Stacey. And just, I know I already kind of waited on this question, but I had a couple of um, other specific thoughts. And one was the same as Doug's about, you know, the, um, the really wonderful interactive educational materials that, you know, the Bowen team has, and others have been developing. I was working on these two. And, just just getting that out more broadly and, and promoting that that work more broadly, I think um, would be helpful. I, I think even with that, you know, there's, there's always going to be some mistrust of information issued by agencies um, regulating an industry, also the industry. And so it, it is really important for independent scientists um, or entities like the Marine Mammal Commission to also be communicating these, these facts to the general public. Um, and you know, this also points to the need for information on offshore wind activities, like I was saying, it likes to be shared more openly. So scientists do have the information to consider and they can feel confident, you know, speaking of on these issues. Um, just one other thing, which is maybe food for thought, is um, you know, I, I think these the acoustic impacts from survey activities, it's quite easy to explain. Well, not easy, but like <laughs> it, there's an explanation as to why you know they're very low source levels. We can explain it through video charts and science. I, I think as we look forward to construction and operations where, you know, there's much, if as impact power driving a particular proceeds, there's going to be much greater sound and acoustic energy in the water at that time. Um, there's going to be more vessels out there, you know, tens of vessels during the construction period. It, it may be a little bit more challenging 
is to communicate around that when, you know, a whale happens to coincidentally strand at, at the same time. And so one thing that NRDC has started to do, and I, I think it would be helpful for us all to do, is kind of look ahead to that next phase and kind of use this as a training ground of how well to, you know, communicate on these issues and, and really prepare for, for that next round of communication to the public that's, that's going to be needed um, around this. Yeah, Stacy. Yeah, Doug, and then Anne. Yeah, real quick, I, I won't be long. Um, it, but it's something prompted, and then and then uh, Francine, of course, set me up perfectly. And that is that is to um, engage the industry side of things. Um, I, I alluded to it. Um, they they have they have marching orders. They have their leases, and they you know in this case are trying to produce renewable energy that that I think most of us agree we need. Um, <clears throat> But Francie's point also about about what people trust and what they hear, and and maybe some of these little productions that have you know an industry stamp on it and the BOEM stamp on it and an academic stamp on it and an NGO stamp on it, then people look at it and go, oh, everybody agrees um, that this is you know this is what we're actually looking at. Um, that that might be might be a little bit more powerful. But I just wanted to to um, bring in that you know I hear from from uh, you know our contacts in the at the various developers saying hey look this we're not going to come out and say anything about this because no they won't you know people won't believe us but if it comes from you or nrdc or you know some combination that that it's more likely to be taken on board thanks thank you and one other thing that so far we haven't talked about is that people who are out there in the world in the ocean um, people who have time on their hands can participate in community science. And that's a really great way of helping people understand what's going on in a situation without pushing information at them. So in other words, they're the ones that are discovering something and maybe that helps them understand the information better. The birding community has certainly made a lot of progress doing that. Fantastic, great suggestion, Anne. So I see Les has raised his hand, and I think um, approaching the four o'clock hour, this is a great time to open it up for our audience as well, and for COSA members to weigh in with their questions too. So we'll let Les start that off. Les, go ahead. Uh, just on that same thread, and uh, this, my gosh, I think it was this morning, I was on a, uh, a meeting of the WIN subcommittee of the Advisory Council for Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary, which I've been uh, put onto. I'm not sure I even knew that. Um, and it occurred to me, the sanctuary, of course, the discussion had to do with potential impacts to the sanctuary of, of wind anywhere near it. But I was trying to turn people's uh, thoughts the other way. And the sanctuary definitely could be, the sanctuary system could be an important avenue for public communication, especially if they had some help. So I wouldn't forget about them. And as one example of citizen science, and we're now analyzing 10 years of bird sighting data from Stellwagen that was done systematically. Uh, and it, it's going to prove useful for some of the wind planning. Yep. Yeah, great example, Les. Thanks for sharing that. I'll look for any other hands from our audience, invited guests or COSA members, phone staff as well. Kevin, and then Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I I want to ask a, a question to the panel about, uh, in listening to the discussion, I've heard a couple of things. One of them is about the prey and and the shifts in, in prey for, for these species. And I guess so my first thought on that is that I think John showed uh, in his presentation that there were actually a number of different species that have been stranded, right? Uh, sperm whales, uh, semis, um, a, a right whale and humpbacks. Uh, and they do, I, I think the right, right whale is mostly copepods, right? Uh, I, I believe Calonectes, but uh, some of the others, you know, I heard Menhaden mentioned and squid. Um, so that's a variety of different different prey. Uh, would it be more, uh, and, and I'm not sure that the, the scientific assessments of where these prey are uh, in, in actual field observations and how they're shifting, 
with the uh, with climate change is, is is very well understood. I know we have a modeling exercise uh, about to to commence with the National Academy of Sciences. But do you feel that the field research is is adequate enough to be able to tell these different different um, prey sources? And and I guess the second component of that is that why why would such a variety of different animals be stranding themselves or having high mortality if their prey is different would uh, you do you think that all the prey is overlapping or or is it uh, does that suggest some other source of, of mortality rather than chasing prey well i i could attempt to answer that i think the different umes are very independent and I think geographically so too. I mean, to compare a sperm whale stranding with a humpback whale stranding is like uh, trying to understand Mars by looking at the moon. Uh, they're mm -hmm. such very, very different animals. And most sperm whale strandings are due to pathology. I don't know what the data was, but it's probably a sick animal. Um, and to compare Menhaden with copepods, you know, right whale foraging strategy is so very, very different to hump, juvenile humpbacks who do like small Menhaden. So I, I it, there are so many niche pieces to this, each story, that I, I think it's hard to try and uh, pull together a holistic understanding of, of all these UMEs. To be, and the sperm whales aren't having a UME, but um that just happened to be stranding so it's it's a very diverse challenge to try and pull all the threads together and the one the one question you asked about um do we have enough data um from the science and so on uh, i'm a strong believer in uh, listening to fishermen as well and the fishermen will tell you that the pogies are running good in short so to to follow up just very, very quickly would you advocate then for just focusing on the the right whale rather than uh, uh some of the some of the other whales or do we try and take it as a holistic approach well i i believe strongly that um holistic is the way to go to understand the systems i mean if you look at the the sort of rank order of extinction you've got the vaquita which is a Mexican porpoise that has got you know less than ten animals alive. Uh, you've got the right whale with with less than a thousand animals alive, and you've got the humpback with probably less than a hundred thousand. I don't know what the number is, but where goes one goes the other as we go down the slippery slope of industrialization of the coastal ocean. And that's what we're doing. Thank you. Sorry, Scott, and then Rod. Yeah, uh, great discussion. I want to thank all of our our panelists for for joining us today. Um, in in this morning's session or this after or earlier sessions today, um, one of the things I came away with is that it it, it sounded like a uh, pretty broad consensus that at least for the uh, the right whales and the humpbacks, um, vessel strikes and entanglements were. Uh, key contributors to the mort mortality events that have been been uh, recognized in the last several years. And looking ahead to where offshore wind is going to go, uh, you know, two of the uh, most attractive areas from an energy potential, um, one is the Gulf of Maine, the other is the Pacific parts of the Pacific coast. They're both going to require floating wind to be viable. And in fact, they're both going to probably require floating wind at depths water depth beyond where floating wind has yet gone. So it's another technological challenge. But I'm just wondering from a from a uh, marine mammals protection perspective, are we doing adequate research into the risks of entanglements with floating wind mooring systems at this point, or secondary entanglements with fishing gear that might get entangled with the mooring lines for the the the, the Well, I, I guess that's in my game again. Um, there's little data to really answer your question. There was a southern right whale entangled in a mooring chain in Patagonia, uh, but I believe it was slack. And so that's really not a good example. 
these these moorings are going to be very substantial um uh, i don't know the diameter depends upon but it's gonna, they're going to be big and stiff and so i don't sweat that too much um rope in any guise is a threat and so if, if you've got um gear uh, wrapped around a pylon or a, a mooring it's a problem i do want to pick up a little bit on Anne's comment about sanctuaries I correct me if I'm wrong but I believe the spacing of the U.S pylon grids allows for fishing between them is that right because if so it's not a sanctuary in that regard I can I can comment on that one quickly if, if, if that'll help it's a one by one not a mile grid at least in the northeast um, neither the Coast Guard nor the the wind farm companies are are uh, specifically saying that you cannot fish within there. But for trawled gear, things like scallop dredges or or um, ground fish gear, it'll be fairly difficult to perhaps less so for um, uh, gear that is a uh, you know potted gear and, and gear with ropes and such. It, it may it may turn out that. Especially given the the habitat um, changes, it may um, may increase, for example, the number of lobster or crabs within there, and so you may have more fishing. But I, I think that a little bit remains to be seen on on the the safety and ability to to get in there and and what the insurance companies will allow. And they they would be fishing for right whales too, so it will be a strong case to be made to make that. Um, on-demand gear a requirement for any any such places thank you I'm going to turn to Francine Doug and then Anne I believe you're each responding to Scott's question if I understand it correctly yep. go yeah. ahead Francine Th thanks Stacey yeah, I just wanted to to speak real briefly to to Scott mm -hmm. your question about entanglement um and I, I also agree with Michael that the um the the infrastructure the mooring lines and the inter array cables are likely to be quite large and, and stiff and so you know the the risk of a what we're terming a primary entanglement where an animal may get directly entangled in that infrastructure is the risk is probably quite low i mean i you know we still think it's something that we should be looking for um but but our concern and, and this is shared by several other engos that kind of work on that intersection between entanglement and Floating wind is, um, you know, the idea of marine debris, ghost gear getting caught around that infrastructure, or indeed a right whale, um, or other large whale dragging gear, potentially that gear getting getting caught around and anchoring the animal. Um, so we've, and I can find this link and put it in the chat for folks, but we um, we developed some ENGO recommendations for, for monitoring those cables fairly regularly using different tools and then having a mitigation strategy if marine debris is observed. Um, you know, how can we get that marine debris off quickly? What kinds of technologies would we need to, to advance um, to, for us to be able to do that for these big commercial scale projects um, at an affordable cost? Um, so I'll, I'll find the recommendations, put them in the chat. We're also doing a deeper dive into those potential technology solutions. And we'll hopefully have a bit more information on that soon. Um, but one opportunity I think that's really important is the main research array um, that will be, I think it's maybe only one or two floating turbines, but can we use that as a test bed for some of these technologies and proof of concepts and really make the most of that opportunity um, that's coming up you know, in, in the near term so that that can inform either larger scale build out of, of the Gulf of Spain or indeed also off the West Coast where entanglement of, of large whales is also a, a key concern. And I, I know DOE is looking at that question as, as well. Thank you, Francine. We'll do Doug, Anne, and then Brian. Yeah, thanks, uh, Stacey. Uh, just quickly on this entanglement issue, Desiree put in the in the chat. Um, several of us have been working on a 3D simulator to look at this potential for entanglement risk um, to whales um, and, and leatherback sea turtles, for that matter. Uh, primary, secondary, and tertiary entanglement. I do think it is one of the so so that that um, simulator you can uh, run animals by. It's it's physically it's um, uh, mechanically explicit. It will calculate drag and 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 the force on animals 
um, based on by, based on the the gear and the anyway. So it it it's it's a can be a very effective model for evaluating some of these things, particularly how animals act be, behave when they hit some of the gear. Um, the other the other part I think is important though is that is is to look at this probabilistically if we can, right? How much ghost gear is actually out there floating around? Um, what are the chances it's gonna it will get uh, stuck on those on those cables if it does come by? Um, I, I don't know what we have for numbers in terms of ghost gear, um, but it seems like like the downwind and downstream issue, something that we could learn a lot um, on the desktop, as well as trying to implement some of these things that Francine just mentioned. Um, yeah, that was it on that. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. We'll go to Anne and then Brian and then Les. Okay, what I have to ask is right quick, with the floating gear, the other issue with having these arrays of great long lines on the water is it isn't clear how well these animals figure out that something is in their way. So you also have to think about the issue of them coming into contact with it. In other words, there's a collision risk and it's not clear exactly how they'll cope with that situation, how that would interact with particularly for the smaller animals if they're using it as a hunting environment and for the larger ones just how they detect it. Brian? No, um, thanks. Maybe I'll uh, uh, talk a little bit about um, Desiree re put in the chat that we are doing some modeling of you know looking at how animals might interact and in, um, with uh, um, offshore floating facilities, uh, you know, right right now it's an active study, um, and we'll we'll say elision. It wouldn't be in a collision because they're static. Um, I know my Coast Guard friends would appreciate that difference. Um, but actually, the reason I initially raised my hand was that um, uh, you know, kind of going off what um, what we we're talking earlier about access, you know, fisheries access. I, I think I just want to point out that. Um, you know, we assume, it, at least for fixed gear on the, on the Atlantic, we're assuming there's always going to be some level of fisheries exploitation within the facility. Uh, I know there, there's challenges uh, that Kevin, you know, raised, but for our assessment purpose, we assume that the, the, the biomass will continue to be to be exploited. Um, and again, just to really clarify that it, you know, any management measures around fisheries that um, you know, are operating within or adjacent to uh, facilities would still be within the jurisdiction of uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service and, and not BOEM. So just wanted to make sure that was uh, uh, that was clear. Thank you. Thank you very much, Brian. Michael, you had your hand up briefly. Was that to respond to this point as well? Um, well, that was relating to Anne. I was just taking a comment, but I'll say it. Um, if a right whale's doing two to three knots and runs into a fat cable, I don't worry about it. They run into fat whales quite often too. Thank you, Michael. Les? Hey, I did it this time. Um, yeah, a number of us on this call and others have been fretting over this ghost gear issue on the catenary cables. And uh, my greatest concern, uh, I know we can use the things once they're constructed to study whether that's a serious problem or not, but my concern is the lag time uh, to get a study going. And I mean, while we're sitting around going through our process, there really could be a big problem. And if the problem involves right whales, which is a possibility, I suppose, um, it's really serious. So we should think about how we can anticipate the need for that kind of study and be ready uh, the moment the gun goes off. What a horrible analogy. Uh, you know, I just, Thank you. I, let me just add one more thing here on this since I brought this, this up. Um, there are uh, an awful lot of floating moored structures in, in in the oil and gas business. And a lot of them are in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, monitored by uh, Bessie and BOEM. And there's been a lot of 
there is actually quite a bit of recreational fishing that occurs around some of these. In some cases, uh, they come mighty close to the, the structures. I, there, there may be some research opportunities down there, stuff that's ongoing, or maybe things that could be done to, to kind of monitor around existing structures that have already been deployed, you know, what the impact are with large mammals. Do they ignore them completely? Do they have do they hit them? Could could be could be another source of information, and I would encourage our BOEM co colleagues to talk to their their colleagues in the Gulf of Mexico, both from BOEM and B and uh, Bessie. Thank you, Scott. Michael, is your hand still up? It is because I had something to say in terms of uh, the question about catenary and Les's question. And, you know, there is some precedent, you know, you've got navigational marks and offshore buoys and so on, which presumably may or may not be accumulating uh, ghost gear at this point. There's certainly plenty of ghost gear on the bottom. And, you know, any dragger will tell you that um, all over the place. And, you know, the number of right whales that have come in with ghost gear on them is really very small compared to the actively fished gear. And this is one of my hobby horses is that the the not-for-profit campaign against ghost gear has been uh, popular and fundable because there's no political cost. There's huge political cost to going after actively fish gear. And there's been a huge bias in tension as a result of that. Any other questions from folks? I, I apologize. I know there's a very active chat going on. I encourage that. Um, I have not been monitoring it for the purposes of integrating questions, but um, you know, I, if there are folks having robust discussions on the chat, I encourage you to um, raise those in the discussions for the benefits of all. Um, but I will continue to look for any additional hands at this time. Brad, go ahead. So let's sort of ask my question, which is this question of lag time. You know, BOEM has a has a process for um, considering science needs and um, coming up with an SDP and then doing the studies and and then we and then producing the data. So we need to not only think about um, what we need to know today, but what we will need to know in five years from now. Um, and it may be that we can identify some of those questions, or it may be that we need to think about um, doing some of the science in slightly different ways, trying to figure out how to be more nimble. So I wondered if any of the panelists had any thoughts about that, whether we can we can effectively anticipate some of the questions we might need to know answers to in four years' time, or whether the answer is that we need to be more nimble with some of the science and be able to come up with results um, or, or, or have studies that can sort of continually provide the kind of information we need. Any thoughts from our panelists? Being adaptive and forward looking. <laughs> Doug? Oh, you're muted. So. Thanks, everybody. Um, not not a lot comes to mind immediately. I do think that the um, bone process is uh, can take a little while. Although I do know that they're they you know they're they are responsive and like I said with that list that Jill put up that there's quite a lot going on and enough to make me even struggle coming up with with new things. But I do think that this idea of um, thinking about uh, data collection avenues that can be useful for several years um, is a good way to go. And I, you know, I'll actually go back to my thought about the, about the sort of right whale um, clearinghouse kind of uh, approach where we centralize as much as possible. So there's one place to go to the North, the North Atlantic right whale consortium um, does a great job based at the New England aquarium in terms of curating the catalog and a huge sightings database um 
but it's you know it, that's not the kind of um not exactly what i'm thinking of in terms of aggregating uh, all the data that we have but it's also it, they're not set up to to be that sort of um quick response kind of kind of situation i do i do worry a little bit about um saying yes here this is a need that's identified today here somebody here's here's a bunch of money tomorrow go and do it to the best of your ability without the scoping of the questions and you know how to structure the study uh you may end up with data that's insufficient or um i can't remember who it was today talked about you know making sure we have the power to to actually detect changes and so things are set up to be actually able to detect changes is a big part of our whole first year with the with the wow project is doing power analyses and encounter rates um and how what what things we can undertake given all of that um and how best to do it so these things obviously as you all are, are well aware take time to set up but i think it's a very good idea and sentiment to think about uh what things we can put in place to to streamline it and also to be a good avenue a good pathway to get the data um get the data out and and available sorry i couldn't solve it <laughs> oh bummer shucks doug <laughs> Any other thoughts from our panelists? We have a robust audience still on the line, about 97 participants it looks like. I'd like to ask if um, any of them have questions they'd like to pose to our panelists or to the presenters from today as well. Encourage participation from BOEM staff and, um, and also from others on the line. A moment or so. Kate Williams. Hey, thanks everyone. This has been um, a great conversation. I have a question for the panel, I guess. Are there particular aspects of the whale stranding issue in relation to offshore wind that you feel like need particular uh, sort of communication support to help address? So I work with groups that are trying to think about like, do we develop some educational materials, like outreach information? And I'm trying to figure out, there's so many aspects to this issue in terms of like, how do you do an necropsy? Well, what are UMEs? Like there's a lot of different things that you could focus educational information on to try to address parts of this issue. And I was wondering if folks have thoughts on like, what are the pieces that feel the most urgent or that you're hearing about the most in, in your work that people sort of need the most information on that isn't readily available or, or pulled together right now? Thanks. Very good question, Kate. Thanks for asking. Michael, I see your hands up. Sure. Well, I think, you know, your comment, the, the whale strandings in relation to offshore wind, has become a conspiracy theory that needs to be debunked. And, you know, that's, um, it, it seems as though the harder you push at such things, the more they conspire to continue. And so that's a challenge. Uh, you know, I'm not going to try and get political here at all, but it, it, when whales become a political football to take on a particular partisan agenda, we've gone down a tube that is kind of sad. And so how to, I mean, in many ways, it's so much bigger than a right whale or a humpback whale at this point. It's, 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 we're all here in part because of all of that and the, the public attention and the media and so on. And, and how, how to bring some objectivity and data and, and sanity and, and the real questions of concern that we have talked about today in addition to some of these issues uh, that's the that's the real challenge Michael any other feedback from our panelists on this yeah I oh still I, I I'll just yeah. just think quickly Stacy if I can I think that the website that Noah put up very quickly um I think I don't know what the analytics are on it, but that kind of simple one page, not complicated. Here's the issue, and here's what the fishery service has determined. 
um, is is really good. And I know I've gotten lots of questions about, well, why aren't they all the animals necropsied? And why don't we know the cause of death, you know, right away? And um, uh, so so a little bit in there about what the process is for actually determining the cause of death would be um, helpful. Um, but I think those it doesn't have to be elaborate. We don't have to make a infomercial every time. Um, so, but I, you know, getting getting the information readily available, I think would be would be really helpful. And to Kate's point, like, I, you know, I don't I don't know exactly how to plug into that. I'm not a communications person, but um, but I just want to make a pitch for the for simple is fine. It doesn't have to be doesn't have to be complicated. Back, Jill? Yeah, so, um, yeah, so there clearly are, so, so BOEM is doing a number of things besides, um, you know, trying to put out uh, information like editorials or we're trying to, we've got a lot of reach outs from like community organizations that are having meetings to come and speak. And so we're trying to do that kind of thing. Um, somewhat ironically, like the video and all the HRG, the paper and all that we did. I mean, everyone here knows you can't do an analysis like that and and uh, get it peer reviewed and published in the time frame. We we happen to have it done, right? And we had we made the video because we're like it's going to be complicated to understand the paper. But we understood that people are interested in noise issues. So, um, so, so I have a place I'm going with all of this. So I think we do what we can to try to put information in the places where it will matter. Because I, I would agree there are places it doesn't matter what you say. Um, there's an alternative motive, perhaps, to um, to to raise these things. But there's also another part of this that is um, there's a lot of agency time that is spun up to address this, um, whether it's from an outreach perspective, responding to the many, many, many news articles and reporters calling to congressional letters and potential committee meetings and um, you know threats of litigation and all those things and. And um, it just takes time away from all these things that we talked about for like getting the right rail strategy done and, and focusing in on the areas that we believe have the potential for, for an impact. Um, it takes time away from that. And I think that's, uh, it's just more commentary on my part. Um, but every so often, you know, there's something that comes along where you, you do scratch your head a bit and you're like, this is not uh, really, really not the the issue to be concerned about, but yet it's going to take time, energy, money away from us making, you know, advances on the stuff that we need to get out in front of. So no real answer to it, but just sort of recognizing that cost. And, and, and I think that time spent you know, uh, spreads, right? So um, lots of folks have been spending time trying to write up things and 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 recount it. But I think at heart, uh, if there's a way to better get to to the general public who who may not understand and are concerned, um, I don't know if DOSITS or some sort of um, um, organization like that. Um, but we just recognize there's the other part of this that is it, it is about um, confusing the message and creating the urgency, and we're not going to be able to address that. Thank you, Jill. I think that was a, a great audience question, um, and I welcome others as well. It's uh, 429 now. We've got a, a fair bit of time left on, on our agenda if we want to continue, but certainly um, if we feel like we've exhausted the topic, we don't have to. So, um, give folks just a couple, you know, a couple more moments to see if any other questions come to folks. And again, I'll apologize. I'm not um, actively monitoring the chat. I continue to see um, the numbers going up. So, if there's a, you know, some robust. Uh, discussion in the chat, I really do encourage folks to bring that out into the conversation as well. Uh, Scott and then Kevin. 
So uh, yeah, Jill, this is a question I, I posed, a follow-up question I posed on the chat, and I, I don't know if you got to see it or not, but you very kindly answered. We, well, we, we heard today a lot, a lot has been learned about uh, the, the, the incidents involving whales over the last 10 years. Where the, the, we, we learned so much uh, in a relatively short amount of time. The story changes, of course, with, with uh, external factors as well. Um, you know what's what, what's impacting things, and and it sounds like from uh, what you said that if if, if you learned something uh, from from research before leasing, um, uh, that indicates you, you should have certain stipulations in the uh, in the leases that uh, would uh, um, allow you to put mitigation measures in place. For instance, during construction or operations, you can you can you can put those in at the time of the leasing. If if, you, if new information comes up after leases have been awarded and the leases are basically pay, paid for, uh, are you able to go back and and uh, add those mitigations retroactively, or do you have to renegotiate? How do, how does that work? Yeah, no, that's a great question, and I I think um, when we put out the right whale strategy, we actually worked with our attorneys, at least on the Bowman, um, to come up with language. Um, to, to that effect. So it would be in, incorrect to say that once a lease is issued and you have your mitigations applied and contained in, in the um, COP approval that you can never go back and make an adjustment, right? Um, so we do have the ability to, to do that. Now, are you going to adjust constantly on all things? No, because you know, there's a, a level of that that may have safety issues or, you know, there's a level of uh, predictability that is important um, to this. But for example, uh, we have, let's say you have a, a, an Endangered Species Act consultation and there are triggers for that for reinitiation. And every consultation will will list off what those triggers are. So if a trigger is met and we reinitiate and we reconsult and there's an outcome of that, we're going to need to go back and we're going to need to apply them to to the to you know things that have already been approved. So there there is the 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 room for that. Um, there's also the room for us to apply mitigation and through either research or monitoring of the mitigation, we find it's not terribly helpful or needed to also adaptively manage and pull that back. So um it's it's that's always sort of been the case, uh, but of course, you know, there is a lot of thoughtfulness that goes in anytime you make a change. Um, but it is one that if if the if it's warranted, it, it you know we'll pursue it. Thank you. Thank you. Turning next to Kevin. Thank you. I, I guess my question is a little more uh, on the on the board looking um, similar to a couple of the last comments, but to, to reach 30 gigawatts by 2030, it's going to take about 2,400 turbines. Uh, and Vineyard Wind starting to construct this summer, they're going to have at least 22, I think, vessels in in a rather small area to 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 put in their their uh, 62 turbines so that's a lot of increased uh, traffic and then also i i know that the canadian um wind farm industry is about to to ramp up and and a lot of the presentations we've seen on the right whales today have been focused just in in the u.s but there's a, also going to be a great deal of work up there so I, I was wondering what the committee thought about scientific way. I mean, really, the, the wind farm development really hasn't. I mean, the sightings developed, but as as Brian showed in his his planning strategy at the first, we're, we're just at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, are we doing enough? Are there other studies or or things that we should be thinking about to try and get ready for what's coming down the pike? Because the development's going to be very quick, and now's the time to set set any additional studies up. Kevin, Doug, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, thanks. Well, one thing uh, pops to mind. I think the the 
couple couple things on the on the vessels um, in a conversation recently with one of the developers. I I gathered that at least for their construction, all the vessels are going to be dynamically positioned. So there's not going to be any jack up. And I think I mentioned this that the dynamic positioning is can be quite loud. Um, so I think that that's I'm, my, I imagine that's been taken into account. Um, but I also know that there, uh, <laughs> and I don't think this this is uh, there's going to be a lot of vessels out there. I just I don't know what the one thing that would be good to get from the developers is what the traffic is really set to be once the farms are operational. I know there's a lot of concern about increased vessel traffic to and from the the actual sites once it's developed and operational. I just I don't know how often they have to go out to the the turbines, and that would be a good thing to to find out. Um, I do know there's been a lot of discussion about vessel corridors, and that is something we can get out ahead of. Um, I gather there's some pretty elaborate um, ideas and plans for how to monitor those corridors. Um, we did very successfully with gray whales off Sokolin, and it's not quite the same situation, but we looked at the area where you know we looked at whale densities, we looked at the where the vessels needed to go and suggested some corridors and speeds within them. Um, so so those are things we can get out in front of and have ready ready to go. Um, so that, that's just one thought about the vessel corridors in terms of the operational phase. Bill, did you want to weigh in on that? Yes, Sorry, I, you come off mute. <laughs> I did, I did, yeah. So, um... Yeah, on the vessel. So, so in the in the COPS, there, you know, there's something called the project design envelope that does describe out um, within a range what will be required from you know vessels during construction and operation, those sorts of things. I think as developers are are moving further along and um, you know, getting a better understanding of their needs, that's becoming clearer and clearer. But I do think the information is there. Um, I think some of what is also, um, you know, they're, they're, so the projects, they're, they're coming in fast. Yes, there's no way about, you know, but it does take a while between when something is submitted, um, is it, is it, sufficient have they uh, we're coming out right now with um we're calling i think a, a cop checklist an noi checklist noi checklist and what that basically means is in order for your cop application to be deemed um sufficient here's everything you have to have in there and if you have everything in there in a way that that we believe is sufficient, then we'll move to the notice of intent, which is the NOI, which starts your NEVA process. Um, so, and what we've seen is some of these COP applications come in in various forms. Some are really, really um, uh, mature and some are sort of uh, still learning as they go. So there, there is a period of time was my point between when you get something submitted and even the ones we have right now, um, until things are built out, there's also supply chain issues. Um, are there sufficient vessels available? Um, so, so there, you, you know, I, I feel the pressure for sure. Um, but there is a, a wider space between um, as these things are built, be, be, as these things will be built out, than what we actually uh, might feel at, at first. So, so time to adapt, time to sort of um, adjust and change. Our environmental studies program, yes, uh, we do go through in order for it to be a fair and competitive process. Um, we do look three years out and we update it every year. Um, we do solicit input from uh, stakeholders. There's a call that goes out once a year, although anytime anybody uh, you know, can certainly reach out. Um, so that helps us a little bit uh, get ahead, but there's only so much um, funding available for that. So I don't know what the exact statistic would be, but I would sort of pull out that of all the ideas that go in, um, we're probably able to maybe fund 25% of, of the ideas that come in in a given year. Um, so we look for partners all the time, partners, partners. Um, and uh, I think too, we're looking at the regional wildlife, I kept, I've said RWSC a few times, but the Regional Wildlife Science Collaborative I think is the right word. Um, they're coming out with a research plan. We're going to try to link with that. Uh, we work a lot with DOE uh, to try to get out in front of 
um, okay, maybe there's some technology development or um, the vessel quieting and working with ports. Um, you know, one of the things that we may be doing with uh, DOE is is a, a prize competition or, or or similar to get better quieting technology for, for impact pile driving. So there's lots of like tendrils you're putting out to try to be more um, proactive and try to get out in front. Um, and I personally believe too, when it comes to like the right whales that we really need to lean as much as we can in predictive tools and trying to get better tools so we can maybe in ideally in real time, uh, try to get a um, better educated uh, guess at where they may be showing up uh, versus reacting once they're there um, when impacts um, could potentially happen. So I am rambling a little bit, but um, uh, there are ways uh, for us to get out in front of, of things, but it's, it, it is big. Um, for sure, and and the partnerships and and the feedback that we get from from things like this are are super helpful for us to be sure we're thinking of all the different things we need to be. Thanks, Jill. I'll give um, one last opportunity for any additional thoughts or questions, um, and then I'll ask for each of our panelists, maybe just to provide uh, one or two concluding thoughts. Uh, and then I will um, turn to our co-chairs and we will wrap up. Um, so any other hands, last chance? Any of the folks on the line want to weigh in or ask a question? All right, I think our panelists are perhaps largely off the hook then. Um, let me just ask them uh, each maybe if they have sort of one or two takeaways, one or two things they want us to take away um, or that they want the, the group to um, make sure we get from this meeting. And I'll start, um, maybe I can start with Doug and then Anne, Francine, and then Michael. Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I have a lot that hasn't already been said, Stacy. But thanks for the opportunity. I, I think that the a, a huge part of this obviously is a is a public rela public relations issue on the strandings and the and the and the wind. We've talked about a lot of priorities and a lot of things that we would really like to know, but we know that there's no connection between the two. And so I think uh, it it is a PR um, issue. I saw that somebody put in the chat that that uh, Erica did a did an Instagram thing. So that that's great. I mean, that, I, I think those things can go a long way. Um, so but beyond that, um, no, I don't think I don't think I have anything else. I appreciate the conversation and 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 the invitation. Thanks, Stacey. Absolutely. Thank you, Doug. And anything you'd like to add? Um, other than this has been very valuable. And thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to learn a lot. I, I'm what I'm hoping is that down the line it will be possible for anybody who's interested in this area to basically see what life is like for one of these animals moving through the industrial activities that we have going on because I think that's really what's missing from this whole debate about the stranded whales is that people don't really in their minds picture what's happening to these animals as they move about in their environment so anything we can do to do a better job of making that accessible to them would be fantastic. Wonderful feedback, thank you. Francine. Yeah, thanks, and echoing other thanks for the, the invitation, and I've, I've really appreciated the discussion. Um, trying to think of something. Thoughtful to say the end here, I, you know, I, I think the more that we can do, and again, you know, looking past this issue, and to construction operation. I think the more that we can do to communicate and also be doing the work to be, you know, reducing impact as much as we can at the source, be it vessel strike risk, be it noise reduction, quieting, be it relying on, you know, new monitoring technology, then we can really show that that's how this industry is, is moving forward. Um, and then also that we're monitoring the heck out of it and we have a good mechanism to use that monitoring data to adjust costs and you know continually reduce risk. I, I think that's um, 
I think that's really the key for this industry to move, move forward, you know, as rapidly as it needs to do. Um, and with with public support and, and I do see obviously believes that it can do that if it's in large part doing that already. Um, but you know, moments like this are are helpful because they they shed light on some issues that that maybe need a little bit more of our attention. And so hopefully we can take what's been discussed here and we can have a on it. Um, um so, so yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for sharing your thoughts. And last but certainly not least, Michael. Well, first, thanks so much for the invitation. It's been interesting, and I'm sorry I've been hobbying my horse a bit. But just just to reiterate, uh, those dead whales are really informative, and we can pay more to get more in terms of data. That being said, the sublethal piece is just as important, and it's so much more cryptic, and it's hard to get to. But we have to acknowledge that the need to be nice to these guys, to be nice to the habitat. Well, I know I speak on behalf of myself as well as uh, the COSA members when I thank each of you um, and each of our presenters today for your time and your thoughtfulness and engaging on this topic. Um, what a lot of folks on the line don't know is that we pulled um, several of these people together, you know, with relatively short notice, and we're, we're really grateful and appreciative for your time um, and recognizing the importance of this discussion. Also want to thank uh, several other folks that have uh, been willing to join the line um, that maybe haven't uh, had an opportunity to speak up as much. Really grateful to have the commissioners from the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission on the line uh, as well, and um, several of the BOEMS staff and other folks that have joined us. Really appreciate everybody's time and, and thoughtfulness today. Uh, I want to give our COSA co-chairs an opportunity to um, have sort of the, the last word uh, as it relates to today's discussion. And then I'll quickly talk a bit about tomorrow's agenda before adjourning the meeting. So um, Scott, Rod, I'll turn it over to each of you. Well, well thanks, thanks, Stacey. And, and I, let me echo that, that special thanks to our panelists. You really did a great job for us today and we realize for many of you, it was on quite short notice, and we appreciate your participation in, in the entire day's activities. Um, you brought a lot to the table. Also want to uh, uh, thank our, our presenters from uh, the Marine Mammals Commission from uh, OA, and of course, uh, uh, very, very informative. And a, a special thanks to uh, our, our new director at BOEM who spent some time with us. That was, I thought, a pretty enlightening uh, discussion and we appreciate uh, her, her taking time out of her schedule to visit with us. So thanks to all of you who sat in with us today. Just one other one other thing to keep on uh, in our minds here, and you know, I guess this is a special challenge for you, Jill, looking down the road. Uh, you're learn, gonna learn a lot from uh, about, about interactions with um, sound and and, ships and uh, entanglements and so forth with with uh, with as you expand your your uh, wind program but let's not forget you may have a couple other new program areas coming down the road with more activities in critical minerals and uh, who knows maybe even something in ccs offshore uh, and so some of the lessons learned here uh, uh, about how to do the best job we can in environmental science and, and assessment may be relevant down, down the road for that so let's keep that in mind and I turn turn it over to my esteemed colleague Rod. Um, you all said it so well. Thank you uh, certainly to Anne and Francine, Michael and Doug, and also to our uh, friends from NOAA and also the Boehm um, SAR staff and subject matter experts, and also from the U.S. Marine Mammal Commission. It was um, a very informative uh, discussion today. Um, the you know the, it is a subject, of course, that has immediate public interest which means that it is um both additionally important and also complicated um and i've certainly you know as i said at the beginning it's not a subject i know a lot about um i have been in the water a lot and uh i'll tell you there's a lot of noise down there if you if you're on the side of a of a trap uh, a um if you're on the shoulder of a drenched channel and there's 
a vessel goes up it it is it is noisy as heck uh, so um it's certainly of interest to me from from that perspective um and i learned a lot it also one thing that struck me is the scale and scope of the problem um and uh it may be that in addition to understanding the science um um may have to collaborate with a bunch of other partners to try to come to terms with um the things that we do need to know and things that we do need to do um i fear the day that the right whale becomes extinct um so uh with that bright thought i'll say once again thank you to everybody thank you rod i will note i feel a bit remiss i also um, want to provide the opportunity um for bill brown or jessica bravo from bohm to say um any concluding remarks if they have any um, so let me at least offer that opportunity. Bill, I see you took yourself off mute. Uh, yeah, but I, if Jessica has something to say, I want you to say it. Uh, yeah, I think this is a great meeting. And uh, I thank uh, all of the panelists and the COSA members. Everybody's doing this uh, on their own time, I know. And so I appreciate you caring. And I, I, I listen carefully, absorb a lot of stuff. Uh, Jessica, do you have anything? Jessica, I'm sorry if you're speaking, we can't hear you. I do see you've come off mute, but I, yes, I was on I was on double okay. mute, <laughs> of course. Um, no, I don't have anything to say today other than a great big thank you. You'll hear a lot more from me tomorrow. I uh, appreciate everybody's <laughs> time today, especially those who joined um, external to, to BOEM and the committee. Um, we very much appreciate your expertise and input. Yeah, I hope, I hope that uh, Scott Cameron and others will uh, uh, appreciate the fact that we we've listened to the uh, first in class, uh, you know, uh, recommendations, and we're it's just the beginning, but we're we're starting to roll. Excellent. Well, that's a wonderful segue, Bill. Thank you for for setting me up so well. Just to give folks a, a quick highlight of tomorrow's agenda, um, and invite folks on the line to join if they're interested. We'll get started tomorrow at noon, and we will, um, as always, do a quick introduction of the, of the committee. Um, and then our first um, discussion point on the agenda for tomorrow is updates from BOEM on a, a recently completed National Academy study, uh, which we have been um, referring to as the first in class study. It was a National Academy's report aimed at identifying attributes of a first in class science program um, within federal agencies. Um, and this was primarily directed at BOEM, but intended to be um, broadly applicable for others that are interested in applying it to their programs as well. So I know BOEM has been very actively um, trying to address some of the recommendations within that report. And that's um, an update on some of that will be our first discussion point tomorrow, which is what Bill mentioned. Um, and then the other primary uh, item on our agenda is uh, to hear a bit about some new National Academies activities that are getting underway with relevance to BOEM. Um, the first is a standing committee that some folks on the line may be interested in um, that will be focused primarily on the issue of wind energy development and fisheries. And the second uh, item that we'll be highlighting tomorrow is a new consensus study that's going to be on a, a quite a fast track um, that will be looking at the hydrodynamic implications of wind turbines um, and focusing on any impacts to prey availability. So that may also be of interest to some folks on the line. Um, it will be a relatively short day tomorrow, uh, concluding at about 3.15, um, and that's largely because uh, our committee will be uh, moving into a closed session, um, which will be sort of the first closed session of any duration with our new members. Um, so we're looking forward to having that opportunity to uh, engage with them. Um, with that, I want to thank folks again for joining, invite you all to join us again for our open session tomorrow. The agenda and call-in information is available on our website. Um, but certainly you can reach out to, to me, to Jonathan Tucker, or to Eric Inesco on the line uh, for more information on that. 
Uh, this recording from this meeting will be um, at some point will be edited and posted up on our website. Um, so folks should be able to um, revisit this discussion with ease um, probably in the coming weeks, hopefully. Uh, again, if you have any questions about that, please don't hesitate to reach out. And I think with that, I can close our open session for the day.